Uh, good morning, everyone. We had a fire alarm in the building, um, so we are uh, getting everyone back in the room, and we are going to get set up and get started. Uh, I expect uh, about a 10-minute delay, further delay, on starting. Uh, in this, uh, so we sh should get uh, the online stream up, and you should be seeing the opening remarks in about 10 minutes. All right, thanks. Bye. So uh, you want to do like a quick, we need two microphones for the first session, I think. So can we use the standing mic? You can use the stand mic. Right. Test, test. Test, test. All right. And um, this is the clicker here, I think. Yep. Did, uh, I think there was.
Good morning. Welcome to uh, day two of the future of money, governance, and the law. Um, I'm Tom Goldstein, uh, managing partner with Cogen Law Group. And good morning. I am Eric Guthrie. I'm a partner in Cogent Law Group and also the director of training programs for GBA. And we are here to discuss today the law, right? The title is Future of Money, Governance, and the Law. So today is the law day. So Tom and I are really excited to kick this day off for you guys because, you know, the legal issues and law and legislation and regulations are going to play a huge role in blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. So today we're going to be sharing a lot about that with you but, and watching around the world. But this session, Tom and I are going to kick it off and we're going to go from there. Yes, as I said, I'm Tom Goldstein, managing partner of Cogen Law Group. I'm also a uh, board member of the uh, Government Blockchain uh, board Association Board of Trustees. And this is more about Cogen Law Group. Yeah, Cogen Law Group. We are a full service business law firm serving clients throughout the DC area, around the country, and even overseas. Uh, we provide a wide range of services, uh, pretty much anything a business, small, medium, or large would uh, possibly need. So what Tom has been telling you is that, you know, the Cogen Law Group is really a leader in blockchain technology law. So what kind of clients do we have at the Cogen Law Group, Tom? Um, we have um, quite a few clients in the cryptocurrency blockchain sector. Um, that's actually the fastest uh, growing area of our practice. Um, we represent a number of uh, crypto exchanges, um, quite a few um, uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency uh, ATM operators. Uh, we do a lot of regulatory compliance, compliance with uh, banking laws, compliance with security laws, uh, AML, KYC. So we help our clients make money and stay out of trouble. And we're going to be covering a lot of what Tom just said in our session today. So if you don't know what some of those terms mean, stay tuned. You're going to find out between now and the end of the day. This is about me. <clears throat> so like I said, I'm a partner in the Cogent Law Group. I'm also the director of training programs for GBA. I teach a course called the Blockchain Legal Specialist Course, which is accredited by the DC Bar Association. We'll talk more about that in a minute as well. And my consulting company, Better Me, Better We, uh, we do domestic and global training. We do domestic and global facilitation, which includes blockchain technology speeches and trainings as well. So. I try and get out there to every corner of the world that I can. I'm currently in negotiations with a lot of countries to do some training and facilitation for their countries as well. So stay tuned for some of that. I'm the author of the book, Blockchain or Die. This is it right here. And uh, it's the Amazon number one bestseller. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, and it's won three book awards. So I'm very proud of that. And uh, I'm not gonna talk about the book during this presentation, but if you have any questions about it, you can come and see me afterwards. Okay, so who was in the room? Whenever I give a presentation, especially with my boss next to me, I make sure I try and figure out who was in the room so we can know who we're gonna be catering to. I may ask this question a couple of times in future presentations throughout the day because the room is gonna change but for right now, I want to know who here is an attorney in the room? Raise your hand. Okay, for you guys in the global land, no one raised their hand yet. So that's probably going to change. All the lawyers sleep late. Okay, how many of you own a blockchain business or a cryptocurrency business? Raise your hand. Okay, so that's about a third of the business. Uh, how many of you are interested in blockchain and cryptocurrencies but don't know where to start or just getting started? Raise your hand. Okay, so about another third, okay. How many of you were in the nonprofit or educational sector? Raise your hand. Okay, so that's pretty much the entire room. So now we kind of know uh, who's in the room and, who, and how I'm gonna be addressing you with the training and the, and the presentation. Um, like I said, it's gonna change because lawyers are gonna show up in mass and then the whole thing is gonna get turned upside down. And, and we may have some lawyers uh, watching us as well. Uh, that uh, is remotely. true. That is true. So, Eric, tell me, I mean, it, can you suggest, are there any resources you can think of for people if they want to get a better technical understanding of um, blockchain as well as uh, cryptocurrency and the legal issues involved? Uh, what, what would be a good starting place? So, you know, shameless plug for GBA. GBA is a great place to start. We have a number of trainings. We have the foundations training. 
we have the technical consulting training, we have the executive consulting training, and we have a newly released DC bar accredited, like I said, blockchain legal specialist training. One of the few, if not the only training in the US that has accreditation for a bar exam uh, for MCLE credits, continuing legal education credits, right? So that's a really big coup for GBA. We also have a healthcare course and we have a number of other courses as well. So whether you're just a beginner, whether you're an attorney, whether you're in healthcare, whether you're in supply chain, you know, you can get a whole suite of courses through GBA. Uh, if you're a lawyer, come see me and uh, I'll be doing a training sometime in February or March. We'll announce that and then we'll go from there. And I can recommend, uh, <laughs> this really is a terrific book and uh, it's a great resource. Um, Covers a lot of ground, so highly recommend. It's a great, uh, great for uh, really regardless of your knowledge level. Thank you, I appreciate that, Tom. So when I talk about the blockchain legal specialist course, here are the objectives, right? We're gonna, we do a brief review of blockchain technology basics. And what I recommend folks do is take the foundations course first. And here's why. If you're a lawyer coming in and you don't have the foundation knowledge, you're gonna ask a lot of basic questions that we assume you have. Right, it's a jam-packed day of, of eight hours of you know blockchain and legal information. Uh, so the foundations course first is definitely a recommendation. We discussed smart contracts and DAOs, or DACs as they call them, distributed autonomous organizations, distributed autonomous corporations. More about that today. We discussed cryptocurrency legal issues and regulatory issues, like Tom was saying. If you have clients, if you're an attorney, you have clients. You have to know how to address that. You have to know what the laws are, what the laws may be, what's in the pipeline, so you can provide legal guidance to your clients. Uh, I would say cogent legal guidance to your clients. Uh, review blockchain technology and case law. Case law is just starting out, right? But to know how cases have been ruled in the past in order to be able to predict what's gonna happen in the future, knowing past precedent, and knowing what may happen in various courts, various circuits, extremely important. Intellectual property, huge. We're gonna talk about that later on today. And the last module in the course talks about how blockchain technology is changing the legal industry, which it most certainly is. As I, Thomas said, we have a lot of clients in this space. It's the fastest growing space. How do you take advantage of that? How do you make it part of your legal practice? Whether you're a sole practitioner, you're a law firm, or even if you're in government or you're in a private sector, there are ways that you can incorporate it into your business or your career. So we'll talk about that during the training as well. So this is our agenda for today. Right now, opening remarks, right? Uh, and my next session, which should be right after this one, I'm gonna discuss legal systems overview. I'm gonna go through the day in a little more detail. Jurisdiction, privacy and data, blockchain and taxes, smart contracts, DAOs and DACs, uh, blockchain technology, cryptocurrencies and securities law, uh, legislation, regulations and case law, uh, technolo blockchain technology and intellectual property, and the blockchain technology and the legal industry, which I believe is a panel discussion. So there's gonna be a lot of presenters up here giving you some great information. Uh, so we definitely wanna engage all of you because uh, we're, we're honored and, and thankful that you're here with us today to share this information, but in my opinion in terms of this kind of interaction, you know, you learn from us, we learn from you, you learn from each other. That's the perfect triangle, the perfect three-legged stool in my mind in, in education and training and presentations. So uh, that's where we are right now. Uh, any questions for me and Tom before we go to the next session? Yes. Uh, there's no microphone here. Why don't you come on and get this microphone? Um, can lawyers outside the Washington D.C. jurisdiction take your uh, course? Yes. Oh. Excellent question. Thank you for that question. So the question was, can attorneys outside of the D.C. jurisdiction take the blockchain legal specialist course? The answer is yes. So uh, we have this thing in the law called reciprocity, which is where uh, jurisdictions accept uh, bar admissions or even sealed credits from other jurisdictions. So. Uh, you'll see it in the slide later on, 45 states have reciprocity with DC to be able to get, to get CLE credits. So that's pretty good, right? So even though it's only accredited by DC, 
the vast, vast majority of states will recognize that course for CLE credits. So thank you for that question. Any other questions before we kick off the rest of our day? Well, how'd you guys like day one? Tell me about day one. I mean, I was here, but I mean, it was great, wasn't it? We had some great presenters. You know, we had some great feedback. We had some really great information that was shared. The keynote was great. So any feedback or questions about day one? All right, all right. Well, thank you very much. And I'm going to turn it over to Eric here now. So, okay. All right. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Tom. I'm just waiting for the next slide deck to come up. Did any lawyers come into the room yet? No. Oh, oh, it's like you, Tom, come on. <laughs> For all the lawyers that are watching overseas and around the world, welcome. Uh, we're going to be discussing the legal systems overview, uh, actually right now. And um, if you missed the first part of the session, I'm Eric Guthrie. I'm a partner with the Lodge and Coach and Law Group. Um, I'm the director of training programs for GBA, and I'm a GBA certified training partner. Uh, so the, there's some of my titles that uh, I have and that I try to make sure I use in the blockchain space. So like I said, the title of this uh, conference is uh, Future of Money Governors and the what? The law. Are you guys awake yet? Can, do I have to wake you up with like a stretch or something? Yes. More coffee? Come on guys, it's day two, this is it. You, you came here to get some more fire hose, right? Like Tom was saying, I'm gonna fire hose you some coffee. So uh, the topics that are in today's session are also topics that are in the blockchain legal specialist course. Not all of them are in the course. It's not a one for one, but many of them are. If you go on gbglobal.org, you will see that we have a GBA course handbook. And in that course handbook, you will see the blockchain legal specialist course where the topics are in there. So many of these topics that are in that specialist uh, course in the handbook are also gonna be discussed today. Um, I'm gonna, should I, should I put this mic down? I think I hear like a double mic issue. So. Okay, there you go. When I crossed the mic, I kind of heard myself in reverb, so I don't want to mess up any of the audio. Uh, I'm not a stand behind the podium kind of guy. Uh, I like to you know, engage you by walking around and you know, keeping that kind of activity going. When you move your eyes, you're doing something. You're not just sitting there. So uh, you know, when you're doing a, a executive training and you're doing like, you know, professional training, there's a certain way you know, mind reacts to certain things. And, and movement is one of them. Not just my movement, your movement too. So at some point in time, I'm going to have you get up and do a stretch because when you sit there for too long, your blood pools. You get a little tired, your muscles kind of get, you know, they don't get stretched. So you get blood to your brain, you think better, you receive better, you know, you can retain information better. So I'm gonna get to that at some point in time throughout the day. Anyway, I digress. Um, so the blockchain legal specialist course, all the topics are in the, in the handbook, but also many of them are being discussed today. There's a couple of caveats. The first caveat is we try to not only bring just the legalities of it, but we have some of the presenters here, they're gonna be talking about stuff they already did and accomplished in the real world. Real blockchain uh, products, real blockchain services, real blockchain companies. So it's not all theoretical. You're gonna hear some presentations today about some things that have already been done, like you heard yesterday with Maven Credit Union, right? That's being done. It's not theory, it's actually taking place. And you need to have the legal structures to be able to support that. So they play hand in hand, right? but today is gonna to be a combination of the two. So, I'd like to also engage by asking you some questions. So by show of hands, let's look at this question. Do you think that our current laws, rules, and systems are adequate to manage this transformational technology? Laws, rules being regulation, legislation, you know, case law. Do you think, by show of hands, that right now is adequate to be able to manage it? I mean, if you think yes, raise your hand. Ooh, not one yes. If you think no, raise your hand. Ooh, mostly no. 
Here's the third one. I didn't put it down there, but I didn't want to, you know, kind of do a spoiler alert. How about the option, it depends? It depends, raise your hand. Okay, we got one, two. Okay, the contrarians. All right. So this is really an important question. Why? Because if you don't believe that the current system is able to be able to deal with blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies, then your thought process is it has to create a whole new system to be able to deal with it. And that's a lot, right? My opinion, and by the way, this is not, this, this is not a, you know, rocket science, and it's also not you know, uh, an exact science, is it depends. I think there's some laws that do a pretty good job, and they're general enough to be able to manage it, but there's others that are like, whoa, wait a minute. When this law is written, you know, it, 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 it all does not encompass what's happening with this technology right now. So we're going to cover some of those in our discussion today. I cover more of them in the, the Blockchain Legal Specialist course, but from the standpoint, if it depends, it doesn't assume a yes or a no. It assumes each law, each regulation on a case-by-case -case basis. So and here's one of the reasons why it depends, right? This area of law is so new that it wasn't predicted 20, 30 years ago. I mean, you could argue that it was when, you know, because some of the uh, innovators in the cryptology space, they tried to create a cryptocurrency in the 1980s. And the Economist wrote an article about the Phoenix, which was a, a hypothetical digital uh, uh, currency in 1988. And what happens in 2008? Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, right? So this has been going on for decades. But here's the thing about the law. The law is never going to be on pace with technology. Technology will always outpace the law. Why is that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because technology moves so quickly, somebody in a computer lab or a basement or some other type of you know, computer system can create a new code or new technology to do new things. And next thing you know, they put it out there in beta, they put it out there in sandbox, they put it out there to the public, they strike deals, they raise money. The whole system is the same, right? But then what happens? There's an investor, there's a customer, there's a corporation, you know, and then if someone's aggrieved, they're gonna sue. And then that's when the law comes into play, right? But because it's so new, the question is, what laws apply? Do the laws that currently exist, do they apply, right? So that's why the law is never going to be on pace with technology because something has to happen, be built, be used, be compensated, be aggrieved before the law can, even comes into play. And we saw that, uh, I think Carol mentioned it yesterday, with the ICO craze. I mean, the ICO craze hit hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars. And what happened? A lot of them did not even exist anymore because they weren't really you know, a, a, a justifiable business or a justifiable investment. That created a lot of fraud and a lot of agreement, which now created a lot of law. And that's where we get into with this term, which I haven't thought of since law school until I you know, started doing this research called issue spotting, right? The key issue in issue spotting is knowing the difference between technology and law, where the gap is, and how the issue should be applied in resolution, right? That's key. So when you're in law school, you, you, know, you, you see about something happening in torts or something happening in contracts or, or in civ pro or in, in constitutional law, and you say, well, what's the issue? Well, the issue in biotech technology is so deep and is so varied and so diversified, it's creating a whole new area of law. The last time I saw something like this was when internet law started back in the 1990s. So this is gonna be huge. So legal systems overviews. So here's this issue with our legal, it's not really an issue, but here's the history of our legal systems. Big picture, right? Everything in our legal system is based on centralization. Centralized businesses with centralized incorporation, centralized structures, centralized controls, centralized way of doing things, our whole legal structure is based on centralization, right? Which now, now is also for centralized regulations. So everything in regulations is centralized, okay? 
So that also means the centralized accountability. They know who to sue. They know which actor took which role in which transaction because it was clearly defined in a centralized world. But what world are we in right now? The centralized world, right? So now how does a legal system that's used to be uh, built on centralization now pivot to decentralization? That's the question. Do I have the answer? Well, I don't have the answer because it's so varied and so deep and so complex and so global, there's no one answer. But that's why we need a legal system and people that have, lawyers that have the education and the knowledge and ability to be able to help with that transition to make it 10 years from now, we made good law. We made good regulations, right? We made good uh, legislation. That's critically important, right? Because if we make bad law and bad regulation, it's not gonna only not uh, help the industry, it's gonna hurt the industry. So that's why I believe education and training is so important. Uh, <clears throat> part of this training, I'm gonna be, this presentation, I'm gonna be also kind of doing a soft introduction to our presenters. So uh, part, we're gonna have a global jurisdictional presentation. Decentralized ledgers could be anywhere in the world. I just talked about it being decentralized, which means it also could be global. So if there's a legal issue, which jurisdiction is responsible, right? I don't have the answer, but we're gonna talk about that because it's issue spotting. And Gabrielle's gonna be talking about that. Question for you, is it possible that more than one jurisdiction can be uh, applied for a legal issue in blockchain technology? If you say yes, raise your hand. More than one. Come in and think no. Oh, pretty good room, all right. The answer is probably yes. I mean, if you look at the laws in the United States, right, somebody can be uh, tried or have a, a lawsuit in state court and whether or not they're in, gonna, guilty or innocent, they can be turned around and sued in federal court and vice versa, right? So even in the United States, multiple jurisdictions exist in our own country and I'm sure many countries out there as well. This same principle will probably apply to blockchain technology, okay? Global privacy and data protection issues, right? On a decentralized blockchain where everything is public, privacy is key, right? How do you keep the privacy of the persons or the nodes that are on the blockchain protected? So, the, of course, you have the, uh, the security with maybe the SHA-256 hash or something like that. Don't know because it really depends on the independent blockchain. But I can tell you this much, the laws are going to be looking at how to regulate that and how to enforce that. So Shiv is going to be discussing that in his presentation, and I'm much more looking, looking forward to that one as well. Taxes, blockchain and taxes. Whenever there's a lot of money involved, guess who's going to be looking on your door? The government, the tax collector. No matter what country you're in, no matter how you call it, whether it's IRS or whatever the other moniker they have in other countries, Blockchain technology is a $3 billion industry, sorry, $3 trillion industry. That's a lot of taxes. And the government's gonna want their due. So you have to know how to respond to your clients when it comes to their tax, tax issues. You know, you have to know, you know, where you're being taxed, how you're being taxed, when you're being taxed, right? This is really a critical component, not to mention that April 15th is coming up, but that's besides the point. So we have to address that. Right? Will there be a global tax structure? Don't know. Should there be one? Don't know. Right? But it would make things a whole lot easier if there was, if anyone's listening out there, global legislatures that write tax regulations. It would be nice. Uh, Seth and Nabil uh, are gonna be talking about blockchain technology and taxes in their presentation. Smart contracts. So for all the lawyers out there, smart contracts are critical, critical for legal representation and, and you know, for providing legal advice, right? So we're gonna be talking about smart contracts because code is written in if-then statements, right? But smart contracts are written in offer, I mean, contracts are written in offer and acceptance. Why is that important? Why is there a difference? How does it apply? Stay tuned for the presentation by myself and my other boss, Evan, who is, uh, running the global uh, video production, but he's gonna step away for a second and join me on this very important topic. And that's a huge topic, by the way, in the blockchain legal specialist course. Right? We only have about 20 minutes here, but I spent a lot more time on it in the blockchain legal specialist course. 
Uh, and some of the, uh, the points we're making about uh, the laws that impact smart contracts, the Uniform Commercial Code, Statute of Frauds, the E-Sign Act, UETA, EIDAS, if you're looking at it from a European standpoint, uh, all of these laws have applications into how smart contracts are written, how they are signed, how they are enforced, and you know, protections for the consumer when it comes to uh, the, uh, the signing and the, the delivery of the smart contract. DAOs. DAOs are also critical. DAOs are going to be a really important method for uh, putting blockchain technology in the hands of the individuals because you can have a great code, you can have a great blockchain, but what's your delivery method, right? DAOs and DAX are the corporations, the structures that are going to put the products together and put it out there, right? So whether it's, you know, a nonprofit or whether it's a for-profit, DAO versus DAC, they're really important. And corporate laws is huge. It's huge in the business world, right? I mean, we have a whole course called corporations in law school. If you're, you know, a 2L or 3L, it's one of the advanced courses. And I haven't thought about corporate law for a long time until blockchain came around because why? It incorporates everything. Blockchain technology is crossing so many legal sectors, it's not even funny. So Eugene's talking about DAOs and DACs in his uh, uh, presentation. International organizations and NGOs. Again, huge. Don't forget, you know, based on the, the initial uh, premise of uh, Bitcoin and blockchain technology, it's supposed to be something that everybody uses, open source, is public, is decentralized. Well, what better way to get it out there than international organizations or NGOs, right? Along with that same mindset. So uh, Sid is gonna be talking about international organizations and NGOs. Blockchain legislation, regulations, and case law. So this is the one I'm doing with Earl, and we're gonna be talking, we're doing a split presentation. The first half will be the, the general discussion about that, and Earl is gonna give you an actual blockchain scenario for discussion. I believe it's a, a, a gaming scenario. So uh, it's gonna be really interesting. So uh, regulation, case law is really, to me, is really exciting stuff. Because when someone approaches me and asks me about, you know, hey, can we do this, can we do that? You know, I don't know, I have to look at it. But certain things that have already been baked into the law, like the Howey test, it's baked in. And Carol mentioned that yesterday. And whenever I have a client that comes in and says, you know what, I'm interested in doing a security. What's the first thing you guys think I do? The Howey test. Because if it funks the Howey test, then guess what? They've got to make a different path for their, their, their cryptocurrency or token, right? The Howey test has become a critical litmus test to determine whether or not it's going to be a currency or not. Uh, blockchain technology and, and intellectual property. Look, that's huge as well. I mean, it's massive. And blockchain technology has the capacity in terms of copyrights, trademarks, and patents to make it faster, to make it easier, more transparent, uh, and to make enforcement better, right? So this helps governments, this helps inventors, this helps writers, this helps musicians, this helps marketing people, you know, and we're not the only ones. U.S., Canada, Britain, and the World International Property Organization, they're all engaged in this. Uh, and I, I, I discuss this in great detail in my course. Uh, Michael is going to give his presentation today for blockchain technology and intellectual property. The future of blockchain legislation. Now, we don't have crystal balls. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. But what we can say is, you know, by tracking legislation as being passed in other countries or other states or other jurisdictions, we can do a pretty good job of predicting where it's going from here. And also, what's, what's, looking, what's in the pipeline, right? So if you know what's in the pipeline, you can uh, advise your client on what they should or shouldn't do. What should be their, you know, position A, position B? You know, should they have a backup plan if legislation passes? Don't know, but knowledge is key in this area. And not only knowledge, but having the forethought of where something may go is also very helpful from a legal standpoint. So Jim and Todd are talking about that during their presentation. And this is the, the, the final slide before we go to a quick Q&A. Uh, I don't know how much time we have left, uh, uh, guys, but I think probably pretty close. Um, 
I talked earlier about how blockchain technology is disrupting the legal industry. In the course, we discussed that quite a bit. That's our last module. So that's actually, some of the folks love that module because they say, okay, I have all this information that I just learned from you. What do I do with it? How do I use it? You know, whenever I train, um, I try and give you something to do and go away with and use it. Otherwise, it's just an exercise in theory, right? That's, that's not going to help you. Learning how to take that theory and put it into actual use, that's going to help you. So if you're an attorney looking to figure out how to bring this into practice, that is the last module of the course. We're not going to discuss, discuss that much today because it's not part of our, the agenda. Uh, but if you're interested in the course, come see me afterwards or you, know, you can go on gbaglobal.org and find out one of the next courses. Uh, so I will open the floor to any questions now, and while you're asking questions, that's my social media. Feel free to email me or, or engage me on any one of my platforms, and I'll be happy to engage with you. Please, come to the microphone. Why don't you state your name and where you're from, like, you know, what company you're with, so I can know. Yep. Uh, Steve Corvo from Rhode Island, um, and I'm just a GBA member. Uh, but one of the questions that I, I know you brought up was the, the Howey test and using that as a measuring stick. Um, what about the Reeves test? So, thank you, uh, Howey. So, you asked, what about the Reeves test? I prefer the Howey test for a number of reasons. One, there's much more case law around the Howey test than the Reeves test. And I, I should have said, uh, and <laughs> I should have said this earlier, I'm not going to go into too much detail during the, this overview presentation. We're going to go into more detail during the, the uh, actual presentation. So uh, bookmark that, and I'll come back to that in terms of how we can use the Reeves versus Howie, probably in the regulations uh, uh, section. So uh, bookmark that. And by the way, I hope Orlando doesn't get a lot of snow, because I know it's going to be coming down there pretty hard in over the next couple of hours. It is. Yeah, I, just, I mentioned that about the Reeves, because I know the SEC has been teetering between those two. Yeah, understood. Yes, but thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. But uh, name and company. You ought to know, Mark <laughs> sir. <laughs> CTO, GBA. AML KYC is a huge problem with blockchain. Um, I know that I personally have a huge problem because with the Build Back Better law, suddenly individuals are responsible for KYC for any blockchain purchase over $10,000. Um, I'm currently a professional gamer. I do transactions for in-game assets for more than that much all the time. So, you know, I now have to offshore, um, which is a problem for regulation in and of itself. Yep. You know, if you don't like the regulation, incorporate somewhere else. Yeah. Do you have comments on all that? So, I, so I do. Thanks, Mark. So, let me start with this. Um, Department of Treasury, so just to kind of give you, in case you don't know what KYC AML is, uh, Department of Treasury has uh, a section that's responsible for things like, uh, you know, dealing with terrorism and the flow of money, uh, FinCEN, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. So KYC AML is Know Your Customer Anti-Money Laundering. That's, that's the acronym that, that Mark just used. So, what does that mean? That means that because the, the perception is, because it's a digital currency, that is easier for uh, uh, untoward <laughs> people, you know, that are engaging in crime or terrorism or other, uh, other untoward activities to use it as a means of finance their activity. So what the governments do is they require banks to know their customer, to fill out information in terms of name, address, social security numbers, whatever they do in their specific country so they can actually identify who's doing what with the money, who has what accounts, so they can freeze them, so they can, you know, they can uh, do discovery on them, they can do investigations on them, because they have to know who it is first, a AKA know your customer, right? So, now let's bring this into the blockchain world, now that we kind of covered that as a brief, you know, like recap of what that means. Because of the concept of blockchain technology, and I believe this really started because of the initial way blockchain became really big, which was, you know, through, uh, the one, the, well, I'm not going to say the website name, but there was a website where you can buy stuff and do all kinds of really evil bad stuff, and Bitcoin became used in that site very much. Uh, it was shut down, and that was kind of the first public introduction of Bitcoin in many ways. 
Not in all of them, but in many of them. So now they can't have that mindset that this is used for this a whole lot, which is not. It's the vast, 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 vast minority, but the taste is still there in their mouths. So they're really enforcing this KYC AML on it, and as Mark said, they, I think, are going a little too far with this, and I would think all of us in the blockchain space would agree that, you know, uh, you don't enforce other gaming uh, products the way you're enforcing this. Now, is there a way we can meet between the middle and figure out if we work together? I think there is, but it's going to take a real good conversation between, you know, experts in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space and regulators and legislators to figure it out. A quick story, I have a client of mine that, that I taught them. One of the best ways I find to get clients is to do trainings. Because as they learn about it, they say, hey, you know what, I want to get involved in this space. Or if I get the client first and they don't know what's going on, I put them through a training so they can understand what I'm saying, but I don't have to explain it over and over and over again. So I was driving my car, I was listening to the, uh, the subcommittee here is on blockchain technology. I want to say it's about a month ago. There's a bunch of blockchain companies talking to the, the Senate subcommittee, or the House subcommittee, and I, I just trained this, this company on blockchain technology. She called me in the middle of it. She goes, Eric, I'm listening to this information. I understand it. It's great. I wouldn't understand it a few months ago. That is an important statement. Why is that? Because regulators should have a better idea of what they're regulating. And they should have an idea that if they overregulate it, they can ruin it, right? So in a long-winded response, you know, I believe that we can figure out a way to come to a common ground where regulation makes sense and where it's fair and it's objective, it's not subjective just because it's digital currency, right? Every stable coin should not be treated like a bank. That doesn't really make much sense, right? So we'll talk more about that in some of the presentations or we can discuss it afterwards. I see a question coming to the microphone. Name and company, please. Hi, how's it going? My name is Logan. I'm the co-founder of Clear Contracts. Um, we're building DAO infrastructure in the Cardano ecosystem, and it's a pretty complicated but simple question, but I know you brought up you know, the difference between smart contracts and, and traditional contracts. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of the concept of smart contracts acting as law? Ooh, Evan, this is going to be fun. Uh, so um, I would love to answer that right now, but I want to, I want to save that juicy question for my, sec my section on smart contracts, but I'll give you a, a, a brief preview of what I'm going to say. Whether or not a smart contract is a legal agreement is the, remember the, the question I asked you uh, here? So you can ask that question, is a smart contract a legal agreement? Right? Generally speaking, the answer is no. But also, as smart contracts are evolving, it could be, it depends, right? So we are going to discuss that in more detail during our section, myself and Evan, because, I mean, we were having a discussion that last night in, in the rooftop with a bunch of people for over an hour. Because it's a great conversation to have, but it's an extremely important conversation to have, you know? And not only will the smart contract be a legal agreement, but we were talking with, uh, with somebody about auditing smart contracts, right? So, I mean, because you have a means that we have a means to audit contracts, you know, the lawyers, but it's not that easy with a smart contract because it's not written in an English language or whatever language it's in, right? It's written in code. So you, you're going to need an expert to be able to verify the authenticity and the, the, the usability of the smart contract as written in code. The two are going to combine and going to combine in a very powerful way. So companies like yours are way ahead of the curve. So we'll dig more into that during my session uh, with uh, smart contracts and um, uh, with, with Evan. Yes. Well, there's, there's two of you, so just, yep. Hi, my name is Les Atkins with Digital Gift. Hey, Les. Um, where do you see, like from an app standpoint, um, we have terms and conditions that they agree to and things of that nature. From a blockchain crypto standpoint, where do you see those TNCs encompassing so we have, we're protected and they're protected? 
You mean like putting it on a game store, I mean, uh, the, the Google Play and stuff like that? Or? Yeah, it's on iOS and Android right. from, right. An app, from an app standpoint. Right. Making sure that you're, as a company, protected, even though your users are using this technology and you have to like, right now it's T's and C's, you have to follow these guidelines around the world. So where do you see that headed from a blockchain crypto standpoint? Okay. So um, first let me do a, a quick recap in case you guys don't know what a, 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 a D app is. Uh, a decentralized application is a means by which a DAO or a DAC can put their product in the hands of anybody on their cell phone, right? That's a very important aspect to understand because, you know, what I teach in all my courses, if you don't have user accountability and you don't have user interface, then you, know, you don't have a product that's going to be successful. You have to have user interface, and user interface that works. And one good way to do that is through a, a, a D app, the centralized application. So how does that come into play? You don't have to have a D app on one of those, one of those uh, exchanges. You don't, they don't have to be on the Google Play or the iOS store, right? They can be, they don't have to be, but let's say you want them to be on there. The first question is, will they accept it? Will they take it? I have clients right now that we're, they're working on D apps, and we're trying to make sure that we have all the documentation in place to be able to be put on there. They are, five years ago, you wouldn't have found a D app on one of those platforms, but now it's getting on there, right? So, but you have to comply with their terms in order to be able to have your D app on their platform. So, to your point, you know, you really have to look at with their terms and conditions, and all your documentation has to be in order. And if there is a reason why you believe it should be on there, even though they should, you know, they say it's not, there is usually an appeal process or someone you can go to the next level. And I think that's gonna be very important because I think as these platforms see D apps growing and growing and growing in use and importance and money for them, they're going to begin to change their documentation requirements to make it much more relevant to what we're doing in the blockchain space. Okay, so that's kind of one of those, it depends slash we can take control of our own destiny because if we can say, oh, we can't get on there, uh, well, that's it, we're going to go somewhere else to do it ourselves. But we have to push the envelope. Blockchain technology inherently pushes the global decentralized public envelope. Don't stop there. If you're dealing with, with someone that, or, or company that can help you get your D app out there, and the only reason they don't is because they're uh, using the old rules, don't stop there. Engage someone to help you with the process. Whether it's a lawyer or not, I don't know, because it depends on the issue. But do not assume that because they said no the first time, that no is going to continue to be no once they see the benefit to them in a win-win scenario. Another question. Hi there, my name is Alexander Schul. I build uh, DeFi analytics and lending services. So with the emergence of blockchain technology in the decentralized finance space, there's been a handful of services that have popped up that are privacy <laughs> platforms. Um, such that a user can connect a wallet, deposit funds uh, through a known or traceable wallet, and then they wait a, a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and then they can uh, export those funds onto a completely clean wallet that's mm -hmm. fully anonymous. Yep. Uh, the alleged use of these is so that way your friends and family don't know if you have billions of dollars of crypto. But it actually is a pretty sweet honeypot for money laundering and tax evasion, right? Uh, is there any precedence for the utilization of these protocols uh, in existing case law? And if not, how do you anticipate uh, the regulations of these services? Man, you guys are going into my future presentations too much here. <laughs> uh, okay, spoiler alert, there is one law, uh, case law uh, precedent that I have that I'll be talking about very briefly uh, that addresses the issue. I don't want to give it away, uh, but uh, I, it was a case of first impression, which in the, in the uh, legal industry means that no one has ever decided this way before. Uh, and I think it's very telling for the way courts may go on this very issue. So stay tuned. I don't want to give it away, but I promise you I'm going to come back to that one. That one and the Reeves test. So, okay. Any more questions? I mean, this is some great questions, guys. I'm really excited about today. Uh, 
Nabil, come on up and, and uh, ask your question. So uh, Neil's one of the present Nabil's one of the presenters as well. So uh, here comes a really good question. Hello, Mr. Attorney. I have one question for you. <laughs> yes. Who's going to win the case between Ripple and SEC? Oh man! <laughs> Help us all make a little money. <laughs> So the opinions are my own, not of GBA or Cozen Law Group, or even better, better, better me, better we, my own company. Oh, I joke. Um, exactly. This is not investment advice. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All the disclaimers that you can think of, just throw them all in that pot. Um, the Ripple case. I don't know if you guys know about it. Whenever I, I'm asked a question, I have to make sure that everyone understands why the question is being asked. So here it is. Ripple was sued uh, because uh, the government felt that they were an unregistered security, okay? Ripple's defense was, well, you know, Ripple, the company, is different than Ripple, the cryptocurrency. Now, I got to tell you, and this is going back years ago, uh, and, and Ripple, I mean, Ripple was one of the big boys. Ripple was in the top 10 on CoinMarketCap Cap for, for quite some time. Um, so the lawyers were like, Hmm. So your argument is to separate Ripple, the company, from Ripple, the crypto. How does that really work? So initially, I got to tell you, I was skeptical about the argument. But if you follow the communication and the, the recent discussions about it, it seems like the tide is turning in Ripple's favor. Is it going to end up that way? I do not know. But Initially, I thought, my, my opinion only, full disclaimers, not investment advice, I thought it was going to be uh, a slam dunk against them, but apparently not. You know, and what happened when Ripple, when they were sued, the coin plummeted, right? So the question is, once the case is over, will the coin arise again? Excellent question. I don't know, but arguably, objectively, hypothetically, it most certainly could. So they're going to win. <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> Any more questions? All right, thank you so much. We're going to go on to our next presenter, uh, I guess, momentarily. How much time do we have? We got five minutes left? OK. Well, you guys want to take uh, more questions? Or what do you want to do? You want to do a stretch, a morning stretch, and get up and stretch the, the, the muscles and get the blood flowing? Oh, we got a question? Oh, someone's getting said, coffee. <laughs> Why don't you take a five minute break and come back for our next presenter and uh, we'll go from there. So I look forward to spending the entire day with you. If I'm not ripping and running or do, up here on stage, you want to talk to me, please come chat with me and I'll be at the, uh, the big event tonight. Don't forget the big event tonight. I know Kathy would probably be upset with me if I didn't give it one last plug this morning session, right? The 1920 Shindig, be sure to be there for those of you there in, in DC. For those of you who are watching globally, sorry you can't be here, but you know, try and come to the next one because these GBE events are really good. Great networking, great information, great fun. You know, we try and bring it all into place in, you know, in one conference. So uh, we're really proud to be having this kind of event at the National Press Club. We've had it at great venues in the past. This is another great venue, so uh, we encourage you to come join us in the future, especially after COVID is over. But in the meantime, let's take our break and we'll see you back here in five. Thank you.
Thank you. It's like I have my own rave going on. So. Okay. Um, well, hello and good morning. Um, as introduced, my name is Gabriella Cruz. I am a co-founder and I sit on the board of directors of the Global Digital Asset and Cryptocurrency Association. Um, we are a global voluntary self-regulatory association, which is a mouthful. Um, and we'll go into exactly what that is and how it helps to solve some of the challenges. Oh, thank you. Um, and how it helps to solve some of the issues that we see um, around cross-border engagement, around helping to steward and shepherd the development of the digital asset industry, and also giving some level of comfort to many of you who own businesses in the digital asset space and are seeking to understand and navigate a high degree of legal ambiguity and complexity, both here at home as well as abroad. Says it's on. It's all right. I can just say progress slide if you think that's better. It's okay. Okay. It's always fun to have technology issues at a technology conference. <laughs> really helps to solidify you as an expert. <laughs> Um, but anyway, today I'm going to go over um, a few key areas. Uh, the first is just to kind of level set. You know, a lot of us come from different backgrounds, different levels of understanding um, when it comes to the digital asset space. Um, I'm going to sort of set the scene when we talk about what I mean about jurisdictional issues, how and in what way those complicate your business, cost you money, and then also um, minimize what we're trying to do, which is to help steward responsible innovation. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about navigating today's issues, and I will take a crystal ball out and give a little bit of perspective on where I think this is going um, in terms of navigating those issues. And then I want to focus as well on some of the really amazing work um, that the Global DCA in support and partnership with the Government Blockchain Association is doing to try and you know, bring together global regulators and to focus efforts on knowledge sharing, lessons learned, and helping all of us move forward successfully around the world um, in this industry. And then, of course, questions. So next slide. So just to kind of start off, um, you know, the digital asset industry is significant and growing. Um, we are now at about you know, two to three trillion dollars, um, depending on which day we're at and the valuation. And you're looking at about an 880% increase in peer-to-peer -peer engagement um, and advancement of the industry. Uh, it's a very global industry. You know, there are countries that have you know, taken a bit more of a progressive stance. Um, they've leveraged and have focused on building out the industry for a particular use area. But generally speaking, um, every country around the world is at some stage of engagement in this space. And we see that that is reflected. So, um, you know, for example, in the Chainalysis, um, you know, geography of cryptocurrency report that they did for 2021, you can see that there is adoption, you know, in a number of different jurisdictions. It's not regional. Um, it's not based on level of development, but really kind of a broad swath. So this is very inherently a global issue. Um, I think it's also important to recognize that these are very high growth firms. And for those who may be focusing on this from a uh, regulator's seat, you know, and have a dual mandate where you're both trying to shepherd um, consumer protection as well as seeking to grow and advance economic growth and development in your countries, it's very important to make sure that you're balancing those two aspects and that you take into consideration what that means in terms of positioning, um, creating jobs for you and your people, and broader economic and social prosperity. So as an industry, if I were to use a few words, sometimes I think it's good to just kind of identify those keywords and then plug in and talk a bit more in depth on, on what we're seeing. 
So I think the first piece is that this is still a very evolving industry. And in particular, when it comes to legal and regulatory approaches around the world, it seems that every country, everywhere, is at a similar point in reckoning, meaning that they are coming to terms with how and in what way, you know, and we've talked about this a little bit in earlier presentations, how do you effectively regulate something that is decentralized? Because historically, traditionally, the regulation has been based on a centralized focus. There's a centralized regulator and some sort of a centralized entity to which you can point and target that type of a focus. If you're working in a peer-to-peer -peer system and you have distribution, you have decentralization, how are you going to mimic or create a similar level of regulatory coverage um, for your people, for your country, um, without that same level of one-on-one? -on -one? So again, someone somewhere in one country is responsible and we can go to that person, that company, if there's an issue and our regulations, our laws can be targeted to that entity. Um, this is, a, you know, I think both a philosophical um, as well as a regulatory question and it's one that, as I mentioned, you know, countries in Africa, Botswana, Uganda, um, Nigeria, countries in Asia, Singapore, um, India, um, in the US and even in Latin America and Caribbean, Middle East as well, um, you know, you're seeing each of these different regulators embarking on a similar sort of a quest for trying to solve this question of how and in what way they're going to maintain that dual mandate while acting in a very inherently decentralized field. Um, in terms of, you know, what approach they're taking, traditional in the first instance. And I think that you try to work through the systems that you have already. You know, we all know how long it takes many times to create new legislation, to stand up and, and to train, hire, and support the creation of a new regulatory entity. So it's very natural, I think, and from a perspective of, in a first instance, looking at trying to, you know, fit that into what exists already. Um, however, one of the challenges here is that the reality is that this isn't something that naturally lends itself to existing structures. And it maybe most importantly misses the fact that this isn't just a new technology, but rather it's the beginning of a transformation of what we're seeing with regards to the financial sector and the evolution of the global financial system. And so in that respect, those jurisdictions that are appropriately recognizing that are bringing together, for example, working groups or creating a whole of government approach or focusing to try and, you know, not only regulate, but to a certain extent to reimagine what it means to regulate. And I don't mean that, um, you know, just uh, kiddingly, but to really think if the goal of the regulatory entity is to protect consumers at the far end, then that's the impact you're trying to drive the regulatory reporting, the inspections, the oversight, those are the outputs in that system. But now we have to kind of, in some ways, refocus, reposition, and ensure that if we are now having to have disruption and some sort of a, again, disintermediation, even at like a regulatory institutional level, what does that mean for how and in what way you're going to continue to, to fulfill your mandate and serve the public interest? Um, you know, again, I've talked about the fact that, you know, it is, and we'll go into detail on why and how this has to be viewed globally, um, but today what we're seeing still is that a lot of the regulations are being very much bound by national borders, um, or jurisdictional borders, I should say. And the last piece is that, you know, again, you're dealing with something that is emerging, it's evolving. So creating a legal and regulatory framework that fits this space it's, um, it's trying to do that on top of a moving target. And that's a moving target that is moving extremely quickly, that requires a high degree of expertise and training, and that, again, is extremely global because it was built to facilitate cross-border engagement, and it very naturally lends itself to transcending those borders. So, I talked a little bit about the fact that, you know, don't feel left out if you're watching this from a, you know, a, an international regulatory authority, you're trying to figure out how and in what way you're gonna address this. You know, welcome to the club, kind of. Everybody's at that same sort of a starting point. 
um, you know, whether you're in India, like I said, you're in the UK, you're in the European Union, everybody's trying to understand how and in what way they need to shift and change and in some ways transform in order to mimic and mirror the underlying industry that they're responsible for overseeing. Um, I think it's important also to recognize that you have sort of a, you know, additional layer of complexity for those of us that come from jurisdictions that are federated. Um, so if you have, you know, subnational divisions in addition to, you know, your national level perspective, policy, regulations that you're undertaking, you have a whole nother element of coordination, harmonization, and potentially um, divisional uh, jurisdictional arbitrage that may be taking place that you either need to overcome or to leverage to the benefit of the whole of your nation. Um, I think what you're gonna see is, yes, in some cases, there are races to the bottom um, in the sense that certain jurisdictions may be trying to evade or to m minimize, let's say, um, any and all regulatory requirements. But I think that it also offers an opportunity for a race to the top. And what I mean about that is that this is a potential reset and an opportunity for, again, those countries that are looking to drive and attract businesses that sincerely um, have a high degree of resiliency and um, longevity, and their focus is not only on you know, today's dollar, but building a long-term business and contributing to directing the growth of the industry. That's the kind of a firm that you want moving into your jurisdiction. That's the kind of a firm that you would like to help shepherd and align with your broader national economic growth and job creation priorities. And this is the type of you know, member that we at the Global DCA are seeking to build and support. And I think as well, um, you know, the type of a relationship that you would like to have and the person that you'd like to have sitting across the table from you. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about, you know, just briefly because we could go through every and any different type of legal tradition or, you know, regulatory structure and a lot of that is uh, impacted based on historical ties, okay, legal traditions, code, common law, um, but I think one of the key pieces just to focus on as well is some of the benefits or potential um, advantages to those who are coming from a unified regulatory um, framework versus one that's a little bit more disparate. Because again, if you're talking about points within the framework that you're trying to devise, each and every point that is um, an area for additional layers of complexity, right? And all of that needs to be managed in order to ensure that as, as a nation, you're positioning yourself for that broader growth, global economic positioning, um, and opportunity. So this is where we take out the crystal ball <laughs> and I say, um, you know, what do we think we're going to see in the short term and what do we think we're going to see in the longer term, right? So I think um, in the short term, again, we're going to, and it's not wrong, it's, it's kind of a first step, is looking at what exists today, in what way can we leverage the, you know, systems, the legal and regulatory structure, how can it maybe be um, shaped? in order to fit sort of the early first stage of development that we're seeing in the industry. Because again, this is still the first inning of where this is going to go in terms of the growth and development of the global digital economy. Um, I think the next phase though is going to be a gradual realization in each and every country and each and every working group that this is so much more than just Bitcoin and Ethereum and we're still kind of at that point where, you know, the uh, blinders haven't come off to the broadness and the breadth of all and everything that this will transform. And I think once that happens, you're going to have a greater degree of understanding about how and why global engagement, communication, dialogue, um, and cooperation is going to be important. Um, and like I said, I think in the future, you're gonna see a very strong interest and a very important role for civil society organizations, nonprofits, associations, and even international organizations that exist today and facilitate a lot of that ongoing engagement around traditional finance. And the last piece I'll say is that there's going to be an increased need for standard setting. Um, and we'll get into that as well, but you know, 
To a certain degree, yes, there's benefits around being able to select a jurisdiction that has certain advantages that they've put forward to enhance the attractiveness of basing operations there, of building and growing. But if you're a global business and you are operating in a number of different jurisdictions, a number of different states, at a certain point, it actually becomes a detraction because you're trying to do business across these areas. And it's, you know, in order to understand the additional costs that's associated with operating, navigating, understanding the different legal and regulatory frameworks, all of those are costs, costs, costs that hit your bottom line. And if you're looking to try and create a technology that works cross-border, you also have to be looking at helping to shape and support the elaboration of a legal and regulatory framework that similarly mimics, follows, and helps to create almost a runway where the industry can take off, okay? So what is the Global Digital Asset and Cryptocurrency Association doing to address this? Um, so as I said, we are a very long descriptive name of a global, <laughs> voluntary, self-regulatory association. Um, and really what that means is that, um, you know, our focus is in the first instance on standard setting. Um, so we lend our voice to existing um, global standard setting uh, frameworks. These have high degrees of due process, they're transparent, and they have a high um, level of market recognition and integrity. Um, where and when there are gaps, this is when we seek to identify those issue areas, create standards for our membership and for the broader industry as a whole, and then also provide um, detailed guidance because a standard is great, a principles-based standard is great, but at the end of the day, somebody has to take that and implement it in practice. And that's usually the point at which you lo lose people and you risk losing all the benefits of an international level of harmonization if you can't translate that adoption into implementation. The next piece that we focus on is education. Um, and this is around ensuring that, um, you know, when we talk about protecting, you know, consumers and investors, ensuring that people that hold a role or a position in advising um, on how and in what way um, to create a responsible mix, um, leveraging digital assets, is going to be increasingly important. And so from our side, we do have a heavy focus, including you know, today's presentation and engagement, um, but also just engaging in a number of different free, open to the public opportunities to share industry knowledge and understanding. And then the last piece that we focus on is advocacy. And in that space, we take it from a very global perspective, meaning that we engage and provide input and perspective in order to help support elected leaders in making informed policy decisions. Um, and to this extent, um, we do that both here in the US, but also around the world. Um, and from our side, you know, it's through creating research reports that are publicly available or um, through lending our insight through, you know, external organizations that are doing research on the industry, facilitating survey participation, so on and so forth. Today we have 60 plus um, member firms. Those include small, medium, as well as large businesses. And we have 15 memorandums of understanding with other national level self-regulatory movements. And the importance of that is that it creates both an opportunity for us to knowledge share, to understand, um, and to gain insight into what some of the trends or issues or conditions are in those markets, um, as well as to have, you know, really crucial insight on what's coming down the line. And because again, we're dealing with a very global industry and being able to have those relationships and to be able to understand what's coming next is important to ensuring that we're appropriately positioning strategically and helping to support the development of the industry for the benefit of members stakeholders, and the public interest. So that brings me to um, you know, one of my favorite points, um, which relates to this amazing piece of cooperation that we are doing with the Government Blockchain Association. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we do have a sincere commitment to the public interest. And in that, we believe that it is, um, it's part of our responsibility to share a bit about you know, what we see in, in the industry, what are some key issue areas, what are challenges, and what are opportunities. And I think in this respect, um, we've come together 
I co-chair our regulator working group. It is open to all government regulatory representatives. It's an opportunity to kind of come together as a community of practice and to, as I've said, share knowledge, to build bridges between and amongst you know, different regulatory bodies. And it's really just a point of networking. Independently, they may go off, you know, engage. There may be potentials for twinning for, um, so meaning where one regulator would share their, you know, process, their program for developing, evolving with another regulator, right? Um, but the idea is that, especially given the global nature of this, it's important from, I think, a global risk perspective to ensure that there's active cooperation and dialogue and that that's being undertaken in some ways formally and in other ways informally. Um, so that's just a little bit about it. We treat it very much like a bit of open office hours. So if you are interested, please feel free to visit the GBA website, sign on as a member, and then you can opt to participate in the working group. And so that's it. Um, you know, I apologize um, for taking so long. I know I tend to speak at length, um, but at this point I'd like to kind of open it up. And if there's any broad questions that people have or, um, you know, please feel free. I'm happy to engage and we can have a nice talk. <laughs> yeah, please. Oh, no. Nope. So what steps would you recommend in, to a company that's going to um, work cross-border in multiple countries um, to kind of prepare or inoculate yourself against regulatory problems? Uh, Often the advice is to talk to the regulators, but that's the U.S. regulators for, for us, but what do you yeah. do? How yeah. do you talk to all of them? So I think there's a few things. One is, um, you know, I always tell people there's a lot, it, depending on how many jurisdictions you're working across and where and, you know, what um, locales your business is going to touch, there is always an opportunity to engage at a national level with a industry association or with one of, for example, our MOU partners, right? And that can give you kind of a, a degree of understanding about what some of the challenges are that businesses perhaps similar to yours may be facing. Um, it will also give you, to a certain degree, a soft landing into that country because you're you know, instantly connected into a network. You have a group of industry peers that can support you. Um, so I think that, you know, at this point, because things are still quite disparate, um, those would be some of the key ways. Of course, hiring good legal counsel <laughs> um, is always important as well. And I think, you know, depending on the jurisdiction, um, you know, a lot of regulators are very eager to sit down and to work with you and to learn about your business. And, you know, I. I can speak to just some of those that are part of our working group or in this space. They're really trying to um, ensure that they have the most up-to-date information and that they're fulfilling their, you know, legal mandate, which is typically dual-focused, right? So it is economic growth and it's also consumer protection. And we always joke that, you know, if you wanted ultimate consumer protection, you would never approve any product ever because then everyone would always be 100% protected. Um, but I think, you know, in that respect, um, as I've said, there is a willingness on many global um, jurisdictional regulators to sit down and to learn a bit about what your business is and to see if there's a way, I think, at least initially, to give insight as to how and in what way you can build your business in a compliant manner, right? Um, so, you know, legal support, association engagement, and then I would say, you know, talk on the ground and get a feel for the degree of openness and engagement that that regulator is willing to have, especially with this emerging industry. My name is Preston Fisher. I'm with the FTI Consultant. One of the issues that pops up in our disputes and investigation practice quite frequently is where a digital asset is domiciled. Yeah. This kind of exasperates that issue of, of centralized standards that are traditional meeting decentralized assets, trying to ascertain where the responsibility is, where the, resp uh, the, the authority is, whether we're talking about an organization or an individual. If you could provide some comment on that, that'd be great. Sure. So um, I will say, 
Yes, 100%. <laughs> um, that is an extremely important issue. And I think it goes to the heart of some of what I've covered, but I'll elaborate a little bit further and just say that, you know, again, um, I think many times when we talk about digital assets, there's a focus or a hyper focus on things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. And it misses this much broader picture, which is the fact that we're moving towards a decentralized system in the financial sector. And if you are you know, uh, working at a regulator, you have to recognize that transition and that transformation because ultimately, in order to fulfill your responsibility for ensuring and, and promoting consumer investor protection and the public interest, you need to then devise, and I, like I say, um, I don't say it to be coy or cheeky, but you almost have to reimagine what it means when there's not this centralized focal point where you can put your regulatory effort and energy, right? And so how are you now going to, and you know, I talk a lot about this from a standpoint of transitioning, like um, it's not this whack-a-mole, um, you know, uh, like rough uh, approach or adversarial relationship that you need to have. It's more along the lines of being almost like a gardener and shaping the growth of an industry overall, recognizing that you're not going to necessarily have a centralized focal point, but now it's almost like community management to a certain degree, right? And I know people will laugh and, you know, but you're shaking your head and I think we both know that. And so I think that it's that philosophical shift that has to take place. It's the recognition that this isn't just about a new financial product that needs to be regulated. It's about an overarching shift that we're seeing, which has been spurned by technology, which was definitely foreseen when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution and the digital economy, but how and in what way are you going to shift and shape into that new role? Because ultimately, if you're able to do that, you will be much better able to fulfill your mandate, you'll be able to help guide the development of the industry, and all the benefits of that that come through they'll be able to accrue to you and your people. And at the end of the day, you know, I think most people who are engaged in this industry, yes, from a potential like profit seeking and you know perspective, but there is a lot around the belief system that this this entails. And it means about greater economic opportunity, greater social opportunity, and I think greater overall opportunity for people all over the world. Thanks. Yeah, please. Mark Wasser, GBA again. It seems as if the best initial global initiative is the one for the 15% corporate taxes across the board. Do you think that has any chance of passing? And is there some way to maybe make it so that it does? So I think there's a few pieces to that. Um, one is that, you know, yes, cross-border issues will include things like um, legal issues. They will include taxation issues. They will include audit and accounting and financial reporting issues. And I think that it's important to not um, over micro focus on any one key point, but rather to look holistically at the basket of, you know, key pain points that are at this point acting as bottlenecks for the industry to grow and develop all over the world. So in terms of, you know, taxation, I would say, you know, I think we need to look at a broader view of what it is that we're trying to build, how we're trying to shape and better the world, and in what way the industry can contribute to that and we can advance um, a broader level of prosperity. You need me to cut it off, okay. So this has been fun. Um, I'd just like to thank everybody at the Government Blockchain Association. You know, again, we are firmly committed to the public interest and we believe in a strong degree of dialogue and support between public and private sector. Um, you know, for those who are watching in foreign jurisdictions and are finding themselves with a blank sheet of paper as to how to go about, you know, designing a system that works for your people and also works for industry, please feel free to join the GBA and to participate in the GBA slash Global DCA working group. Um, we welcome you and we again look forward to engaging. Thank you all very much for your time.
right, everyone. So we have a break coming up next. It is. It was originally scheduled for 20 minutes, but we're going to do 15 just to make up a few minutes uh, this morning so we can stay on schedule. So please come back in 15 minutes. All right, thank you.
All right, welcome back, everybody. So we are kicking off our first uh, mid-morning. Everybody, we're about to kick off if we could get quiet in the room. Hello? All right, so we are gonna be kicking off the, after the morning session with a, uh, a session on privacy and data protection coming all the way from England. We have Shiv Agarwal. Thank you, everyone. Okay, let me check that this is working or not. Okay, perfect. Let's get started. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm Shiva Garwal, founder and CEO of Earth ID, an award-winning decentralized identity platform. I'm also leading GBA across Europe, Middle East, and Africa. As a part of the GBA leadership team, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the organizing team and the entire GBA community spearheaded by Kathy and Gerard for putting together this amazing conference on a topic which is of paramount importance, that is, future of money, governance, and law. I would also like to thank the attendees for their valuable time and presence, which is crucial to making this event interactive and beneficial for everyone. On that note, let's take a look at the topic of my presentation. So basically, it's privacy and data protection. And I think this is something which all, which all of us worry about, right? On the internet, there is no way to ascertain whether you are interacting uh, with a credible individual or getting scammed by a punk or a bot. This is because the current version of the internet is missing the layer of trust. In the 15 years of my professional career as a certified enterprise architect, I have driven the IT strategy and digital transformations for various global brands. Now I am focused on driving the digital transformation of the internet through the provision of a safe, secure, and frictionless digital identity. So we'll be talking about quite a few topics today under, under the banner of like privacy and data protection. So basically the topics are privacy, anonymity, confidentiality, and data protection. I would also talk about global data protection laws, primarily GDPR. I would also attempt to cover the what, how, and why of decentralized identity. Okay, so I think it's a very important question, right? What is privacy? And it's a, it's, it's in today's connected world, it becomes very important because of IOTs and social media where we are under constant surveillance. So privacy is an individual's or an entity's right to be left alone or freedom from intrusion. So basically it's like we should be able to do certain things without being uh, bothered by uh, either organizations or, or other individuals, right? So that is what privacy is all about. And privacy is an individual's or entity's right to be left, left alone or freedom from the intrusion, right? As I mentioned, so I'm repeating again the same point. But when we apply this concept to information, it's about control over one's personal information on how it is being collected and how it is being used, right? And this is, this is where I think a lot of data protection clause comes in, which, is, which basically gives you control with respect to what, how, and uh, is, is basically gathered about you as an individual uh, in terms of uh, privacy, consent, and so many other aspects with respect to how the data is being processed, stored, and uh, transported. So now I think uh, within the blockchain and the crypto communities, there has been always a debate about anonymity versus privacy. And it's a very important, I think there's a very important distinction. So I think we can all understand why why does Bruce Wayne, a billionaire, needs to wear a mask, right? So it's, it's about protecting the identity, right? But, but what does that mean? So basically, anonymity is about concealing your identity, but not the actions. Sometimes, anonymity is important for, let's say, freedom of speech, or particularly for whistleblowers, right? So it's about when there are certain, I think, impact of your actions, that is when import, anonymity becomes important, right? And that is where blockchain community and even cryptocurrency, uh, people who are dealing with cryptocurrencies, they basically debate about whether we, they want anonymity or whether they want privacy. 
Now, confidentiality is primarily access to information, right? It's about basically keeping something as a secret or disclosing it to only people of privileged value, right? I think we all might know one or two instances where confidential information is leaked and the custodian of the information faces the repercussions. And I think we have seen this in a lot of, I think if, if people have worked in corporates or maybe government roles, we have, we get access to certain information which is fit for certain purpose and it cannot be shared with everyone, right? So that is what confidential information becomes. Now data protection is the process of safeguarding uh, identifiable information or any other confidential information from unauthorized access and misuse. Okay, before I go there, I just wanted to basically take the example of Bruce Wayne and, uh, and Batman to basically talk about these, these different aspects, right? So as a Bruce Wayne, he's a billionaire, and, uh, and he's basically trying to protect his uh, uh, identity as well as some information about himself. So that is what privacy is, right? But when he, he becomes a Batman, that is what, where he is trying to be anonymous because there are certain, act certain actions that he's taking uh, which has certain repercussions, right? So that becomes uh, anonymity. But when we talk about confidenti confidentiality, so there are a few people who know that Bruce Wayne is the Batman, right? And that is where it becomes important for these people who know this information, they protect this information uh, this confidential information, right? For example, if, if they know that Bruce Wayne is um, Batman, then they should not be telling this to everyone. And similarly, if they know where the Batcave is, they should not be telling this to everyone. So they should not be disclosing a confidential information which they know about someone which has an impact on their lives. So this is how basically the, the different topics are tied together. Now let's talk about GDPR, right? So GDPR, it's basically General Data Protection Regulation from European Union, and it is one of the most prominent and stringent data protection laws around the world. It lays down the rules around gathering, processing, storage, and movement of personal data of citizens for protection. So again, I think it, it's basically talking about all the concepts that we discussed about privacy, uh, uh, anonymity, consent, and all those things. So it's about how do you basically apply all those concepts to people's data so that it can be protected. And this is specifically for the citizens of European Union. And, and basically, I think it, it's, it's a fundamental right, right? So uh, it's a fundamental right and it's freedom to basically protect your information, right? And, this, and similarly, there are a lot of uh, other uh, data protection laws around the world which will come and talk about that. But when we talk about GDPR, there are certain principles that we need to basically consider, right? And uh, if you talk about them, so some of the important aspects are basically, the first principle is lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. So whenever an organization or an entity, when they are handling the personal information of an individual or an other entity, they have to be lawful about it. They have to be fair, and they have to be transparent. And I think a lot of us, if, if you are accessing websites from European Union, you would have start, started seeing that there are a lot of, I think, cookies that you need to select or deselect with respect to how your information can be gathered and how your information can be processed. So basically, you're providing a consent uh, to, to access to your information for a specific purpose. Right? So this is, this is what uh, GDPR defines. And that is what purpose limitation is, right? So when we talk about purpose limitation, it's about that you are, yes, you are sharing your information but it's for a specific purpose. So outside that purpose, they should not be processing your information. Similarly, it's about data minimization, right? So obviously, I have a lot of information about myself, but for a certain process or a certain transaction, I think there's, there's a small amount of data that is needed. So this is very basically, if you are sharing your information or the, the, the organization which is gathering information about you, they have to do basically, they should gather only the bare minimum of information that is required for a particular transaction. Then ac accuracy, because obviously what happens is like these organizations uh, and, and even people, when they get, gather data about us, sometimes this data goes bad or this data is not synced, right? So it's their responsibility to make sure that whatever data they have gathered, it's basically accurate, right? And also there are storage limitations, because obviously I think depending on different types of data, 
there's a limitation with respect to how and where it can be stored. So I think uh, we would have seen that sometimes it's at a state level, sometimes it's at a country level, a country level, and sometimes it's obviously at the, the entire European Union level. And similarly, there are the certain data protection laws, uh, for example, in Australia or in maybe some other part of the world or even in US, where you cannot basically transport the data of an individual outside that particular region. The sixth one is basically integrating integrity and the confidentiality, uh, uh, basically again. So it's about how do you ensure that the data that has been captured that is basically used uh, in, a, in a manner which is, in, uh, which is driven by integrity, and then also basically the confidentiality of the data is also maintained. And then lastly, accountability. So the, the, whoever is gathering this data, whoever is processing this data, whoever is storing this data, or whoever is transporting this data, they are accountable, right? They are accountable for, for the actions and the repercussions. So now when we talk about GDPR, the, the individuals have different rights, right? And these rights are about uh, the, their, their personal information. And the first right is basically right to be informed, right? It's about they, an individual has the right that they, they are being informed what data is being collected about them and for what purpose. So this is very, very important. And that is why, I, as an example, when we, look, when we visit any of the uh, portals or websites in European Union, we have to basically provide our consent for various different reasons that, OK, yes, you can collect this data, but for only these purposes. So it's, it's about the, the organization needs to inform the end user. OK, next. Sorry. Yeah, then it's about right of access. So basically, it's like the organization should also provide access that, okay, this is the information that, that is being held about this particular individual. So that is right of access. Then we have right to rectification, right? Or basically corrections of if, if, if somebody identifies an errors or omissions in, in the data set about an individual or an organization, then they have the right to rectification. So they can basically approach them and then they can basically get it rectified. Then right for erasure. This is very, very important. And this is where basically, let's say, if I have shared my information with somebody or some organization for a given purpose, even after providing that consent for usage, I still have the right to erasure. So I can approach that organization and can ask them, I can ask them to basically delete that information about me from their systems. And they do not have they, they cannot process this further. Or they cannot process this information any further. So they have to delete it from all their systems. The right to restrict. So basically, it's, it's again about uh, that. Uh, it's about processing of the uh, processing of the data, but it's restricted, right? It's restricted by the purpose. It's restricted by the consent. The right to the data portability, and then again, it's, it's like because when we collect the data, it can be port ported for various different reasons uh, within an organization, within a region, and outside, basically the boundaries of a region, right? So this is where again. Uh, the, the data portability is about this individual, the owner of the, the actual owner of the data, they have this right that they can take their data from one platform or one device to any other platform, any other device. So nobody can restrict them to do so because they are the rightful owner of the data. And then lastly, it's about uh, right to object the processing and profiling of the automatic. So basically what happens is like, a lot of organizations basically use uh, AIs or bots for processing this information, right? And, and then we have seen that a lot of social media platforms also collect a lot of information about us, and then they process it for various reasons. So we can actually object against that. So that is another right under GDPR. So I think we have sort of covered a lot of different aspects about GDPR, but let's also take a look at some of the laws, other data protection laws around the world. Right? So I'll give you a minute to basically just look at them. But there, there are some very prominent ones, right? For example, in US, the California law is like one of the, one of the most prominent ones. But then similarly, there are a lot of other uh, laws as well. I will also pick the example of India. So India has basically tabled a bill around personal data protection. It's still not a law, but the, the bill is already on the table. And it's, it seems to be one of the most, I think, stringent laws that would basically come into uh, application if, if it becomes a law.
Now let's talk about my favorite topic, which is decentralized identity. So basically decentralized identity is a user-centric identity powered by blockchain or distributed ledger technology. So before we actually start talking about uh, decentralized identity, I just want to basically share some of the identity trends that are happening in the industry, right? So now what is happening is like we are actually, as a world, we are moving towards consumer-centric uh, processes, right? Where individuals are at the center of everything. They are at the center of the value creation, they are at the center of the services being sold, and they are center of everything, right? And that is where, and, and a lot of personalization also happens, right? Oh, right. Okay, I haven't done this, sorry. Uh, so a lot of personalization also happens around the individual needs, right? So a lot of data is getting collected, and then the data is getting used for personalizing ads, services, and so many other things. Similarly, it's about self-managed and owned identity, right? So with, because there are so many stringent data production laws around the world, so the ownership has become very important, or actually it's become crucial, right? There's no way out, so it, now the, owner, the individual is the owner, so that is where they can actually manage it, right? So with respect to what happens with that data. And then basically all the different organizations or service providers, they want to provide seamless user experiences. And then for that to happen, they need to basically understand the profile of an individual, right? They need to understand the persona of an individual. Security, privacy, I think we have talked about this, that all the organizations, they have become very conscious about security and privacy. And it's not that they want to do this, but, but they, they don't have any choice, right? Because of all the data protection laws. And this is where security and privacy is now underlying principle of most of the IT systems around the world. And even basically non-IT systems for that matter. Now we also have mobile devices everywhere. And I think that is where I think it becomes important that as to how do you ensure that people who are using mobile devices for various different purposes with respect to engaging the, with the digital ecosystem, so how do you ensure that that, it, that works uh, seamlessly with the identity of the individual while accessing different services using the mobile device? Then we have AIs and robots everywhere. So it's like we are building IoT ecosystems. We have smart devices in our homes, in our factories, in our offices, in our organizations. And then they are processing data everywhere, right? And this is, this is the ground reality, we know that. We have Alexa at our home. We have so many other personal assistants everywhere processing our information right, left and center, 24 hours across the day. And again, I've covered this, right? IoT is a disruptor, so everything is connected. We are living in a connected world. Everybody knows everything about everyone. So Facebook knows everything about us. Google knows everything about us. So it's like the connected world is, is the new reality. And then biometrics is also everywhere, right? So if I take the example of India, let's say. So in India, there's this Aadha program, which is a national identity program. And then they have captured the data of one billion citizens. So they have the biometrics information of one billion people, right? And if you look at the Western world, uh, including US, we have surveillance all, all over the world, right? We, we can see that if we go to a hotel, if we go to a conference, if we go to an office, uh, we have surveillance all over the place. We have cameras recording everything. We also have cameras in our homes, right? So for, for security purposes, but we are recording everything. So these are some of the trends uh, which are there. And we sort of de define how identity should be working, right? How, how do we basically create an identity which is basically fit for purpose? And which is basically, which goes with trends, but it also basically solves some of the challenges. So before we start talking about what decentralized identity is, let's talk about some of the challenges that we have with the current models. And I think these are some of the models, right? And I think these are self-explanatory. Uh, we all know that there are so many prominent identity frauds and thefts, right? And they are, they are part of the life. Uh, you can talk about any platform around the world. Uh, you can talk about any corporate around the world. You can talk about any government around the world. They have been basically, uh, they ha there have been data breaches, there have been identity thefts, there have been identity frauds. And the impact of identity thefts and frauds, it, it's basically financial, it's reputational, it has, it's emotion. So it, it's like it impacts individuals, organizations, and governments alike. So this is like one of the most, it's one of the biggest challenges that we have out there. Similarly, we can talk about lack of user privacy. I think we have talked about surveillance that basically uh, sort of plays against the user privacy. 
Similarly, the com compliance overhead. So we have, so one, the, the initial topic was about privacy, data protection, and all the laws, laws and regulations which are around the world. So we have regional laws, we have global laws, and then there, there, there's a com compliance overhead. Uh, and actually large organizations, they are spending millions of dollars to basically comply with these laws. And if they're not compliant, actually they can, they can be fined up to a few percentages. And this is specifically from GDR, GDPR perspective. They can, be, they can be fined up to a few percentage of, of their revenue, which can actually go into billions. Then it's also about efficient and repetitive processes, right? So we have seen this in our personal lives, that we share the same information about ourselves with so many different organizations, right? We go through the same processes. If you have to open a bank account, if you have to basically get an insurance, you have to buy a car, if you buy a house, or if you have to get employment, or maybe if you have to basically get healthcare services. So we are providing the same information again and again, and then the same information is getting verified about us. So we, we know how KYC works, how AML works, but those processes are being repeated very inefficiently. Then we can talk about paper-based certification of the process. And I think uh, everybody in this room understand that how blockchain is being actually explored about how you can basically issue digital certificates. So instead of having paper-based certificates like your, uh, your uh, degree certificates, your educational credentials, your employment credentials, I think from paper, how can we uh, move to digital? Because paper is, first of all, it's not good for the environment, but then it, it's, 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 it's very frictional in nature. And it can be easily tampered with, it can be easily copied and, and uh, misused. And lastly, I think it's about unethical behavior and practices. So I think it summarizes, sort of summarizes everything that I've just talked about, right? So it's like there are organizations, there are individuals who basically unethically collect information, they process information, and then they misuse, misuse information. So these are some of the challenges that are out there, right? And I think because of all these things, I think there's an evolution of the digital identity, right? And I think we all know that it started as a centralized identity system, basically where, uh, where a single organization is basically issuing an identity to an individual and it's controlled by that organization. So we can talk about, let's say, a national identity. So it's issued by a particular government. We can talk about an employee ID, which is again issued by a particular employer. And similarly, we can talk about a lot of other identities. So they are issued by one single organization and it's controlled by them. And it can, it can also be revoked by the same organization. And it has a very specific jurisdiction with respect to where that identity would be used or consumed. And then we move to federated, right? So I think this is where a lot of organizations started collaborating and then they started basically using the same identity within that ecosystem. So we can talk about Facebook ID, we can talk about Google ID, and then I think within the corporate space, our organization can basically use the same ID for their partner ecosystem as well. So it's a federated model. Now, I think, now we are moving towards a decentralized identity model, right? Where the identity is basically uh, decentralized from two perspectives. One is from the storage perspective, uh, storage of identity information, and the second is from the control perspective. So when we talk about the storage, so right now when we talk about the centralized or the federated systems, the information of all the stakeholders, right, of all the employees, all the citizens, they are stored in one single uh, centralized database or, or a system, information system. And once that gets hacked, uh, it impacts all the users or all the individuals whose data is stored there, right? For example, if, if somebody is able to ha hack Aadhaar's database, then, then they can get away with the data of one billion people. And similarly, and, and, and this, is, this is not something which I'm making up, this is actually happening, right? And this, there are a lot of big systems, uh, public or private in nature, which have been hacked and data have been stolen. But what decentralized identity does is basically it's about that the data storage is also decentralized in the sense like your data is with you in your private wallet. And that wall, the definition of wallet is, is slightly flexible. So the wallet could be uh, on your private device, like for example, mobile phone. It could be in the cloud, but again, but again it's, it's like a, a, a piece of uh, space which is allocated to you, or it could be on a decentralized uh, storage as well, right? For example, IPFS. And the second part is the control, right? So the decentralization of the control. 
And this is about how you as an individual is able to control your information, and I as an individual and the owner of the data, I am able to control my information. So this is basically the, the de decentralization happens at two levels, the storage as well as the control. Okay, so let's talk about what user-centric decentralized identity actually means. So obviously, uh, we are talking about a user, uh, and then he has certain information about himself. And then in this new world, we are talking about an ID wallet, right? Where basically, irrespective of what that platform is, mobile, cloud, web, or hardware wallet, they have a wallet where they are able to basically store their information. They are, they are owning and managing this, this private wallet or private space. But then we have an ecosystem, <coughs> excuse me, ecosystem of organizations and service providers who are actually issuing different types of identity or information or certificates or credentials to this individual or this user. And what they end up doing is like, so they basically directly issue all these credentials directly to the user wallet. So the way we have to compare this is that in today's world, uh, basically we, we get a, a driving license which is physical in nature, we get a passport which is again physical, a paper copy, we get our university credentials, we get our employment credentials, all paper copies, and then we, we struggle to basically maintain them, right? And then even if, if, if we are talking about digitization in certain cases, thank you. So I, uh, uh, in, uh, so basically if we compare, even if we basically start digitizing some of the records, even then I think it's very frictional because, because that they would be stored in, in respective databases, right? And, and that is what we are moving away from. So in this particular model, the identity is, or the ecosystem is actually being built around the user, and then all the records about that individual is, is getting issued directly to the user's wallet. And so that he or she is able to basically control how that data is being shared, consumed, stored, or ported. What, whatever we talked about, GDPR and the different principles, right? So all those things can be applied here with this one single solution, which is basically an identity wallet. Now, I think the key question is, why is it needed, right? I think there's a spelling mistake, but why is it needed? Uh, it's needed because of various reasons, right? So first of all is like the value and the usefulness. Because obviously, I think as an owner of my, uh, as an owner of my information, I want to basically use it and optimize it for various different reasons. I want to make sure that it's fit for purpose. And, there, and, and World Economic Forum has actually defined five elements of user value, right? One is fit for purpose, second is inclusive, third is useful, uh, offers choice and secure. So basically it's like, so we are looking at decentralized identity, the model of decentralized identity, because we want to make sure that these different elements are met with, right? So that is one of the, perp the, one of the reasons why this is needed. The second reason is about data minimalism and transparency. Again, coming back to GDPR and other data protection laws, how do you ensure that you are sharing minimum amount of data for a particular transaction. For example, when we, uh, yesterday when I came into this building, so I was asked whether I am vaccinated. So I, show, I showed the proof of my vaccination. Then I also show, showed a proof of my identity. But then when I share my driving license, actually when I show my driving license to a stranger, there's a lot of information that I'm actually sharing with him, him or her, right? Because my name is there, my address is there, my date of birth is there, and so, so, so much more. And an individual might, and that particular individual may be able to record that information and misuse it, right? And this is where basically we have to ensure how that we minimize the data and then we ensure that transparency is there, right? With respect to how that data is being uh, managed and consumed. And then it's about ecosystems, right? So we, are, we should be building ecosystems around individuals, not vice versa. And it's, it's about uh, the, Again, because I think all people in this, in this room, at least most of us, are interested in the, the new decentralized tech, right? And it's about how do you basically, because we believe in this, right? And that is where it, it's about ensure understanding how we can apply these concepts to, to identity, to our digital identities. And then it's, it's about also removing the silos, right? Because right now, I think I have a lot of information about me is basically stored in a lot of different systems. 
Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't work, and that is why a uh, lot of service providers, they are not able to provide the right service to me, right, the right level of service to me, because maybe they don't know the complete picture about me, right. And this, in certain cases, it goes against privacy, but in certain cases, it actually works in your favor if they have the right information about you. And then lastly, it's about uh, the sectors, right? Because, because across different sectors, the, the, the information has different purposes. So it's about how different organizations are able to basically compete and provide better services to individuals. So I think there are a lot of reasons why we need to basically look at and take this, this model very seriously. Okay, now the key question is like, okay, we understand what, we sort of understand what decentralized identity is, why is it needed? But the key question is how would it work or how does it work, right? And I think again, we have a user uh, and the user would have a self-managed digital identity, right? So we would have an identity which would be managed by the user so in terms of basically uh, the control. And then also they would be uh, different uh, issuing or organizations would be issuing identity directly to that issue, right? Which is basically in the control of the user. So what we are saying is that, so we are changing the model. So we are saying that the, uh, the, the issuing authorities would issue that identity directly to the user wallet and then that is where the user would basically maintain the control. Then it's also about identity ownership, which we have again discussed that who owns the data, right? And I think I, I want to discuss one point where when we, so I, I was participating in a debate in the US and in the UK parliament and it, it was about uh, who's, who owns the healthcare data whether it's the medical professional, whether it's the patient, whether it's the laboratory, or whether it's like any other, like maybe the insurer, right? So, so it's like who owns that data? And that is where I think in, in, in this model, the, and again, as we talk about the data, different data protection laws, the individual is the owner of the data, right? So it's about establishing that ownership. Then it's, a, it's basically, it's a de decentralized web of trust, right? So again, it's, it's about how do you ensure that different individuals around the world and then different organizations, they are basically connected in a way where the trust can be established for various different reasons. Similarly, it's, it's about based on informed consent because I think consent is one of the underlying parameter, right? It's about an individual should be consenting for the for the consumption of the information and for the processing of the information. And then lastly, it's about identity issue and validation. Uh, okay. For the trusted ecosystem, right? So it's, it's again, it's, it's again we are talking about ecosystem, but it's a trusted ecosystem. And lastly, uh, it's about consumption of personalized information, right? It's about consumption of personalized information. It's about pro uh, provision of uh, personalized experiences as well. Okay, so, so Earth ID, as I mentioned earlier, so I am the founder and CEO of Earth ID, which is a award-winning decentralized IT management platform. And we have actually implemented the solution, which is basically, which has taken the key principles of decentralized identity and different data protection laws. And we have built this solution and it has a few components, right? So first of all, it has a user wallet. And it also has a, a distributed ledger layer, right, which, which talks about a decentralized identity. And what it allows is that it allows the issuers and the verifiers and the owner of the information to basically connect with each other in a very frictionless manner and in a very low coupling manner, right? So it's about how do you ensure that these three stakeholders of the identity information are, are able to interact with each other in a very frictionless and a, in a very trusted manner, because right now, that process is not necessarily working because there's, because there's a huge cost and time associated with the, the processing of the information. And then that also leads to different types of frauds. So this is where basically it's about how do you connect different uh, pieces together to bring together a solution which is fit for purpose. And there's also a concept of verifiable credentials, right? So basically verifiable credentials are digital credentials which follow certain standards so that they, are, they become interoperable. Uh, for example, right now, if I talk about five or 20 different types of ID documents, they, are, they don't work together because you are not able to basically uh, use them in, in, a, in a selective data disclosure fashion, right? Either you show everything or, either, or you don't show anything. But with this model, you can actually do selective data disclosure. So within the same document, you can still basically decide what you want to share. And some of the key features are basically 
decentralized identity, which we now sort of understand. And then it's about verifiable credentials. It's about multi-channel wallets, right? Because not everybody is using a mobile device. Yes, most of us use mobile devices for various reasons, but maybe we don't want to use it for identity. And that is where it's important to have multi-channel wallets. So it's like either I, it could be a hardware wallet. Maybe I want to basically use, like the way I use a debit card, I should be able to basically carry my identity in a card, a smart card, and I should be able to present it to where I, wherever I have to present it. Then it's about selective data disclosure. So I should be able to choose what I want to share. I don't want to share everything. I want to share a small iota of information about myself for a specific purpose. Then it's zero knowledge proof, wherein certain, and I'm not going to go in detail for this, but it's a technical concept where you are able to basically prove certain things about yourself without sharing any iota of information. For example, I can prove that I'm an adult, maybe I'm a uh, UK citizen, or maybe uh, I'm employed by a certain organization. And then it's also about how do you use biometrics for bringing, uh, for, because biometrics is a very integral part of an individual's identity, and how do you use it for various different reasons, right? From, from a security perspective, from an authentication perspective. So it's about, we have incorporated different types of biometrics into this solution. And then lastly, you can also use this solution for passwordless authentication, because we know that most of the frauds or data breaches happen because of weaker stolen passwords. So if you can take away the passwords, then we can solve a lot of problems. Now let's talk about some of the use cases, right? And I think uh, some of the use cases are like where we have worked with a certain of some of our customers and partners to deliver some value. And there are certain use cases where we have done research, where we have had discussions, and we understand that these are some of the potential use cases. The one of the biggest one, and I think I, I, I really appreciate this one because it's like it's about digital identities for different sort of stakeholders. They could be citizens, they could be employees, they could be students. So it's like, how do you issue ID, ID, ID documents which are non-frictional, right? Which are digital in nature and they actually comply with all the data regulations, right? So that is what one of the, you, you can use it for that. So, so corporates can use, use it to issue employee IDs. Governments can use it for citizen IDs and then universities can use it for use it, issuing student identities. Then access to public and private services, right? Obviously when we access any type of services, we need to basically prove our identity. We need to, to go through a process. We need to go through an onboarding process. We need to go through a KYC process and so on and so forth. So it's about, okay, it's about how do you basically ensure that it becomes a, a frictionless and a, and a cost, uh, cost saving and a trustworthy model. One of the interesting use cases, digital voting, because I think this is again one of the debates that is happening in the industry, that can be, whether we can move to digital voting, right? And then a lot of people debate that we, it goes against the democratic process, but then there are certain uh, parts of the world where this is happening, where people are using this technology, or at least piloting this technology, uh, or testing this technology for digital voting, right? And this is not just about the democratic process. This can actually be used for corporate voting as well. And then it's education and employment. So right now, again, I think it's about how do you ensure that you are able to take your educational credentials or your professional credentials and seek employment, right? Because a lot, a, a lot of frauds are happening within this space with respect to people using fake credentials for gaining employment. And, and, and this is where basically this technology can actually ensure that it, so those frauds can be prevented and then you can remove the friction. Healthcare, uh, within the healthcare, basically, I think uh, when we talk about a patient and a doctor relationship, it's a very private and confidential relationship, and there's a lot of information that is being shared with the, between those two parties, right? And it's, it's about how do you ensure that this, this information remains confidential, and also it's about the healthcare data ownership, right? We have been talking about how do we ensure that my health data is owned by me, and I'm able to basically use it in a way where it's, it's it's fit for purpose and it basically gives me the right access to healthcare services around the world. Then it's also about travel and hospitality. So we, have, we did a basically POC uh, with Indian government where it's about how you can use this technology to basically create seamless travel. So imagine you land at the airport and then you don't have to basically show your passport or your tickets or visa to anybody. And then you can just walk through the airport and then just board the flight 
So this is where basically it's, it's like how do you integrate biometrics and decentralized identity and various other aspects into uh, creating the solution. Then there are a few other aspects uh, with respect to digital wallets across smart cities and smart businesses. And then it's also about identities across IOTs and smart wallets. So it's about you can use this same technology for more than just individuals. You can use this technology for smart devices as well as businesses and so many other entities. And on that note, I would like to basically uh, close the presentation. Any questions? Yes. So they've um, implemented uh, digital ID in India fairly extensively. Um, and you know, what do you have to say about that? And are there digital identity apps or frameworks you see the developing that we should engage in to simplify our work. Right. No, I think, I think that that's a very good point because and it's a very good question as well. So India is being seen as a pioneer in the digital identity space because that is one of the first countries which managed to issue digital identity to more than one billion people. And then on back of that digital identity, those people were able to basically get access to different services. So it actually uh, drives social and financial inclusion. So in that sense, digital identity is very important. And similar other programs are also there around the world. You can talk about Australia, you can talk about uh, Estonia and in different parts of the world where digital identity in different various and forms and various forms and uh, shapes is, is being basically implemented. Shiv, thank you for sharing this. This is, I think it's fascinating solution that you found. So. Thank you. Congratulations to you. Um, I understand the technical aspect of the blockchain, <clears throat> uh, although I don't quite get it how the decentralization storage is going to work when you deal with this ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So my question to you at the, at the uh, uh, collaboration level, all these different organizations, when they, how, do you, how are you approaching them that, okay, work with us so that you could push out the digital certificate that you're issuing. So that's a humongous effort. How Absolutely. are you handling that? You know, it's a very important question. And I'm so happy that you asked this question. Because I think, see, see, what is happening is like in the industry, there are like organizations like Earth ID who are basically trying to achieve this in one way or other, right? But then from, there's also push from, from, from governments as well. For example, like the European Union, they have, they have also already basically uh, asked the different uh, countries to basically talk, start talking about uh, digital wallets for the citizens, right? So this is already happening. So there's a top-down push as well as bottom of the push. So we are pushing from one direction, and then there are organizations, public sector organizations or governments who are pushing from the other direction. I can give you another example. For example, NHS, which is the National Health Services of UK, they are also piloting this technology to use it for their healthcare workers. So in that sense, basically, there are different initiatives around the world. And then, and then we can also talk about industry leaders or organizations which are uh, sitting on top of like big industries like likes of MasterCards, Vodafone, they are also basically piloting this technology. So this is happening. Obviously, we can always debate about the pace of adoption, but it's being adopted. So you named um, a few organizations that are in countries that are implementing this technology, are they doing it using blockchain or is it still centralized to them when they're issuing digital That's a very identity? good question. See, the thing is like, uh, what is happening is like, if we talk about the adoption of blockchain in general as well, right? I think people are trying to basically adopt the principles and in certain cases, they still basically go with a hybrid model, right? So when, when I spoke about the, the Aadhaar program in India, it's a completely centralized solution. But on the other end of the spectrum, there are organizations which are trying to basically uh, adopt a completely decentralized model. But at the moment, I think a lot of programs are looking at a hybrid solution. And it's also about the type of blockchain, right? If, if, even if they're talking about using a decentralized solution, uh, there are so many options with respect to the different types of blockchain and the features and everything. So that is where I think, uh, like for example, uh, there are a lot of DLTs which are not necessarily blockchains, but they, they still provide the decentralized aspect, right? So in that sense, there are different flavors that are being tested at the moment. And I think that is where I think uh, with time, I think we will see basically what exactly where we land, right? In, in terms of the actual, the degree of decentralization that we are able to achieve with this. I'm just gonna bring up one other thing and, and maybe we can discuss 
at a different time, but sure. I've, I've been wondering from the technical aspect of a decentralized identity, whether it's a, a public blockchain, a private blockchain, and, and, and between either one at the digital, you know, at the distributed ledger level, what information is stored there and how, because I find the, the it very interesting, privacy and anonymity with also transparency. We right. talk a lot about those together, but how do those work together? No, this in, you're, you're absolutely in the right direction. So yeah. the thing is like one of the key principle is that you don't store any private or personal identifiable information on the blockchain. And that is where there are different aspects how you basically achieve this. And on that note, I think we can connect separately as well. But thank you very much, everyone. Those are great questions, so we're glad to uh, do that. So before we move into the next section, I'm very pleased to bring up our illustrious leader, Gerard. <laughs> Thank you. I'm not really sure what the word illustrious means, but hopefully I, hopefully whatever that is, I, I am. Uh, I just want to take a couple minutes and give you some, uh, let you know about some things that are going on at GBA. These are really important things. I know a lot of you will want to um, connect to, but before I do, and I only have like a couple minutes, so I, I wish I could really go into depth on a lot of these. But I do want to do some recognition. Uh, one of them is I'd like to, uh, we have the chairman of the board for the Government Blockchain Association, uh, Mr. Brian Nielsen. Brian, if you uh, yeah, raise your hand or stand up. <laughs> so, so I have to tell you something about Brian for those, those of you who don't know. Uh, GBA, when, I first, when we first got the idea of doing this association, one of the first things that happened is Brian invited me to come up and talk on his podcast. And at the time, uh, I had a map and I had looked up all the places where there are a lot of government jobs. And I put all the pins on the map and I said, this is where we're going to have chapters one day. Today we have about, I think at the time there were 200 pins, we have about 120 chapters uh, globally today. And um, I would remember being on this podcast and I said, we're in the process of starting chapters in 120 cities, right? Because I had put those pins on the map. So that, that be, was the beginning. But Brian has been a big supporter and um, at, at some of our darkest and lowest times, uh, Brian has always been there. And, and uh, I remember I called him up and I said, I just can't go any further. And, he gave me some great advice, and he's been a great friend. And just recently, I said uh, I sent him a text and said, "That's it, I'm done, I'm stepping down." And he just responded with three words: uh, "No, you're not." <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so, so, but Brian, a great friend and, and uh, incredible supporter of this organization. I'd also like to say a word about Shiv that you just saw. So, uh, a couple of years ago, we went through. We had a lot of uh, challenges in our UK chapter, and there was. You know, when you're dealing with a large organization across a lot of places, there's sometimes uh, relationships and drama, and, and we had uh, uh, some of, the, of like a revolution, <laughs> you know, going the other way. The British were breaking away from the Americans. And, uh, and Shiv was a lone guy standing there in, uh, in the UK, and, and through his just incredible demeanor and bringing people together and, and healing wounds and just working with people as a... Uh, uh, had gotten to the point where he now leads all of Europe, Asia, uh, Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. And then uh, his lovely wife, uh, uh, Priya, is running a, uh, the London chapter uh, and, and our Sustainability Resource Management Working Group. And they've just, they've just been incredible friends and supporters to GBA. There's so many people here in the room, I, I wish I had the time to, uh, uh, to, to, to tell you about. Because, you know, the awards that we did the, uh, yesterday, right, was about innovation, leadership, social impact, and, uh, and courage. And those are the principles that really embody this organization, right? The people in this room are out of the box thinkers that want to make a difference, right? They're willing to take on the hard stuff. We're basically pushing against the unknown and we're going to be disruptors, which is going to require courage. And, um, and so I'd like to thank and appreciate all you guys for being the, those types of people. You are what draw people to GBA, not, not me or or any of us behind the scenes. I want to tell you about, uh, and I, Jovan I mentioned yesterday, he's running our global operations. And, I want to have a, a word. Okay, well, let, me finish, let me finish up and then I'll give you the, the stage. I've got to be very careful of the time. Um, but let me tell you about some of the projects that we're running. Uh, we're running a project called the Blockchain Maturity Model. Uh, and this is a, uh, if you think about it, government organizations and enterprises around the world are preparing to buy blockchain solutions. The problem is, they don't have the, the information or, or the, the framework to assess a good blockchain from a bad blockchain. So we're looking to solve that problem with this maturity model. Um, we're doing all kinds of incredible things in that, in that regard. I, I wish I could tell you more. Voting, we're working with a number of organizations to create the standards so that people who are building blockchain voting and election systems can get those systems certified so that they can essentially be adopted. Everybody's talking about blockchain and voting. It will never happen until we build some of this 
infrastructure that's required for that. Uh, Ross and Tara Sue, uh, if they're not here, you'll see them soon. Uh, they're very involved in our gaming working group uh, and a cannabis working group, so we're doing a lot with regulated industries to create regulator dashboards to bring uh, honesty and integrity uh, to those places. We have an investors and startup community. Uh, like I mentioned, the, uh, the Sustainable Resource Management Group is putting together a major event here in, in a couple months. Our communications team works with, uh, with our events, our, our YouTube channel, our newsletter, uh, press releases, podcasts, and our social media uh, outreach. So we've got an incredible capability to, to help our members when they have news about their company, their product, their services, kind of get the word out. And we are somewhat of a do-it-yourself. Uh, we have, like I said, we have 50 different working groups, 120 chapters. We are somewhat of a do-it-yourself platform, like on LinkedIn. But for organizations that want to join GVA and, and use these resources to build out what they're doing, we have a concierge service. So where's Rob Perry? There's Rob. Um, if, if you're interested in how do I use all of these resources to help my company get the word out, how to connect with, uh, with thought leaders, with government folks, Rob Perry leads our concierge service. And what we do is we sit down, we, we find out all the things that you need. Right? And then we figure out how to organize our capabilities to have you speak at events like this, get you on our YouTube channel, podcast, all of that stuff. How do we, how do we help uh, promote that? And, um, and then lastly, I want to put a, a, a one plug and then one reminder. The, uh, the evening reception, right? again, it's going to be an open bar. It's going to be super fun. But most importantly, there's space there where you can sit down at a table and you can talk to people about deals. Right? We've organized it in such a way that it's a very relaxed, and fun place, but really it's a place where you guys can, can put the dots together after all this stuff. And then last comment, when you're outside, please remember to keep uh, voices down because the, the noise comes in through here and keep your masks on. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, I would just like to say something about from the, on behalf of the chapters organization. We still need chapters in many cities in the United States. We have chapters that were started before the pandemic. We are reopening some of them, but some of them will need uh, both new membership and new leadership. Not only in the United States, around the world. Join, uh, so anyone who is interested in starting or helping run a chapter, around the United States or around the world, please let me know during this conference. Uh, and don't forget, uh, government employees can join GBA for free. So if you are, are attending, may, do us a favor, also become a member. Uh, uh, helps a lot, thank you. All right, well thank you very much. So coming up next, our session is called Blockchain and Taxes, and we've got Seth Wilkes and Nabil Malik presenting. All right, welcome. Yeah, sure. So uh, <laughs> really excited to be here today. Uh, just really quick, let's just introduce ourselves. Uh, I'll, I'll pass it to Emil first, since he's the better looking of the two. I don't know about that. You don't mind if I take this out? No, go ahead. All right, perfect. I like to uh, walk around uh, when I present. So me and Gerard met six years ago at a local bar at a meetup called Cryptocurrency. Um, I think government blockchain was there. I think there was 10 or 20 people part of it. We went down the route of the rabbit hole of blockchain and cryptocurrency and never came out. Um, good times. Uh, great guy, great mentor of mine. I've learned a lot. I manage a company called uh, Cryptolytics right now. We run a very unorthodox crypto hedge fund. We also build miners and we consult with uh, mining companies like Riot and Mara. I had a great conversation with CEO of Mara about a week ago about the future of mining. Um, and then also I am one of the, um, I sit on the board of a very interesting startup called Elo Pitch. Awesome. Thanks, Nabil. And I'm Seth Wilkes. I work with Taxbit. Taxbit is a uh, crypto tax and accounting platform. We work with individual investors. We work with enterprises, exchanges, businesses who are 
you know, accepting crypto as a form of payment for goods and services. And then we also work with governments. So we work with, you know, here in the US, we work the, with the IRS to help them with audits. We help also build out infrastructure systems to help them support um, these, uh, you know, the massive amount of data that they'll likely be getting over the next couple of years. But uh, on top of that, I spent a little bit of time with our lobbying efforts. And so I spent a bit of time on Capitol Hill and, you know, really trying to educate people on what is blockchain, what is cryptocurrency, digital assets, where is it going, and how do we create policy that makes sense, that doesn't get in the way of innovation, but does put some guard, guardrails around it. And so really excited to be here today. So we're going to kind of talk about just some of the basic things. And I'll, I'll take this first part. So there, there's a few questions that the Government Blockchain Association have, have put out there. And one of them is, you know, how and where are blockchain profits taxed? And the question is, you know, I, I think it's, it's a little bit hard because if you, if you can imagine, you know, all of these politicians around the world, can you imagine them coming together? And this will go kind of address the second bullet point too, but can you imagine all of these politicians around the world coming together and actually adopting one standard? That, that's probably not ever going to happen, right? And so what I think is, is more important is, Number one, the first part is, you know, where is it taxed? Most likely, most countries that I've talked to, it's really going to be where that individual happens to live, not necessarily where the, you know, the blockchain happens to be. Obviously, the blockchain is all over the place. So how would you, how would you tax that in multiple countries? But it's really going to be most likely centralized where the individual investor happens to be or individual miners. The second part, again, is will we ever standardize taxes around the world around blockchain and, and, and crypto? And I don't, again, I just don't think that. It's like, it's like herding kittens, you know, to get everybody together. And really, what I think, though, you will see is that there are certain organizations like the OECD, where you've got, you know, 40 or 50 member countries who have come together and they are adopting more um, standards for information reporting and information sharing across those member countries. And so we, we absolutely will see more standardization in, in that regard. But before we get too much uh, deeper into that, we should just get into kind of the basics of, of taxation and crypto. And so I'm going to hand it to Nabil, let him run with this. All right, um, two things are guaranteed in America, death and taxes. And uh, I know nobody likes to talk about taxes in crypto. Um, a, I think the reason is because the US government has been confused themselves, right? Um, I've talked to a lot of people from the IRS. Um, a lot of my clients in my hedge fund ask me about taxes. And every year, I think the loss changes somewhat. Um, but one thing is for sure, right? We get capital gain tax. So long term, if you hold any cryptocurrency, maybe Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano, if you hold it for more than 365 days, you get the standard long term rate of 15% on the gain. Um, short term is a lot higher. It all depends on your tax bracket, right? If you're making above six figures, it starts at 30%, goes up to 43%, I believe, if you clear more than $465,000 a year. So that's a given, right? That's just the standard. The biggest problem I've noticed in crypto, personally trading as well, and my clients do, is say I buy Bitcoin from Coinbase. And we'll go into detail here, right? This is what I really want to explain to people and help them understand. I buy Bitcoin from Coinbase because my bank account is connected. Then I move Bitcoin to say, for example, KuCoin, right? I move it to KuCoin and I want to buy XRP or I want to buy Theta or I want to buy Altcoin using Bitcoin as the base currency. That transaction of buying Bitcoin and getting, say, Theta or Cardano is a capital gain event. You are technically not selling Bitcoin, but you are in IRS's point of view. So that's another step, right? You're gonna say, I bought it, say today, I sell it tomorrow, just for argument purposes, say Bitcoin's at 30,000 today. I bought it from my bank account, tomorrow it's 35,000, I sell it on KuCoin for XRP, for example. Well, that $5,000 capital gain is captured. Then I let's take a deeper step, right? I buy Ethereum from KuCoin. Now my base is Ethereum. So you're going to record the basis of your buy rate on Ethereum and then say with Ethereum you buy Shiba or you buy XYZ. Every transaction is a buy and sell 
And whose responsibility? This, is, I believe, is the biggest challenge that the IRS faces right now. Currently, the responsibility lies on the individual and the account holder. And well, 90% of the people don't even know what they're supposed to do because they're used to Ameritrade, Robinhood, that give you a 30-page transaction list in the 1099B where they record every buy basis, you know, how much you bought, the quantity, the date, the time, and then when you sold it. It's the responsibility of the brokerage to report it. In crypto's case, currently, it is not the responsibility of Coinbase or Gemini to record these transactions and send you a 1099B. So the biggest challenge people face is that they've done, say, 100 transactions. Out of the 100 transactions, they haven't recorded every transaction, right? You can transact crypto 30 times in a day. And recording the basis of each sell, buy, quantity gets very difficult where most people don't do it. And I think he has a great solution for that and I'll let him talk about that. But I think that's what the challenge has become. What I see the future, and I believe in the early 90s, even stock market brokerages were not giving a detailed 1099B transaction report. So I think eventually Gemini, Coinbase, Binance.us will be required to give a detailed uh, report. But as of now, the responsibility falls on the trader. Like what I personally do is I keep an Excel. Every time I buy or sell a crypto or trade a crypto for another crypto, I put in the date, I put in the basis, what I bought for and what I sold for, right? I mean, that's the clearest way you can do it. There are some great softwares um, and I'll let uh, Derek talk about the software solutions that he has. Awesome, thank you. So, Nabil is completely right. Like this is, it's, it's, it's a record keeping nightmare. That's the, really the biggest problem. And so far, up to this point, specifically in the US, it has been placed, the responsibility has been placed on the individual to have to track and, and, take, and take care of this. And these are, you know, they're not terribly complex rules, but they're not things that most ordinary individuals really know and understand. And so, number one, Nabil, we need to get you a TaxBit account so you can get away from your spreadsheet <laughs> so we can track those for I agree, you. I agree. <laughs> but, but more importantly, though, the fact of the matter is we really do have to move the, the responsibility from the individual up to the enterprises because this is really how it's been done historically in every other asset class like securities and commodities as Nabil talked about and the fact is Nabil's completely right even in the stock market or the stocks and commodities world they did not report cost basis um, I think even pre-2005 and th so that was not that long ago and clearly we've been trading stocks for many many decades so this is a, an important move forward and so one thing I want to talk about now is exactly what we're doing in the US to solve some of these problems. And a little bit, of, you know, one of the, I guess, when you think about on a global scale, the US is unique, I think, in a lot of ways, because the US loves information. Like, the, the IRS loves to get detailed, transactional level information. Whereas, a lot of the other governments around the world, they prefer to get aggregate information. So, like, I talked about OECD a little bit before. OECD in the past has, has required, you know, when you have stock trading and things like that, they just want to see an aggregate number, right? And at some point, if you as an individual and, you know, if you are from Spain, you get audited, you still have to give all the details to support what you did, but the information that the, um, that the enterprises or the brokerages had to report was just one number, okay? Now, in the U.S., we don't like to do anything simple. We like to make it complicated. But I think that it actually makes it a little bit easier for the individual because how much nicer is it for an individual to get a full report from a Coinbase or a Kraken and all they have to do is upload that into TurboTax or hand it to their accountant to, to go, and, go and file. So back in November, they, um, we, here in the US, we passed the infrastructure bill. And I, I keep on calling it a bill, but apparently I need to call it the Infrastructure Act now because it actually has been signed into law. Um, but I will, I will have a hard time changing that. And there are a few things that they had to change and update in the code to be able to really encompass and make clear that cryptocurrency, cryptocurrency exchanges are included in these provisions. So the first thing that they talked about was the definition of a broker dealer. And this is probably actually the most controversial part of, of this law. And 
the first thing it was, did was it made crystal clear that exchanges like Coinbase, Kraken, Gemini, they are absolutely a broker dealer, which means that they have a responsibility to file a 1099 at the transactional level. So every single time, like Nabil talked about, he went from Bitcoin to ETH to Cardano to you know, anything like that. All of those are transactions that have to be reported back to the IRS and Coinbase and these exchanges have a responsibility to track this information and then provide it to you as the, as the investor and to the IRS. So that was, that was pretty easy. I mean, you know, these brokerages or these exchanges, they operate a lot like the traditional stock brokerages anyway. So that was kind of like low hanging fruit, right? The controversy around this broader definition, though, is that there is debate about whether that definition includes um, hardware wallets. Okay? The, as, as we know in the blockchain world, that you can actually store your crypto on these different hardware wa wallets or software wallets. Um, there's a question about whether they fall into this definition as a broker dealer. Um, there's also a question about whether protocols like Uniswap and you know, uh, you know what Binance Smart Chain and, and all these other you know whether whether or not they fall into the category of a um, broker dealer and and that gets a little bit difficult because when you think about you know Coinbase has systems in place where they're doing KYC and they are you know validating who is trading on their platforms but then when you get to software protocols. You know, the argument is these, that this is software. This is just a protocol that's out there in the ether and that it's operating. You know, who's collecting the information? Who's doing the reporting? And so I think that there is definitely some interesting things that could happen down the road as Treasury interprets this new law and to see what happens to, with it. I, my guess, though, is that the first thing that the Treasury will do with this law is they'll go for the low-hanging fruit, which is the broker deal, the traditional broker dealer, like the Coinbase, the Gemini's, come out with that. And so the, there were three really main things that I think came out of, of this bill. And the first one is that, again, cost basis, proceeds, all of the information that you need to file your return, these exchanges need to track that now and provide that to you. Second thing, and Nabil talked about this, right, is when we're moving, and this is a unique characteristic of blockchain and crypto, it doesn't really happen as much in any other um, asset class. But we move our assets all the time. Like, it is not uncommon to buy on Coinbase, transfer over to Kraken, later transfer it over to a hardware wallet, store it for a while, later move that somewhere else. And every single time you move that, you potentially can lose what your cost basis was. Because in theory, at least the way things work right now, Coinbase has no idea how much you bought something that you transferred from Kraken. Right? And if you transferred something to Kraken, they don't know how much you pay for it there. So the second thing that came out that I think is really important is the requirement for transfer statements. Now this is already a requirement that exists in the securities world. When you move something from TD Ameritrade over to Merrill Lynch, like an like Apple stock, they are required to provide a transfer statement that says, hey, he bought this Apple stock on this date, he paid this much, this is the quantity, and send that over so that then when you dispose of it later, they have all the information to report your cost basis. But how would they collect the other side? Well, we'll, we'll get into that because there's still holes in this, but, but it's important because this is a good step forward to be able to have complete information at the exchange level. And so this is what's going, um, starting in 2023, these transfer statements will be required if you're moving assets between Broker dealers like Coinbase and Kraken, they have a requirement to communicate with each other what that cost basis is, and it allows for a much fuller, fuller um, answer. Now, to your point though, what happens if I go from a broker like Coinbase to a hardware wallet? Now, hardware wallet, there, there's nobody to report that basis to, and then you go back from a hardware wallet up to you know Kraken, right? Kraken now there will be a hole in the information, right? So what's really gonna happen is on that 1099 that gets filed, there will be a blank space on cost basis and data acquired. That will still be on the, on the shoulders of the individual filing to fill in that gap. And that's, that's actually not unusual. There still are situations even in stocks and commodities where that happens. And so, but we're getting probably 90% the way there to make it much easier for people. The, the last thing that came out of this infrastructure bill was the requirement that, and this, this is probably the second most controversial part, is that anytime you move an asset that's worth more than $10,000 in the US, 
that becomes a reportable event. You have to fill out this form 8300. And just like government, you know, governments are always, systems are several years older than we would like them to be, or maybe several decades older than we would like them to be. A lot of these forms 8300s, these were like meant for pawn shops and people who are dealing in cash, because that was originally what it was meant to do. It was like, you know, try to catch money laundering and that kind of thing. But, you know, if I went and, you know, traded something at a pawn shop for that was greater than $10,000, somebody's, somebody's filling out a paper form and mailing it into the IRS. That means that there are systems that have to be updated to be able to accept these forms 8300 because, again, in the blockchain and in the crypto space, we move assets all the time, right? For, for tons of different reasons. And so that's, a, that's a, again, it's gonna be a pretty big lift for these enterprises to do this type of reporting. So I do see a lot of this as very positive though, steps in the right direction because what this, is, what this is gonna do, this is establishing like black and white, very clear regulation, which a lot of the institutional folks in, in the US have been waiting for. So we're talking, you know, the Wall Street banks and these, once they have, you know, once they feel like it's clear and there's not a risk associated with coming in, I think we're gonna see a lot more institutional adoption coming in, which will, I think, help fuel that next major wave of adoption. So, um, Nibel, I've been talking a while. I'm going to kick it back over to you. What are your thoughts? Um, I think we're getting there, but I think we still have a long road ahead. All right. Um, anybody bought SafeMoon in, in the audience? Huh? We got one, two, two people. How hard was it to buy SafeMoon? It was like eight transactions in to buy one coin. Um, and how many zeros did it have in front of it? Like eight zeros. The accounting on buying and selling safe moons got to be hell. Like an accountant, it would take him three hours just to find out what your basis of safe moon was and how you got there because you had to transact four times deep and then buy safe moon, which is 0. 0.0000 of XYZ. And then when you sell it, you transfer back to Binance coin, back to Bitcoin. It's just a lot of steps in between. So I think the government is working on it. Um, and I think two years ago or three years ago, they asked that question on the 1040, do you own cryptocurrency, yes or no, even if you didn't do any trades. So they kind of started keeping a record of who owns it and who doesn't. So who are they gonna chase after when you don't report it? But Derek and I were having a conversation about this. I think this year, this past tax year, 2021 is gonna be the worst year to report crypto gains because no exchange is gonna give a 1099, right? Explain that to me. I was very surprised when you said that. Yeah, so, so Nabil and I were having a conversation the other day while we were getting ready for this. And what, what has happened in the past is that some exchanges have filed what they call a 1099K. 1099K was actually used for payment processors like PayPal, where you're a merchant and you collected so much money for them and PayPal was the, was the, pre, the payment processor. And so you would get this 1099K with one gross number, okay? That's it. And for some reason, a few years back, Coinbase adopted these forms to report anybody who hit that, this criteria for 1099K. But the problem is these were capital transactions. These were not payments for goods and services. And so, um, fortunately, they finally decided, hey, th this is not the right form, we're not gonna file them, but the problem is this created an audit issue for a lot of taxpayers because the IRS gets a 1099-K and then they're expecting to see that same number on a very specific line on your tax return. And in this case, it would be on like a Schedule C, which is where you report self-employment income. But the fact is, where you report your capital gains and losses is on a completely different form. And so these automated matching systems that the IRS has in place, we're trying to match these together and then they're sending these auto notices saying, hey, you didn't report this and you owe so much. Now, think about this scenario, okay? I can transact, I can only have, let's say I have $5,000 in crypto, right? But I, but I trade, you know, 100 times or more. That 1099K that Coinbase filed, might have showed $5 million of gross proceeds, okay, without any cost basis reported. So the IRS will then send me a notice saying, hey, you owe 30% on $5 million or 39% on $5 million. And can you imagine that, you know, 
you're like, I, I lost money. I didn't, I didn't actually make money trading last year. How do I owe this kind of money? And a lot of people just ignored it. Absolutely. And then they get the second notice saying, hey, we're now inviting you to tax court. Yeah. We're looking forward to meeting you. <laughs> and so, you know, the, fortunately, you know, this year is the first year that they have said, okay, we're not filing these 1099Ks, but because of this infrastructure bill, and, and tax bill, we, we file 1099s on behalf of exchanges. We have a lot of clients who are doing like 1099 miscellaneous for staking income and rewards and other things. But a lot of our clients were going to file 1099Bs this year, but then when the infrastructure bill came out, it ba they basically said, well, that doesn't have an effective date until January 1, 2023, we don't want to voluntarily give the IRS more information than they should. And so to your point, let me, I'll, I'll put it, you at ease a little bit. A lot of our clients who are the U, um, major U.S. exchanges are at least taking a step forward where they're creating gain loss statements that are similar to a 1099. So they're at least making a good faith effort to give you better information. Now, not, not everybody is doing that, right? But we're, it, it's a nice step forward. So yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I kind of push the envelope as an entrepreneur, and I think that's my, um, I don't know, I think I enjoy doing that. So this year, or last year, now tax year, nobody's going to get a 1099 from anywhere. How many people are really going to voluntarily spend eight hours looking at their transactions from every exchange, right? I don't think a lot. Um, so I think IRS is setting people up to fail, right? They're used to getting 1099s from their brokerages and their exchanges, and that's their reconciliation on a personal level. So when they don't receive one, I don't know how many people voluntarily are gonna pay taxes and do all the math behind the capital gain. Um, like uh, my cousin runs an accounting firm, and he said if somebody brings me a crypto tax return, he said the starting rate is 2,500. Because it takes time. The transactions, you can have you know, three, 4,000 transactions that you have to reconcile. So is somebody just gonna flip the coin and say, if I get caught, I'll pay it. If I don't, I'll let it ride, right? Because I believe the IRS is not setting up the correct structure as of last year for taxpayers to correctly pay their taxes. They didn't do it the year before either. The K-1, the 1099-K wasn't the correct form. And I agree with Derek. Usually, if you're a partner or a founder or a shareholder in an S corporation or a C corporation, the profits get dispersed through a K-1. That's what a K form is used for, and these exchanges send out 1099 Ks for capital gains, which completely, I believe, was nonsense. It was the wrong form. It was the wrong explanation of it. They weren't Coinbase shareholders. It wasn't a profit from the company of Coinbase. You were doing trading on Coinbase, and that was the, you know, not the correct form. So I think it's going to take the IRS a couple of years, and... Um, I don't know, 2021 tax year for crypto traders is up for grabs, in my opinion. Yeah, but I think the important thing to consider, too, is that, you know, a lot of early adopters of crypto love the anonymity. They're, you know, ultra libertarian. You know, they don't want, you know, the government to have their information. And nobody likes to pay taxes, right? But the fact of the matter is we are maturing as an industry and we want to be taken seriously. And one of those things that you have to do to be taken seriously is you have to comply with those laws. Now, the laws need to be written in a way that you actually have the ability to comply with them. And I think that that is what the infrastructure bill is doing is, again, it's putting the responsibility on the exchanges to provide the information to the individuals so that it's not fully just left on the shoulders of the individual I mean, to figure out. how it should be. Right? Ab Every absolutely. Every other industry in America operates that way. Yeah, I mean, we, we have a... We have an honorary you know, tax system, right? In the sense that you, know, you, you file on your honor. And, but, but it's kind of like the whole trust but verify system, right? 1099s, the whole point of those is when a 1099 is filed and you know, Coinbase sends it to the IRS and they send it to you, now you know yeah. that the IRS knows what you've been doing. And you personally know, right? Yes. A trader that's been trading for a year you know, you can transact over five million with five thousand dollars, right? Yep. So he knows personally too. So yeah. So I think that this is a step in the right direction. We have to have good regulation to be able to report. We have to have this to be taken more seriously. And you know, the, one of the big challenges that I see, uh, honestly, is we we know how active we are on you know crypto Twitter and crypto Reddit, yeah. and. 
Oh, thank you. Oh, thank and, you. and one of the challenges that I think that we face is sometimes we shoot ourselves in the foot because a lot of times people you know, who are making good faith effort, and I do think that a lot of our politicians and regulators are making good faith effort to get educated and to make yeah. smart regulation, but a lot of people get onto these forums and they just start going off. And, you know, and, and it's a challenge because we want to be taken seriously. And so elevating the proper voices is also yeah. a very important thing. And I think that's one of the areas that I see with the Government Blockchain Association is an opportunity to elevate the right voices so that we are, you know, the rest of the world can take us seriously and recognize that we want to do the right thing, but that this industry isn't going away and that we're building and it's Absolutely. going to grow every year. Yeah, me and Derek were talking about the presentation and we wanted to leave the last 10, 15 minutes for open discussion, right? May that be about taxes, capital gains, cryptocurrencies. We wanted to make this presentation a bit more interactive. So feel free to come up, ask your questions about, you know, he's a brilliant tax guy. He works with Binance, Coinbase, all these companies regarding tax. Um, I run a hedge fund. Even if you have a crypto question, don't ask me the price of Bitcoin next month, but I'll answer it. I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Eugene Morris of Everscale Networks. Thank you guys for a very insightful, insightful presentation. One uh, particular circumstance that you may not have covered. Um, you talked about people buying and selling, okay? There's another kind uh, when you create. Ah. So please talk about that and what do you believe if a community issues token, what will be the tax treatment? Thank you. Yeah, so I guess when I hear the term create, I, I, a couple of things come to mind. Number one, 2021 was like the explosion of NFTs, right? And so you have creators of NFTs, you know, creators of pieces of art or music or whatever it is. You know, they, when they sell those NFTs initially, that's going to be an ordinary income event. And again, I am speaking a little bit US centric, so I apologize. I don't have every tax code memorized around the world, but I think it is pretty similar, you know, most, in most jurisdictions. But to, to the question that you asked, what about when you're issuing a token for the first time? So that, that is a little bit more of a complicated answer because it really comes back down to, and I'm not a lawyer, but I work with enough lawyers that I can pretend like I, I know a thing or two. It comes back down to what rights do you get with that token, right? Do you have rights to future profits from the company that's issuing the token? So that looks a lot more like a security than it does a, you know, a piece of property or something like that. And so that then, maybe you need to follow all of the rules that the SEC has set forth for you know, doing a, you know, initial offering. Now, is it a utility? Does it give you the right to the future good or service that you will then be providing? So it, the, the answer really is, it's a facts and circumstances situation. What do the rights of that token give you? And that's how who, the company who is issuing those tokens, that's how you have to look at it as well. Is, you know, is this prepaid revenue, right? Prepaid services. Am I issuing equity in my company through this token? And so it's really about evaluating that. Do you, any, any other thoughts? I agree. That question is a $10,000 answer for Thomas Cogent Law Firm. He'll spend 40 hours with you helping you understand your coin and what you're producing, what it's going to do. Um, like we have a future project for GBA token, which Tom helps out a lot on. Um, there's just proof. Are you doing proof of work? You're doing proof of stake. Um, how many, how much is the founders holding? Who is holding the unmined currency, right? There's just so many deeper questions that in, are asked when you ask that question and then the answers follow what you're saying. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a very deep question. Thank you. Uh, so uh, kind of a loaded question here, but what about um, things like airdrops where people are uh, using them for like liquidity purposes? Um, and collateralizing it, and then um, also kind of looking at a lot of the exchanges now have uh, debit cards that they're allowing you to utilize the crypto as free as currency, even though it might be, you know, I guess in some cases you label a security. And then the last part is um, uh, in situations where you are using your crypto as collateral 
and taking out a loan on that, uh, how do they verify that as uh, taxable income if you are taking a, an, uh, you know, loan to value on it, similar to what you do with a normal blank like a line of credit? All right, so the last one, right, um, you're talking about loan. Loans are not taxed, just like a 401k, right? You can put your 401k and take a loan against it, and that's not taxed. And that's the responsibility of BlockFi. They do, they do a lot of lending based on Bitcoin. So the, I think Coinbase is starting it. So that's their um, responsibility not to report it on a 1099 or as capital gain or revenue. Um, so I think that's pretty clear. Um, airdropping, that's still, I believe, very confusing. I don't think anyone reports airdropping. Um, how do you report it? Say if I'm an individual, I don't have an LLC, and I think I own XRP and I got airdropped Flare. That was a big airdrop last year. Um, how do you report that? You can report that as, if I have an LLC, report it straight as revenue for your LLC, just revenue because you held something, but individuals, I wouldn't know. I mean, they would just have to report it on Schedule C as revenue come in as a bonus for owning uh, XYZ. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so back in 2019, the IRS issued um, a notice, uh, or a new revenue ruling, actually talking about hard forks and airdrops. And they, it could be argued wh whether it was the right answer, but the answer that they have is that for an airdrop, it is an ordinary income event. And so when you receive that airdrop, um, you look at whatever the fair value is, and then that's taxed as ordinary income to you or your LLC, um, whichever entity is receiving it. Now, it, it, there is a case that's out there, and this is actually more akin to um, focusing on staking, but you know, a lot of times you know, the IRS will refer to staking rewards being airdropped to you. They like that term. I don't know that they actually use the term airdrop quite the way that the industry uses it, but one of the things in this case right now, they are making the argument that for staking rewards, that instead of being taxed right when you receive it, you really should be taxed when you dispose of those because they, they are making the analogy to a farmer who has a piece of land and seeds, and they plant that seed, and all of a sudden you grow a crop. Now, that crop is not taxed when it's grown and ready to, to go. It's, it's taxed once they actually um, harvest it and sell it, right? And so the argument is, what is the difference between I'm taking one property, which would be you know, our base property, Ethereum, and I'm going out and staking it, and I'm getting paid out these rewards. So I have property generating more property. And so there is a case that, that's happening. Now, I can't say which way it's going to go. I think it's in Tennessee, though. But um, it, that's, you know, that could have pretty big impact on the US about how we look at airdrops and how we look at, at staking as well. So I'd um, love to talk more about it though. Uh, you know, once, once we're headed, I, I see that we're getting ready to have to get cut off here, but uh, one more quick question. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Cooper. I founded uh, DeVille Crypto Solutions, and I have a question. Um, I've been in crypto for about six years now, and I use MetaMask, um, and I'm just curious how the IRS is gonna go after everyone using, you know, because there's no real KYC AML yep. with MetaMask. And um, I've used about 30 to 40 different exchanges over the years. And, you know, when I initially got in, I, I wasn't watching everything. I lost cell phones, laptops got stolen. So it's, I'm not sure how to even report, you know, some of this stuff that I'm doing, especially NFTs. I'm, I'm doing a lot of NFTs, the airdrops. It's just really confusing and I don't, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, I think the challenge, so to your first question about MetaMask, MetaMask is a, is a software wallet. Um, you know, it's a team of probably 20 people. You know, they are not in a position to do full KYC, you know, for hundreds of thousands or millions of users, right? It, they are just a software, you know, that you use. And so what you would probably want to use is, you know, something like TaxBit, where we can connect your MetaMask wallet. We can do all of the valuation because we can pull all the pricing for every transaction. We can identify the taxable transactions, the taxable airdrops, and that makes it a lot easier for you. And not to make it sales pitchy, but the fact is, like, your situation is not uncommon, right? People who have been in crypto for a long time have accumulated, you know, dozens of exchange accounts, have, you know, dozens of wallets, and, you know, hundreds of thousands of transactions, and you simply can't do that on your own. They're really, this is a technology issue, ultimately. But the IRS, I can tell you, because we support them, you know, when, so they'll come to us and outsource an audit. 
and we'll actually go through and they provide us the data from the taxpayer and we'll go through and do a full analytics on it but they have to they have to give data all the way from the beginning of time. So for you, if you've been in it for six years and you unluckily have you know, get audited, you've got to go find all of that information. But just to argue that, how about the exchanges that you were on six years ago are out of business? Yep. Where do you get the data from? Yeah, right? it's a, I mean, it's a it's, real problem. Yep. It, I, I, you know what I mean? There's, it's just so difficult. Like, there was, what was that one big exchange that got shut down? Mount Gox, right? So it's people that had Bitcoin on there, A, lost it, or B, the company's gone. Where do you find that record from? Right. right? Yeah. You just have to do your best with what you've got. Uh, I agree. All right, I think our time's up. Thank you, guys. If you guys have any other questions for us, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Thank you. Thanks. All right, and before lunch, we just have one special announcement, and we're going to bring Kathy up for that. Hey, it's me again. I just want to remind everybody that tonight we're going to be having the Roaring Twenties reception. If you haven't gotten your ticket, they look like this. Please go to Maria. She's out there in the lobby and she's at the table giving out tickets. You will not be able to get in without your ticket. This is separate from the ticket to get here today, but it's going to be an awesome reception. Roaring Twenties theme and all of you have met each other, now's the time to start making the deals tonight, so please go out and get your ticket. This is your pass to get into the reception, and we still have some room. Thanks very much. All right, and Gerard, are you gonna tell us what time to, uh-oh. They're here. Hey, I, I just wanted to thank David Hook. For those of you who don't know, David Hook is the Chief of Staff of the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs National Artificial Intelligence Institute. Thank you. Right. He's also the leader of the Washington, D.C. chapter, right? And uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure at some point people will be able to find out. But if you're in the D.C. area and you really want to stay connected, talk to David. It is, uh, it is a great privilege for us to have folks of his character being willing to serve in this capacity. So I just want to thank you publicly, David. Oh, thank you so much. So. And I think no one will mind if I plug for the D.C. chapter. We are setting up our first in-person uh, meetup, uh, hopefully in uh, early February. We've identified a location. We're just confirming uh, essentially the, the timing. So uh, we can expect that to come out. And also, if you have an opportunity, the Friday calls uh, for, the, for the, the blockchain group hosted by the VA are at 10 a.m., and they are fantastic as well. So, and you can contact Josh Akakian about those calls. All right, well, uh, with that, we are off to lunch. What time would we like everybody back? Uh, 12.40. 12.40. So enjoy your lunch, and we will be back here at 12.40.
All right, good afternoon, everyone. We are gonna start up the second half of today. Uh, starting off the conversation uh, is uh, Evan Smith and Eric Guthrie uh, discussing smart contracts. All right, welcome back from lunch. A round of good yeah. lunch? Excellent. Um, so the question I ask again to start off this smart contract conversation is how many of you in this room are lawyers right now? Got one, two, okay. Um, some lawyers. Huh? We got some lawyers. Yeah, we, yeah, we, got, we got some lawyers, you know. So, okay, so this session I got promised in my overview session is about smart contracts, which is really huge in the legal community because this is really one of the engines that drives, you know, blockchain technology and DAOs and interfacing with each other in terms of what we're trying to do with, you know, <clears throat> offering acceptance and with, you know, selling products and services. So this is the vehicle that we really need to focus on to be able to make sure our clients know what they're doing. So this is kind of broken down into two sections. Evan's going to take the first part. I'm going to take the second part. And when it come together, we're going to ask Q&A. So I'm going to pass it on to Evan, and then we can go from there. Okay. Okay. Great. So, let's see if this works. Awesome. Um, so first, you know, we're gonna start with the basics. Uh, and first question is, what is a smart contract? Um, and a definition for smart contract that I think people would accept is program distributed across a blockchain that takes actions when predetermined conditions are met. Um, what a smart contract does is automates the execution of some function or agreement, you get a certain outcome, you know, whatever it's programmed to do is exactly what it does. Uh, there's no intermediaries, nobody has to, uh, you know, be involved or, or push a button or anything to make it happen. Uh, and it happens very quickly once it's executed. Are smart contracts really smart? Well, Sort of. I mean, they're, they're smarter than a piece of paper, which is the traditional way of doing contracts. Um, the, um, there's no actual intelligence or artificial intelligence involved in smart contracts. Uh, they're basically pretty simple programs, and they do exactly what they're supposed to do. Um, I think people have, you know, when you hear smart contracts, you have, have this vision maybe of a whole world where your, you know, your leases and your business deals and, and all the, you know, the contracts that you may get involved in, you know, every day or every month, um, that those might be all put on the blockchain and, and automated and, and made much more efficient and less expensive. And, and that's a great vision. Uh, it is not really where we are today. Uh, where we are today is, is sort of at the early stages, I think, of the development of smart contracts. And as we're going to see, there's, there's plenty of room for building on what's been done and continuing to improve that process. So <coughs> the first thing to understand is that a smart contract is a program that runs on a specific blockchain platform. So in order to implement a smart contract, first you have to pick a blockchain. Uh, there is lots of competition in the blockchain world in terms of platforms for smart contracts. And these are, uh, well, Ethereum is the 800 pound gorilla and the, sort of the first big one to get in the business and do that. Um, Polkadot, Cardano, Avalanche, Binance, uh, Cadena, and dozens of others. Um, these are all places where you could implement a smart contract program. Um, each of these blockchains supports specific languages. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a programming language much like other programming languages that you may have seen. If you've ever done any coding or you have friends or kids that do coding, um, it's going to look kind of familiar. Um, let's look at a simple example so we can kind of understand what program code looks like and what a smart contract might be or, or seem like. Um, 
The example is a smart contract that manages a cryptocurrency wallet. So if you have a, a wallet on Ethereum, you could make a smart contract uh, and have that manage your wallet instead of using the private key. Um, and the basic functions of this program that we're going to look at, um, anybody can deposit money into your wallet and nobody can withdraw money from your wallet unless they're you. So only the owner can withdraw. You know, this is a really rudimentary contract. I mean, it's, it's almost so rudimentary that you might not consider this a legal contract in the traditional sense of, of legal contracts, but this is, is within the category of what people call smart contracts in this space. Um, it's really a smart contract is any program that's executed that does something for you when certain conditions are met. Um, you can get more complicated. Uh, and people will get more complicated over time. Um, you know, for example, this, this basic wallet that we're going to look at, you could add functions to this. You could have multi-signature transactions, have you know, multiple owners that all have to approve it in order for money to come out or coin to come out, um, daily transfer limits, uh, emergency account freezing, uh, more secure recovery. You, know, you could write lots of code and do lots of programming for this thing to make it more functional. Um, but here's a you know, very simple piece of sample code. Um, and and this, this is that basic function. It's like you can put money in and you can take money out, but if you're not the owner, then the transaction fails. So it um, gives you an idea of sort of how these things are implemented and also gives you an idea of how difficult it might be to understand what the contract is supposed to do unless you happen to be familiar with software code. Um, you know, so there, I mean, there's some people in the room, I'm sure, that can read this, and some people that will look at this and say, I really don't understand that. It doesn't speak to me. Um, functions that you can put in smart contracts. Uh, you can get inputs and confirmations. Something was delivered. Uh, so, you know, somebody puts in information like a, you know, multiple owners all approve the release of, of funds. So those are inputs. Um, you can report events and other information. Uh, the, the smart contract can send out notices of certain things happening or of it or of itself executing. It can do calculations. Uh, it can respond in different ways to to conditions that exist. Uh, if this happened, then do this. Um, you can transfer value, and that's really what most smart contracts, I think, write you know, as of today and this year. Most smart contracts are sort of built to do some sort of a value transfer uh, under certain conditions, make a payment. Um, so what can you do with all of these functions? Well, lots of things. I mean, ultimately, you could build a really complicated contract out of this. Um, and people are, are working on or have worked on doing various kinds of financial transactions that are automated, elections, uh, locking up patient data, real estate, securities law, insurance. It, you know, there's, there's no limit to the applications that you could find for these if you sort of build them up and make them more complicated and, and interesting. Um, the way that a smart contract actually gets implemented or executed, um, first of all, you have to write code. Um, there has to be a piece of code like the one we looked at a little while ago that, that tells you what's going to happen. Um, it has to be posted on, on the blockchain. Um, some blockchains have the whole contract code posted. Other blockchains post the contract code offline, um, but, but store a hash or, or a digital fingerprint, basically, of that file so you can verify that it hasn't been tampered with. Um, then, when you're ready to execute, uh, you put in the input that causes it to start running. Um, and normally, on um, blockchains, you have to pay a transaction fee to get these contracts to execute. And you hear that referred to as gas. Um, and the, the gas fee 
for executing a transaction or a contract varies significantly from blockchain to blockchain. That's one of the ways that, one of the ways that the various blockchains um, uh, compete with each other is to uh, try to have a lower gas fee for each transaction. Another way they try to compete with each other is their ability to handle a huge volume of transactions. Um, so there's, there's lots of uh, battling it out in that industry right now. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Eric now, uh, who's going to go through some of the basic legal issues that, that might be factors in smart contracts. And then we'll get back together and uh, for the wrap up and talk about some of the, the theories and ideas and maybe debate that a little bit. So. <laughs> Thanks, Evan. Here Appreciate it. Thank you. So, so Evan gave you a really good uh, background to smart contracts, especially from the, the coding standpoint. Uh, and that's going to really be really important because one of the main differences between a smart contract and a regular contract is the way it's written, right? And that is, is written in code, not in a language. Um, that's important, and here's why. Code is more exact than language. There's plenty of ambiguities, ways you can misinterpret, ways there's misunderstandings in any language. English, French, Thai, you know, any, any other language you want to consider, right? There's much more ambiguity than the exactness in code. And that's quote unquote why it's called, like everyone was saying, smart contract, okay? But is it really a contract? So that's what we're going to discuss briefly in this session. I cover this in greater detail in the blockchain legal consulting, um, the, the legal specialist course. But we're going to kind of you know, hit on it and then go to our Q&A uh, and then maybe you know, take some great questions from all of you. Um, some of the key terms that we use when we're talking about actual contracts are offer and acceptance. Now, I mentioned this a little bit earlier in my first presentation, but now we're going to just dive a little bit into it, right? You learn in law school that when you have a, a, a fully enforceable contract, you need what's called meeting of the minds, okay? So I know your lawyers probably say, oh my God, that goes back to law school 101. Well, here we are again, right? Meeting of the minds is important. So the question is, does the if-then, and contracts, smart contracts are based on if-then statements. Does if-then replace Offer acceptance. Does if then replace meeting of the minds? I don't know. And why do I say that? It's because it could depend on the contract, on the smart contract, right? So that's one thing that has to be considered when you when you're when you want to make a smart contract and want to make it as good as possible, right? You can write the code to be able to be more like a regular contract and pass the muster of state or federal uh, law than just writing a smart contract putting it on a blockchain like, like Evan was saying, and then you know, going from there. So uh, attaching it to a wallet also is made too smart, right? After you finish an agreement, and then both parties have done their part, someone's probably waiting for payment. And they're waiting for payment. And maybe they're still waiting for payment. But in a smart contract, boom, done, boom, wallet, Bob is your uncle, okay? So <clears throat> the process is far more streamlined, far more automate, automated, and now it creates a system where how can we put the legal structure that exists into smart contracts and make it work on both sides, right? And that's where a good legal team can help you do that. Um, so let's talk about some of the laws that apply to this. Now, when I was first reading about smart contracts, I was like, well, what about the statute of frauds? And I was like, I went deep, deep back, and I was like, man, I hadn't thought about that in a long time. Unless you're an attorney that practices commercial transaction law, you're not really looking at statute of frauds or UCC very often, right? So statute of frauds, that's basically, states have their own stat set of statutes that basically define what is an enforceable contract that has to be in writing. We're not gonna cover all those in detail, but there's a certain, uh, a pecking order of things that have to be in the contract for it to be in writing or not in writing. For example, leases or dollar amounts or, you know, uh, wills or marital issues. So some states have requirements for it to be in writing, some do not, but that's the statute of frauds. Then there's the Unicom Uniform Commercial Code. 
the UCC, as we call it, governs commercial transactions on the, on the US level, on the federal level, okay? So that's the code that basically says, you know, this is what's required for a contract to be uh, enforceable, right? So between the statute of frauds and the UCC, those are two of the areas of law that whoever is writing the smart contract or whoever is implementing it must be used in order to have a smart contract be legally enforceable. Um, and like the last bullet point says, I already said it, it can vary from state to state. So knowing which state you need to do your work in as for, you know, for blockchain technology or for a blockchain applied solution is very important. And then the next presentation, we're gonna get into another reason why states are very important, but I don't wanna, I don't wanna uh, give, give away that little tidbit just yet. Um, so I mentioned offer and acceptance. So here are two ways, here are two very important ways that smart contracts have a, uh, a, a difference between um, regular natural contracts and smart contracts, right? A, a regular contract is usually on paper, or it could be in, the, like in a, a Word document or a PDF, what have you, but it's not in code, right? So the question is, does a contract in code not in natural language, but in code, is that a contract? Okay, what do you guys think, yes or no? No, no, no. <laughs> yes. oh, oh, okay, so we got some, we got some conversation to have here. So, uh, we don't discuss it in this, much in this section, but in my course we do. When you look at the language in the UCC and Statute of Frauds, it never says natural language. It says words like in written in terms that can be agreed upon. It says stuff like uh, clearly distinguished or clearly determined by the parties, right? So really the answer is probably yes. Code can be a language that can be used to have a smart contract, okay? Because it never said natural language. Here's question number two. Does the acceptance of a smart contract, when you go on, you know, you, you accept the smart contract for whatever terms or whatever performance is, you know, the miners pay the gas fees and the whole thing is finalized, does that signature, does that uh, acceptance equate to a signature for the smart contract? Yes. Okay, any, any knows? Okay, so the answer is yes, okay. A signature through the acceptance of the small contract, in theory, does equate to the signature that you would do in a contract, okay? But that still hasn't resolved the initial issue whether or not there's actual offer and acceptance based on the initial creation of the contract. So the whole thing is premised upon that part being uh, properly drafted and encoded so you have a proper smart contract from the beginning to end. Uh, is there? Okay, good. So <clears throat> I guess covered the, the signature component. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is a, a wonderful topic for me. Uh, the E-Sign Act is the act that applies in this situation, okay? Uh, if you wanna go out and read it, have fun. It's not exactly a, a page turner, uh, but for attorneys it's very important because you wanna make sure that you understand what are the requirements for the smart contract to be legally enforceable? And the eSign Act is electronic signature. What's more electronic than going online and accepting a smart contract in someone's blockchain, right? I mean, it's the, they didn't perceive this or consider it when they were creating you know, the eSign Act, but here we are, okay? Um, and listen, the UETA is in 49 states. I forgot the state doesn't have it, quite frankly. Oh, uh, no, New York. Um, it's not in the UDTA. They have a similar law, but every state has a electronic signature law that you know, you, all of you should know uh, if you're practicing law in this field. If you, if you have a, 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 a blockchain enterprise solution and you're working on a smart contract, you may need to get a lawyer that can actually think this through for you, so you know, you know where to go, you just come to GBA, there's plenty of attorneys in, the, in that area, including the Cogent Law Group for that type of information. So, uh, I mentioned some of the things already about the UCC, 
uh, requirements that sale of goods for $500 more have to be in writing under Article 2, lease contracts, uh, agreements that require a security interest. Those are just three examples of what's in Article 2. I kind of already said that earlier, so once again, the excitement is getting to me. But <clears throat> it says any type of intentional reduction into a tangible form is sufficient. That's what I was saying earlier about you know, not having to be in natural language. It's right there, a little you know, wordy for what I just said, but that's tangible reduction is sufficient, right? Those are the key words that make me and many other attorneys say that this means that the code can be used as language for a smart contract. That's what they're for us, man. I just got ahead of myself all over the place, huh? Okay, so uh, again, those are the bullet points here. We already covered the written agreement part, so I'm just gonna keep moving as soon as he's done taking that picture. You good? Okay. Uh, ah, amending or canceling smart contracts. Here's one of the fun parts. Everyone always says, once a smart contract is done, you can't amend it. What do you guys think, true or false? If you think it's true, raise your hand. Ugh, so you think it's not true, raise your hand. Okay, hey, I, I, I'm not saying it's no right now. Right now we're still in the conversation stage, so. Um, the answer is, yes you can, but it's not as easy as just taking out your eraser or hitting your back delete button and retyping it in again. There's a few more steps that have to be taken, and it also depends on whether or not it's already been verified or not, right? So. Let's say you have a smart contract and you put it on the blockchain and you say, oh my God, I made a mistake on this smart contract. But it's already on the blockchain, you can't pull it back. So what do you do? Well, you could post a new contract on the blockchain to the same wallet with a higher gas fee and the miners, they're not gonna take that contract, they're gonna take the new one and the other one is probably gonna ex expire without having been uh, com uh, completed by uh, anyone accepting it. All right, that's one quick and easy way to do it without having to go back in and doing a whole bunch of, you know, uh, code and recoding and all that kind of stuff, right? So there are ways that you can amend slash cancel a smart contract. You just need to have someone help you do it because when I first started researching this years ago, I thought to myself, if it goes in a blockchain, if, it's, if it can't be changed, if there's no way to go back in and rewrite the code, how do you change it? But a lot of clever folks come out with some great ideas on how to do it, and that's just one of them. Um, oh, so this is really important too. So I was thinking when I was first got into smart contracts, I was like, what about the usual clauses we have in every one of our contracts? Alternate dispute resolution, acts of God, Consumer protection, uh, you know, what if there's non-compliance? Is there any penalty clauses? With a smart contract, the if then is just totally absolute in the basic smart contract context, right? So now we have uh, companies and, 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 you know, we can do it ourselves if we do it, you know, uh, specifically for a client. We have, we have companies that can create smart contracts with these clauses in it in the smart contracts and now it's much more legally enforceable and it, it looks and acts more like an, a regular contract than a smart contract. So you get the best of both worlds, right? I mean, you get the, the automatic, you know, autonomous uh, component of the smart contract, but you also get all the legal language and all the, the hundreds of years of, of contract law built into that particular platform. It's a win-win. Right? So when you're looking to do smart contracts, you know, uh, everything that is on this list, in terms of whatever industry you're in, if you're in real estate, yeah, you could have tenant obligations. If it's for labor and employment or for employment contracts, you could have those kind of issues in there as well. Um, you know, negligent and intentional acts for responsibility, that could be in there as well. Again, I mentioned before, I mentioned uh, alternate dispute resolution. And what's the big one? Jurisdiction. And we, I, I talked about it, and another presenter talked about it earlier on today, but if, this, if there is an issue with a smart contract, 
What do you go for your what do you go for your ADR? What do you go for enforcement? So is it in the US? Is it in Taiwan? Is it in Bangkok? Is it in the UK? Is it in Canada? Is it in Australia? Who knows? Right? But if you build that in, you take away all the complexities and the confusion about what happens if the smart contract is not completed uh, in a successful or in a timely manner. Oh, jumped ahead of myself again. <laughs> For court enforcement, uh, specify a jurisdiction or choice of law. For ADR, specify rules and location. <clears throat> Global virtual arbitration, especially in the world of COVID, uh, that's entirely possible, right? You don't have to necessarily get on a plane and fly somewhere to you know, arbitrate your, your case. You can just get on Zoom or Teams or Google Hangout and do it if that is the method that the arbitrator allows. Um, I think we were, yes, we're back together again. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass this mic to you and get the other mic. Okay, super. Test, test, okay. Okay, so, you know, we, we wanna talk about, you know, kind of some meta ideas around smart contracts and, and where they might be going in the future. Uh, again, a lot of the implementations right now are, are kind of rudimentary and a lot of these issues haven't really been figured out. Um, so they, you know, they, they have a tremendous value for transactional things and for payment processing and you know, th there's all kinds of great applications for these uh, and that's still uh, under development. So, you know, in terms of strategic options on how to program one of these contracts, if it's more com if it's a more complicated contract, um, you could have the terms that you can implement reasonably in code, in code, and you could have some key legal terms in a natural language uh, that are that are a supplement to the part that's that's coded and automatic. Um, you could have terms implemented in code that are duplicated with natural language terms. So, it, you know, if you're worried about, uh, in a complex transaction, you're worried about being able to, to enforce it in the sense that, you know, the other side says, I never even understood what I was agreeing to because it was all in code and, it, and nobody explained it to me. Um, you could provide a written explanation and take care of that problem. Um, and another option that I think is reasonable is do the traditional contract in natural language uh, like you've been doing it, um, but have a digital component. So, you know, in a very complicated transaction, uh, there may be things that you just can't code in, like whether tenants have met their obligations and, you know, whether they, whether they shoveled the sidewalks and maintained insurance and uh, a million other things that they're supposed to do. Um, but you could have a digital component for the things that you can digitize, like payments, um, and uh, that could be a you know sort of a, a hybrid approach. Could be a way to implement some of these things. Yeah, I mean, I, I've seen some uh, one or two companies create smart contracts, but then the front-facing part of it is is you just fill in the blanks, you know, name address, employer, so on and so forth, and then that gets taken and gets put into the code, and then the smart contract is created. So I mean, I thought, I mean, I haven't seen it for about a year or so, but I thought that was brilliant. Because what did I say earlier about what's gonna make this technology effective and, and, and adopted? User interface, right? That is so critical. Every client I have, I tell them, if you have poor user interface, is going to fail. And to what Evan was saying, right, so the code can be very complicated, but there's products out there that already exist that can make it simpler, or if you need to specialize, that's what we can do. Jump to the next slide. Um, so, um, takeaways. Um, you want to? I'll, I'll, start, I'll start off, yeah. Start off. So, like I was saying, it, you know, during my section, 
this is really groundbreaking stuff, right? I mean, imagine to not have to worry about collections, dealing with intermediaries. Imagine having a process where you finish and then you get your money right away into your wallet, right? I mean, that's groundbreaking stuff. And imagine, you know, now that, that crypto is in your wallet. Now you can do whatever with, you can reinvest into your company. I mean, everything becomes more streamlined in that process. Or imagine, I mean, here's, I heard this idea last night, brilliant idea. I think that, you know, whoever is doing this, I'm not sure if I should say their name, but if they want to admit it outside, that's perfectly fine. A smart contract auditing uh, company or auditing uh, protocol. Because what's gonna happen with, uh, if, you're, if you're filing a lawsuit and you're saying to a judge, hey listen, like everyone was saying, I didn't understand the code, right? And the judge says, well, show me the code. Do you think the average judge can read code? No. But what if there was an independent agency or company that says, hey listen, we've been approved by the courts in these states to be able to uh, interpret this code and provide a report on what it says and how it interacts. I think it's bloody brilliant. Yeah, so there's plenty of opportunities out there to use this technology. You just have to know how to do it and create the user interface to make it effective. I think that's right. I mean, there's, there's tremendous opportunities here. This is, you know, this is a ground floor technology. And you know, my analogy, I think I'm getting a slide ahead at this point, but um, you know, some, some of us are old enough to remember Microsoft DOS. Uh, <laughs> okay. You got one applause. <laughs> or, 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 you, or you've been to the Smithsonian and you saw it operating. Um, this, was an, this was the first PC operating system. And there was no graphical user, there was no user interface at all except a command line. You know, there, it, would, it would boot up and there'd be a little cursor there and you had to type some kind of a command or tell it to run a particular program or copy a file or something, <clears throat> you had to write it out in text what you wanted it to do. And if you got the syntax wrong, it wouldn't work. Um, f you know, building on that over the last 30 years or so, you know, Microsoft is now at the point where you know, we've got Windows 11. And it's a very capable operating system. It does lots of things and it's easy to use. Uh, you know, for anybody without computer training. Um, but you didn't, you, you couldn't sit down and you couldn't get a bunch of programmers and tell them to go write Microsoft 11 and expect it to happen. Um, because that had to be built up over time. And you know, and the, the programmers that are writing operating systems right now are standing on the shoulders of giants. They're, they're improving what's been developed over 30 years. And you know that that kind of uh, of development process is something that I think is going to happen with smart contracts, and you know people will come up with new ideas and new innovations and new concepts for how to write and implement a smart contract, and then somebody else will take that as a baseline and improve that, and eventually you'll get uh, you know you get to as big a difference between current smart contracts and the future smart contracts as there is between, uh, between the very first operating system for PCs and what we have now. Um, that said, we're I think a long way from getting rid of lawyers and traditional contracts. Uh, we've talked a little bit about some of the obstacles to, <laughs> to implementing those. And you know, at the end of the day, there's an economic factor here. Um, one of the things that I do in my practice is negotiate very complicated intellectual property licenses, uh, you know, and joint ventures and partnering agreements and you know, worldwide distribution. Um, those are very specific usually to the parties and what they're trying to accomplish. So to implement that in a smart contract, I mean, it's a one-off. It, it, it's, it's a very customized thing, and to go try to implement, you know, code it and implement it in a smart contract, I'm not sure it makes sense to make that investment, at least not today. Maybe you know, 20 years from now when, when there's a whole bunch of modules that you could link together and, um, and, and build on that, that might make sense, but not right now. Yeah, 
agree with everything you said. I'll just add one more thing uh, in terms of the lawyers and the smart contract piece. Uh, early on, I was with the, discussing with a business owner about you know, the legalities of smart contracts, and their point it was like, well, you know, with this in place, it's going to just ruin the need for lawyers and not get lawyers anymore. And I said, okay, let me ask you a question. When the internet came out, and then it was proliferated with, you know, quickie divorce and quickie will and quickie this and quickie that, and all the forms of the hearing is went online and filled it out yourself and filed your own whatever. Did that get rid of the need for lawyers? No. We did not go away that easily, number one. And number two, as this is getting more complicated, the need for us actually is going to increase, okay? So don't think because there is a new contracting mechanism in place that it's going to replace the need for legal representation. It's not. Okay. Well, I would argue that on that issue that to some extent the, the advent of smart contracts requires more lawyering but a little bit different kind of lawyering because now we're asking lawyers to be an interface between coders and engineers and business people. Um, you know, so somebody's going to have to bridge that gap because right now, uh, in my view, what's the de development of smart contracts technology is basically siloed. So you have lawyers thinking, oh, you know, what can I do with this and trying to figure that out and implement it. Uh, on the other hand, you have uh, the people who are developing the blockchains that support smart contracts and the smart contract code and and the programming languages who, as far as I know, none of them are lawyers. Uh, so, so it's being developed by geeks, and I, I proudly consider myself one of those. I'm an engineer. But it, you know, that, that stuff is all being written and created and, and theorized by, uh, by computer people and not by lawyers. So there, there's a real need, I think, to, to bridge those um, those gaps, it, you know, if we want this technology to be, if we want it to grow, if we want it to build, you know, from DOS into Windows 11 and, and be really useful, um, then lawyers are going to have to get involved and, and bridge those, those failures of understanding about what's needed. Um, Agreed. So I think, are we, are we ready for Q&A? What do you got next? Uh, we oh, got, oh, a few more no, things. Okay. No, wait a minute. What happened? Oh, I think this is the last one. Oh, uh, yes, 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 yes. Okay, so this is, <laughs> I, I insisted on putting this slide in. Um, because, you know, I think in, in, a, in a scenario like the one we have here where we're, we're getting together and we're talking about the future and, and we're talking with government people and, and in terms of how to do some of this stuff, um, it, it probably pays to, to do some larger forward thinking. Um, you know, people are familiar with the Uniform Commercial Code. If you think about what the Uniform Commercial Code did for business transactions, it's a set of standardized rules. And you can contract out of them, but if you don't write anything down and you do a, you know, you go do a business deal, you know, go buy something at a store, um, it's covered by the UCC. You know, so if there's no other contract, there's this standard set of terms that apply and standard ways that people are going to handle it. Um, so my question is, why aren't some of the blockchain creators, some of the system developers, creating a blockchain smart contract code that, that, that's a set of standard rules that operate within their blockchain? And you know, I'm not, I mean, th this isn't legislation. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you, you could get any, you could get the U.S. or five other countries or, or 100 countries to pass some laws about this stuff, but that wouldn't really fix your problem because you've got people all over the world and, and in an indeterminate place sometimes entering into these contracts. So, so the idea that a national government could solve this problem, I don't think so. But within a certain blockchain, who makes the rules for that blockchain? Who says how it works, how their token works, what, you know, what the, 
the people who created the blockchain. And those people could, if they wanted to, get with some lawyers and make a, a blockchain uh, smart contract code, well, like the UCC, but within their blockchain. Um, my, other, um, my other pie in the sky wish is for a smart contracts treaty. Now, as an as a intellectual property lawyer, um, one of my favorite things is the Patent Cooperation Treaty. Um, there aren't many things that 140 countries around the world, ba basically every place that's important except China, can agree on. Um, but the things about patent law that they could all agree on, they put in a treaty and they built uh, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization to, you know, to kind of process applications and give, uh, you know, give uh, corresponding rights to people in, you know, in one country versus another country. Um, you know, there are probably some things like that about smart contracts that you could get 140 nations to agree that this is how this particular legal issue ought to be handled. One would be jurisdiction. Um, so if you could get that kind of broad agreement, and again, you know, th this takes 20 years. It took a long time to come up with the Patent Cooperation Treaty and to get about every country in the world to sign on to it. But if you start now, and 20 years from now, you might just have that. Yeah, that, that's a short period, right? 20 years, right? <laughs> I don't have anything to add, so. It can't be in a hurry. No, exactly. <laughs> Should we take some questions? Um, predictions? Oh, what, oh we, have, we have another slide. Yep. Talk about it. Um, I've been talking too much. No, not at all. Uh, we really covered most of this stuff. I mean, yeah. it's at early phases. This, I mean, we really, this is year what? Uh, since 2008, since Bitcoin was, you know, the white paper was published. So we're what, 13 years, you know, into this? This is the very, 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 very beginning of a, a very long, productive, and I think very critical stage in technology and law. And to Evan's point, you know, starting now but with some of these groundbreaking ideas, especially for working together and having, creating a community, creating, you know, systems of cooperation, I mean, it could happen, it's so critical, right? And it, it just starts with a group of people in one room or on Teams or on Zoom or what have you, saying, you know what, let's start this. And it could just grow from there with, with, with diligence and follow through and with sheer determination, it can go you know, to a global phenomenon. So I think that could happen. Uh, the future of smart contracts, that I did is giant, yep, analogy, you already got that. So we're good, next one. Q&A. That, that, that's all there is. I'm going to bring questions. the mic down, and then you, you can do questions. No questions? Please come to the mic. We have, we have an audience. Uh, the global audience wants to hear. Can you state your name and your company, please, as well? Great presentation, Evan and Eric, thank you. It's Robert Levin of Emerging Star Digital DeFi. It's a crypto fund, it's launching next month, and I'm interested to find out, is there an ISO committee for standardization of smart contracts in Geneva? So congratulations, first of all, for uh, your company launching next month, and it's a great question. Uh, I have not heard of that, have you? Do you know something that we don't know, Robert? <laughs> yeah, I have not heard of that. I mean, we're, we're fairly plugged in. Doesn't mean this doesn't exist, but I haven't heard anything about that at all. Oh, yep. Yeah, there you go. Name the company, please. Sure, Brian Nielsen, Chairman of GBA. Um, when are Lawyers going to learn to start programming. <laughs> Next question, please. <laughs> I started uh, when I graduated from 
electrical engineering school, uh, I wrote a lot of code. And I couldn't write a line of code now to save my life because I haven't kept current with the languages. But, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, there are lawyers who code. And I think there's a need for more of that. Um, you know, that's, I mean, it's probably something that ought to be taught a little bit in law school or in undergrad, pre-law, whatever. Um, you know, that, I think there's a real value in having uh, a group of lawyers out there in the world who, who can, you know, if they can't write code that works, they could at least read something like the example that we put up and, and understand what the if-then statements are doing and, and how, it, how it might actually work. So I, I, I think you're right. I think there's a, th there's a need for that going forward. Yeah, I agree. And I can, uh, I'll just show you a, a story with you personally. When I went to law school, um, I, I applied. I was pre-med at Morehouse. So I graduated with a science degree. And I went to Columbia Law School. Come to find out that they were, not just Columbia, but other uh, schools of, of that you know, top 10 caliber, they were trying to bring more science into the legal education. So they were actively seeking science, engineering, biology, chemistry, major, math majors to bring that into legal education. There's no reason why that also can't be applied in this situation with coding. Because then they come to law school with that knowledge already, and then they can incorporate it into their legal education. So please, next question. So I saw up there you were talking about you know, codifying some of these things into law versus just building them into the blockchain code. I'm sorry, this is Amelia Powers Gardner. I'm a Utah County Commissioner and CEO of InnoGov. Um, and former GBA award winner. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and as I look at that. We took it back. <laughs> yeah. She's, a, she's a, an award winner. Okay, so not, not former, prior. Sorry, yes. prior. Um, so my question is on those smart contracts as we look at that, um, you know, having been in the private sector and government, I tend to lean away from government solutions. So is there a framework where you can set it up in the governance of the blockchain regardless of what the statutory law is, especially considering that my fellow elected officials, when I start talking blockchain, they think I'm them talking Bitcoin, and they don't realize that blockchain isn't Bitcoin. And so I'm wondering if we can kind of just usurp or surpass the government codifying part of it, and can that just be in the code of the blockchain, and is that solid enough? I, I think that's exactly right. I, I think your point is well taken. And the problem with, with thinking that government can implement any of these rules or regulations is that what government is going to do that? What, what government has jurisdiction over all these transactions? And you can't answer that. There, there is no government that has, because these transactions happen all over the world. When people, you don't even know who you're transacting with in a lot of cases. You know, they could, they could be down the street, they could be in Africa, they could be in Russia, they could be in China, they could be anywhere. And because you don't know where people are or what jurisdiction ought to apply, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, this isn't a government solution. And I think it's, I think it's a blockchain developer solution. I mean, I, I think, you know, all these blockchains are competing for smart contract business on, you know, our gas is cheaper. Uh, we can handle 10 times as many transactions as the other guys. Um, we ought to have some of these companies competing on the basis of... Governance. We have, we have an excellent, well thought out legal structure and a set of standard rules that apply if you don't code something else. Um, and you know, and maybe, and we have a, a standard required alternative dispute resolution, uh, you know, glo global virtual arbitration or something. I mean, you, blockchain developers could easily do that. They make all kinds of rules about all kinds of other things about their blockchain. I, I think they just don't have any lawyers that, that are sitting there building these things. So they haven't, maybe haven't thought of that as an opportunity, but I think it is. Sounds great. So I mean, I guess that's that goes back to the previous question: When are lawyers going to start to code? <laughs> well, yeah. So, so I have a. Uh, I agree with everything Evan said. 
I have a slightly different perspective, and that is, in my opinion, what's needed is more education and more training, right? The more they understand this technology, what it can do, how it operates, it's not just Bitcoin, the more we're gonna, and faster we're gonna evolve to where we wanna go. And that's why training education is my passion, because that's where you're gonna see the uh, benefits from all the hard work and energy we put into it now, the more we train, the more we educate as a community, the faster we're gonna cross that finish line where exactly what you want to happen will happen. Uh, I'll just put in a plug for Eric's company here. Um, Cogent Law Group is a pretty entrepreneurial group of people basically, and, and we have a very flexible structure so that people can not only be members of the law firm and participate in that, but also have other business interests and uh, startup companies and training companies. And Eric does some fantastic training. He's, uh, he's a leader in training in the GBA uh, and organized this whole day's presentations, basically. Uh, so he, you know, if you need training or want to find out more about training for yourself or people in your organization, uh, this is a guy to talk to. So plug, plug over. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Just to follow up on yeah. the standardization of smart contracts, the IEEE blockchain initiative has a IEEE standards association, and they are leading the blockchain initiative of the IEEE, which is obviously a global engineering organization, for standardization of smart contracts and many other processes within crypto, including payments and frameworks for DLT and applications. So I see over 70 committees for standardization in the IEEE. And then in the ISO, there's meetings start again continuing on standardization of smart contracts and uh, other crypto protocols. Uh, then the next meeting is this May online, and the following meeting is in November online for the International Standards Organization. Excellent. Good, good to know. Thanks for looking that up for us, because I think that's really useful information. Yeah, appreciate it. Hi, how's it going? Go I'm Logan um, from Clear Contracts. I wanted to um, bring up a topic that I think is important in making smart contracts smart, which is data oracles. So within smart contracts, you know, they have this capability that we talk about to you know, create better supply chains and automate transactions based off data. Um, so with data oracles being pushed into the conversation of how these uh, smart, pro smart computer programs confirm transactions, how do you guys see from a legal perspective all these different parties um, being responsible for their role within this smart contract? Um, well, I'll take a shot Sorry. at that. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think you know, data oracles are, uh, that's a, a function and a service that I think is essential to implementing smart contracts because, you know, they're built on if-then processes. So there has to be an if, an, an event or a, a trigger that happens in order to make it do anything. Um, and, and you know, da data oracles or you know, any kind of external data input that the parties can agree is reliable is, is a necessary function for, for doing those smart contract things. I mean, if you, you need to know uh, you know, was was shipping interrupted from one place to another? Is you know, is a delay legitimate? Um, did something get delivered? Uh, did did somebody else do something they were supposed to do? Um, and those kinds of inputs, which among you know, data oracles are one way of getting that kind of information. Um, you know, the, I think for a smart contract to be fully automated and fully functional, there'd have to be some agreement up front about who's a reliable source for that. And if, if the parties can agree that a certain data oracle will be, that their data will be relied upon, um, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, example would be a parallel um, interest rates. Um, you know, there are certain interest rate standards or benchmarks that, you know, if you want to write in 
uh, an escalator clause in a contract to um, you know to increase the um, the amount of rent or something else every year. Uh, usually, you'll refer to some benchmark uh, like the you know like the prime rate or something. Um, you know, so that that's a it's a standard that everybody everybody agrees that it's a standard and everybody knows where they can go look it up. So, uh, you know, I think if you have that kind of, of data, that kind of trusted source, then uh, that's going to really escalate your ability to do smart contracts. Thank you, Evan. I have been given the sign for it's time to us to go. But thank you so much for being here. We appreciate you. The great questions. <laughs> Thanks to Evan for co-presenting with me. Uh, stay tuned for the next presentation.
tokens, and they are also the so-called proposal makers. Um, what type of DAOs have we had and experienced with so far? Various kinds. Asset management, governance and aggregators, yield, gaming DAOs, creator and media DAOs, and what's called that DAO adapters. Another angle, another way to look at it uh, that is specified from the purpose and function uh, perspectives are agreement management DAO, investment pool DAO, collection pool, financial DAOs, social community DAOs, content management and infrastructure. Those are the ones that we deal with on a regular basis. What's the DAO market size today? It's pretty big. Uh, at the moment, total treasury of DAOs is estimated to be eight and a half billion US dollars, and it's constantly growing. More and more funds are being sent to be managed by DAOs, and so the sky is the limit. I think it's gonna grow tremendously. Now, our friends at deepdao.io uh, put, put together those uh, slides where you can actually see the variety of organizations in terms of size and what they control. There are more than one and a half million governance token holders that, uh, that these guys know of today. So pretty big crowd and growing all the time. So we're dealing with a new phenomena which is very, very material today. And as I said, regulation is yet to catch up with that. A famous story which illustrates that not all was always smooth in DAO history. Uh, some of you may know about the DAO of DAOs, which was formed in 2016, and people pulled together resources, uh, about 11 and a half million uh, either, uh, which was at the time about 15% of total supply. And then a few months later, uh, some people exploited the problems with the code and essentially stole uh, $50 million. Now, this is very interesting. Instead of turning to legal defense, what the community did, they did a hard fork. Vitalik Buterin and his team um, went back and uh, essentially put distribution on hold, and they forked the blockchain in such a way that it excluded the hack. And then they invited all people to voluntarily move to the new hard fork, to the leg of the fork that was formed, which most people did. Uh, some didn't, and now you know it as Ethereum Classic. And then what you know is Ethereum today is the forked version. So that illustrates um, resilience of communities towards hacks and towards attacks. So this was one way that um, the situation was resolved without turning to governments or any arbitrators or any lawyers or any courts. So that illustrates the fact that communities can come up with their own ways to deal with undesirable situations. What is the main lesson, in our opinion, from the experience with DAOs for the regulators? And that is, use the potential of governance tokens. A path to compliance, in our opinion, lies through working with uh, rules for governance tokens. And this is a way for regulation to stop chasing innovation, but rather step in and help people program the required things before they actually write the smart contract. What we can say for sure, uh, looking at the practical experience, is that high value and globally distributed communities uh, online are inevitable. And there will be bigger and bigger force with the, time, with the time passing. So something to watch for sure. And this is an interaction between decentralized finance and decentralized governance. So specialists in both areas are required to fully understand how to do that. Um, governance tokens allow to deploy 
very inclusive strategies, mobilize people around a common goal, and bring resources of um, skilled but remotely located individuals to collaborate. An amazing story. Another uh, clear lesson is the voting mechanisms and results. Many of you are familiar with some of the names of voting types that are mentioned here on this slide. Uh, there are many others that are being created today. For example, a very new kid on the block, which I'm sure you have not heard yet, is called soft cooperative voting. An amazing mechanism, which we'll talk about a little later, that has already been implemented and is working today, which aligns the interests of various participants. Now, DAOs are not without problems, obviously, and the ones that we have experienced, and as uh, was mentioned by previous speakers, of course, is a high complexity of programming. Only a handful of people who command uh, Solidity as programming language are able to do that. And also, imagine all the intricacies and details of a regular business model that you may have. There's a lot of factors that are to be considered. And so all of those, in order for the contract to be effective, uh, must be incorporated in computer code, which is not an easy thing at all, as we were told previously. Very true. Now, decentralization is what uh, is being achieved by a DAO. is not always a requirement or a very good thing. Sometimes smaller issues you know, can be resolved centrally. And uh, for example, in a vertically structured, like in a corporation, a decision of the executive on a particular issue, which can be taken within a minute, can be enough. Now, in a DAO, that's not possible. We have to get consensus for every practical step. And that is sometimes difficult. Even seemingly good ideas may or may not get support depending on how well they are presented by the initiators. Uh, legal regulation, again, our legal colleagues spoke about that, but a very famous case happened in um, uh, July 2017 when the SEC actually found that DAO sold securities, right? And therefore, it should have registered them properly with the uh, US regulator, which hasn't happened. And then um, a very famous problem with DAOs, they're very slow. Um, participants usually are in no hurry to vote and express their opinion. So it takes a lot of persuasion and influence, and I would say reputation of those who initiate certain changes for the crowd to react uh, in a short period of time. Very difficult sometimes. Why bother? Well, I think we all want a more equal and more decentralized uh, internet. And that is becoming possible through a mechanism of DAOs using distributed and uh, open source systems, including uh, decentralized programming as a brand new concept. Not very many people are experienced in that. Open governance, where everything is transparent, everything is easily accounted for, and everything is inclusive of every willing participant. Therefore, we can say a DAO is in many ways an alternative approach to governance based on open source infrastructures such as uh, you know, blockchain technology on its own, cryptocurrencies, NFTs, end-to-end -end decentralization, and uh, a, a new um, phenomenon called metaverse, where essentially people create a virtual reality in which real people act and uh, achieve certain goals. Some examples. Let me uh, ask, guys, can you please play a short video of Numis, just to give an illustration. This are what follows a couple of uh, products of DAOs that have been created on Everscale Network.
Numis. Numis is an example of innovation in NFT space and beyond. What is possible with this technology is to have a two-sided NFT. The front side is visible to everyone, uh, like normal NFTs today, but the back side is cryptographically protected. And only the owner of this NUMI can see, use, or uh, in any way, uh, shape, or form forward the, what's in the back. Now, that opens a million possibilities beyond the uh, realm of digital art. Now, imagine documents where the front side is visible to everyone, but the back side is private. Um, Shiv talked about confidentiality today. That's a perfect way to make available the information that you want to make available about yourself to others, but hide the one that should not be public and should be confidential. So even though Numis comes through the world of art and really uh, helps artists to um, create their works, get royalties, and uh, share the products of their works, including selling them, um, we also can imagine the use of this in a variety of industries, real estate, uh, documentation, uh, finance, whatever else, needs a combination of open information and confidential information. Another uh, marvelous uh, DAO child is called KW Finance. And this is an incredible creation, let me tell you. For the first time, it became possible for venture capital uh, participants not just to vote yes or no in a binary form to support or reject a particular project, but now it's possible to decide how much a particular fund should invest in this project or in that project, depending on what people say when they vote for it. How many positive votes, how many negative votes, etc. And so when um, KW Finance um, token holders, they, when they vote, the results of that vote are applied to the fund as a whole, not just to their own investment that they did. The funding is subscription-based, and um, active people are ready to um, make decisions while passive investors can simply piggyback on those because the interests of all investors are aligned through a special mechanism. The deallocation process, when let's say a particular project is not performing the way it was meant to, can also be managed in a quantitative way. So the more negative votes, the faster the funds are being withdrawn from the project. So if you can imagine, it, it adds a whole new level of complexity in running a, a, a venture capital fund. And what's beautiful about this is uh, the fair, fairness element of this particular DAO. The tokenomics of it are such that you can only receive revenues from a project by burning part of your tokens. Now that creates a whole new mechanism and whole new set of incentives and motivation for people to act in the benefit of the DAO as a whole. Um, I am now told that I have about 10 minutes left and I would love to devote them to any questions you may have. You guys uh, need to come up and state your name and company, please. All right. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Silvio here uh, with GBA and Logos Capital. Quick question. Um, interested to see how you see a little bit of the relationship between the NFTs, the particular NFT that you're creating, and then how that can bridge into the DAO. Uh, the, the one interesting paper that I read uh, that goes into a little bit of how these things might interoperate was uh, Vitalik Buterin's paper earlier uh, last year, just a few months ago, where he mentions like Francis Suarez, the Miami coin, the, like a DAO and NFTs and sort of how he sees all these things interoperating. I don't know if you got a chance to see that, but 
in any case, are you seeing a bridge between what you're doing with the NFTs and then the DAOs and sort of that future of that interoperability? Thanks. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, uh, if we look at Numis as an example, for example, so Numis as a DAO was created by a few entrepreneurs which uh, pooled their resources and then hired developers to actually make that uh, product possible. And they also reached out to a wider artist community, including those that are active in the NFT space, and invited them to come in and uh, create their works, including the second side. Now, that part is actually so new that it takes some time for people to understand the power and the potential of that situation. So what Dao here did is it went out and advertised new technology to the world of art, right? And they said, guys, you can come in and do this. You can put your like static image on the front side and you can have um, a movie on the back or you can have your interview on the back or you can have 10 more paintings on the back of the Numi, which nobody will know unless you buy it. So it creates a whole new element of mystery and uh, creativity. So to answer a question directly, there is, a, there is an interaction between the DAO and the NFT world in the way that the, this particular DAO, having uh, developed something very new, is going out to a broader uh, artist community and advertising it this as a platform for, for others to come in and build it, right? So I hope that answers your question. Uh, any other ones, please? Yes. Un unfortunately, yes, we have to record the questions as well, please. Hi, my name is Joshua Hakakian from the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, National Artificial Intelligence Institute. The question I have, um, because one, I think it's fascinating that Numis has developed that, and that's something with, I think, a potentially currently unfathomable um, consequences. The next thing that I would want to know is, is there uh, anything in development to prepare such a token as an NFT where the owner could choose which, shot, which side to show and change it back and forth on the blockchain? Yeah, you can actually do that today. Um, you can do that today when you create a NUMI. Um, you can put anything you want to the front and then anything you want to the back. Now, if you want to change that, so that's already out there, right? People already see the front side, so it doesn't make any sense to suddenly hide it. But what you can do is you can come and issue another NFT where you can switch whatever you want it for people to see to put in the front and then whatever you do not want them to see to put in the back. But it wouldn't be the same information because it just doesn't make sense if you want to hide something, why would you put it suddenly up front? What you can do instead, as an owner, you can share it the backside with whoever you want. You can send access key, an encryption key, to your family or your colleagues or to a group of buyers, for example, if you want to sell something. So you control, as an owner, who sees the backside and you can open it to any group of individuals or you can make it open to the public if you wish. Strange occasion, but sometimes it can happen as well. So that ability to change what's in the front and what's in the back is already there. Thank you. I think we have a, some more, please. Yeah, um, I saw there's a, there a Silvio again here. Uh, uh, we're working on, on like an NFT for impact marketplace with, with uh, Moon that's over here. Sorry, I'll pass, I can pass the mic to this lady over there that I wanted to ask after. There's this uh, really cool NFT project called like Crystal OG. I don't know if you've heard Crystal OG or OG Crystal made in Florida. It's basically a, a multimorphic um, NFT. So it's like as you, as you buy and or resell that NFT, it unlocks another layer or another capability or transforms the actual image that's living on the NFT, like a simple crystal. And then depending on your wallet elements, how many transactions you've done or how much ETH you have or et cetera, et cetera, it, it will trans, it'll morph itself 
towards further customization. And I think the first three or four times you sell the NFT thereafter also unlocks a this sort of a next stage of growth as well. I, I don't know how to describe this besides sort of saying multimorphic, multi-stage. I mean, maybe there's a better way to, to ask this question, but I'm curious to see if yeah. I've been trying to figure out a way to yeah. um, maybe develop or find technology that allows us to recreate something yeah. similar. We can do that. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, that's uh, in part already addressed by the royalty feature. Mm -hmm. So every time a sale of that digital work of art happens, the author gets a royalty percentage, right? So we already are able to program <laughs> any type of event, right? In this case, it's a payment, right? But if, for example, a product itself, a digital work of art itself, allowed for several layers, right? We can easily program a new layer to be open or visible, we say visible, uh, upon a certain transaction. Let's say a sale occurred and then the next uh, level is visible. So yeah, we can do that today, same way as we do with the royalty, as a sort of if, when, uh, so if then element of the smart contract. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I have actually several questions. In, uh, I must say I haven't been from the very beginning of your talk, but you mentioned the governance tokens. Yes. You mentioned the voting strategies, and you know, uh, at least from other works. Yes, uh, I know that there are there is voting also which is based on consent, not necessarily on consensus, and that is you know much easier. But I'm especially interested in the governance tokens, unless you meant something else. <laughs> because for me, governance tokens are tokens which enable the community to get catalyzed and, uh, and stirred in a certain, uh, you know, positive or whatever direction. So, so if you can just describe the governance tokens. Yes, uh, a governance token is used to vote first and foremost, mm -hmm. even though um, there are certain ways to actually stake um, governance tokens as well. So, uh, but the primary goal is to vote. Now, the voting mechanism can be very different, as um, uh, we all know, but that is the primary focus of a governance token. So if somebody, let's say, bought okay, into and does a project, it have different values for different stakeholders? Or, I mean, like no, that, but you, what's the point? No, uh, I no, can government, vote with any token. You can vote with many tokens, right, if you own many governance yeah. tokens. So um, usually one token, one vote, right? Okay. But an investor can have, you know, number of governance tokens, therefore his or her vote if voted with all of them, will have more weight, right? So that is already possible today. Okay, just wanted to let you know that by governance token, so when you say that, I mean, you can just call it voting, because uh, governance token, and I will send you some works, uh, are on my planet, uh, trust tokens, merit tokens, knowledge tokens, and so on and so forth, by which people with different you know, qualifications can have more weight in the vote. So that is more like governance, in my opinion. No, when, when, this, when, we can take this offline. When we say governance, we mean, we mean voting, an ability okay. to affect so then, a, a then certain decision like of a community. Okay, thank you. Now, those other types of tokens have their space as well, uh, but they're not to vote, right? They are, for example, reputation building, right? They can be used to build reputation for most active members of the community. In fact, we have some of those as well or they can uh, achieve some other goals. But in order to vote, to execute certain decisions, that's governance, governance token. Yeah, in order to vote, but uh, yes. decision making is governance. And Correct. I think is maybe one part of it. Okay. Uh, we have one more question, I think, over there. All right, make it quick, we're already over. So, as far as DAOs go and nonprofits, do you put up a nonprofit and can a nonprofit own a DAO? And does that uh, nonprofit preclude a DAO because the government actually is in the smart contract structure? So, anyway. um, we have DAOs that are specifically tailored um, for socially meaningful uh, projects, which are not meant to generate income. For example, we have um, a Tritonium. And that's a DAO that collects funds to plant trees. 
In fact, uh, just very recently, they bought a million uh, cedar uh, trees to be planted globally. And uh, that's a non-for-profit, essentially. And they send all the funds, less very tiny commission, um, to be able to purchase, you know, in this case, trees. We have another one called the Human Venture, which helps uh, people in need as well. So there's a lot of room for non-for-profit DAOs on the blockchain, I think, because they can perform socially meaningful functions, uh, such as planting trees or cleaning sources of water or just helping individuals in need. So definitely, yes. If there are no further questions, thank you very much for your attention. Test one, two, three, awesome. Uh, okay, uh, I want to just let you know, uh, again, my name is Gerard Dache, Executive Director of the Government Blockchain Association. Um, I just want to remind you about uh, a series that we have going on. If you go to our website, you'll see something called the ECHO, uh, or the Easy Expo series. So what we're doing is, this is a, uh, it's, uh, one of our members has uh, offered to put this together. It is a subscription-based service. And so basically what we're doing is after every conference like this that we have, we're going to have an echo generally about a week or so after where we're going to have the speakers participate in a panel. It's going to be a, a, a much more precipitous, uh, much more engaged uh, thing. It'll all be online, so you guys can go back home, think about it, you have questions, come back on. It, it, um, it's, a, it's a one subscription price for the entire year. And so let me, I just want to tell you a little bit about the echo event. Series are intended to continue the conversation after the conference. Join us for a virtual job fair and pitch competition so you can find the people to grow, to grow your team however you need, uh, whether they are. Uh, and the first one we're going to do is a FinTech deep dive on February 4th. Uh, includes a series of panels talking about compliance, privacy, banks, credit unions, and how they impact uh, the adoption of FinTech um, and uh, rapid acceleration. So one, one price. If you go to the website and you want to subscribe to the services, it's, it's relatively, it's, it's pretty inexpensive, and then it gives you a whole year of participation in both the panel discussions, um, the job fairs, and the pitch competition. So just wanted to share that with you. And just go, if you go to uh, uh, our website, either the, the event site is network.gbaglobal.net, or the, 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 um, our regular one, you can get all that information. Okay, thank you, I just want to let you know. So I, I'm introducing the next speaker. So our next speaker is, a, is a Sid Sharma. Sid comes to us from Canada. He actually leads our, uh, and I don't know if we've posted on the website yet. If we're not, we, we, we need to. He leads our um, identity management working group. He's got a business called Rehuman. He's an incredibly smart guy. He's help, also helping us with communications. And uh, I'm extremely pleased to introduce Sid Sharma. He's going to be talking about a, a uh, international organizations, NGOs, and kind of what's happening in this space globally, because uh, uh, both identity and uh, you know, inclusion globally is a very important thing. So with that, Sid, please, uh, please join us here on the stage. Okay. Hello? Yeah. Perfect. How's everyone? Good. Good. After this, break. Okay, um, Rob? There you go. Should I start? Uh, no, nah, I'm not a funny guy. <laughs> Do you want me to press something or?
Hi. <laughs> I think it's been off for a while, so maybe. If they start to break, it's just how you're instructing. It's all good. I can still freestyle it, so, so it should be good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So, hi everyone, my name is Sid Sharma. I'm the CEO of a company called Rehuman. And we are in the space of decentralized identity or blockchain identity, and it's also called self-sovereign identity. They are one and the same things. And I have been in blockchain space for about five, six years, and I have invested in companies, and finally we decided to start this infrastructure company because one of the things that blockchain and all this is missing is the compliance and the identity layer because there's one side there's anonymity and then there's other side that we should know who we're dealing with that in a trust because metamask wallets and those things they have these public keys and private keys but you don't know who you're talking to so that's why we created this digital identity company and we also have a rehuman foundation which is a nonprofit it helps out um, underprivileged kids in Africa and yeah right now we are in Africa and also unrepresented founders in North America so right now we are investing in companies that are mostly helping any kind of social cause so we invest like uh, initial pre-seed money and we go from there and we also provide them with some kind of technical support because a lot of blockchain is still new and our team we've been doing it for quite some time so we provide those technical resources as well Reason I'm talking about, should I? <laughs> so reason I'm actually talking about while the thing comes on is um, about NGOs is because we started helping out in Africa about three, three years ago and we help out in Tanzania. It's a school, uh, basically when we took over the school and started helping out, there were 200 kids from grade one to I'd say grade five. And at the time, there was one classroom and all these kids, like 200 kids in one classroom, and multiple classes happening. Um, we took over, that's perfect, thank you. And right now, that same school has grown to 1,500 students and we provide them with daily meals, critical school infrastructure such as your, uh, we built uh, classrooms, we built uh, sanitation, water, and one of the key reasons this school grew is not because there were more classrooms, there was actually food. So a lot of people were sending their kids to this school because they, they were able to eat and that could be one meal that they were eating. So we provide that on a daily basis. And since then, uh, I was in 2021 in Tanzania again and over there, we, uh, I stayed for three months, worked with United Nations subsidiary to work on an identity project. And yeah, and Rehuman is right now in US, Canada, and Africa. So we are finally, we can say we are a mini global company. So let's talk about current state. So we are living in 21st century, interacting with 19th century institutions that are based on 15th century practices. And it causes a lot of issues because things are changing. Our needs are changing. And there's a lot of global mess that governments can't fix. Um, and that's why good people like NGOs and non nonprofits, they have to step up. And I think I'm a true capitalist, but I do believe that there is a need for conscious capitalism, where we have to give back certain portion towards some of these causes like climate change, hunger, poverty, human rights, identity, financial inclusion, and more. And reason I think identity is an issue globally is when you know 1.5 billion people have no form of any identification whatsoever. And these are some of the things we take for granted in North America or Europe that we have it. And women and our ch children are mostly impacted by this because in certain countries, women can't, they're not allowed basically because of religion or whatever to take pictures. And if they don't have a photo, they can't get ID. And if they can't get ID, they can't access things like driver's licenses. So a man has to drive her all over the place. So basically, identity is a crisis on a global scale. And when these good companies like UNICEF, American Red Cross, or United Way UNICEF, they go about helping 
these communities, they, they, they run into issue of fundraising. And these are big names. Like they, they have funding, but they still struggle. So what happens to small NGOs? Like, I mean, small nonprofits. Maybe some, some of you here have nonprofits. Some, some people were asking questions about starting nonprofits as DAOs, right? So fundraising is always an issue, whether you are venture capital, whether you are an entrepreneur or an NGO. And especially as an NGO, you're asking somebody to give you something and they're not getting anything. There's, there's no reward. And you have to educate people about your cost. Costs are related to it. And you have to overcome low trust because NGOs, historically, they have reputation of not sending the money that you are sending them. Um, how they manage their funds. So some of these problems are part of the funding process, but they, they just they just hinder these NGOs and nonprofits from reaching their goal in an efficient manner. So we have talked about blockchain a lot, but I think blockchain can do a lot good. Most of us know that. And some of the simple things that most of us now probably sick and tired of hearing is, it's a single source of truth, tamper-proof records, and it also provides alternate funding. But before I get into it, there are two key things blockchain can do for NGOs and nonprofits. It can help with governance and funding. So not all blockchains are built exactly in the same way. And yesterday, I think I had somebody ask questions about why Bitcoin can't be used for literally everything. It depends whether you're using the Bitcoin blockchain or you're using the Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency. So public blockchains, basically what they mean is anyone can join them. You can fork Bitcoin. You can even join Bitcoin network, and you can start using. There, there's nobody stopping you. Everybody is exactly on the same level. Whereas permission blockchains, they're not same as private blockchains. Private blockchains are something that's owned by one entity, and that kind of loses its flavor. But permission blockchains, we have been working with Hyperledger Group uh, for past, I would say, four or five years. And since 2016, so I think, yeah. So Hyperledger is a permission blockchain, and reason it's good for enterprise and NGOs is because not every single thing that you do is public. And you don't want every single thing to be public. So here, how UNICEF is paying their retirees as a pension fund, I don't think that information should be publicly available. So that's why the whole argument about why one thing can't do it all. And I think there's a place for almost everything. So permission blockchains, so right now I have two, but there are many, Hyperledger and Quorum. Quorum is being incubated by now Ethereum Foundation. So Ethereum is also a public blockchain. And then they have Quorum, which is their private or permission blockchain. There are benefits to permission blockchains, and some of them are better performance. You don't have to worry about the gas or fluctuating cryptocurrencies because some permission blockchains because you're using for governance, you don't have to have cryptocurrency associated to it. And that's where most people, when they get into the cryptocurrency or blockchain space, they think every single blockchain has something to do with crypto. And I think the lady here said it right. When you talk to your friends, they think you're creating Bitcoins. But it's so many uses that you can do. So this is simply for governance perspective. Um, cost effective, privacy focused, improved governance. And governance is important because Nonprofits such as like um, Red Cross or United Nations, they don't allow you or I to be part of the consortium. Only selected individuals or selected organizations or donors such as Bill, and Bill, uh, Bill Gates and Melinda Gates Foundation will be part of it, right? Because we, we are not trustworthy. And plus, when it comes to decision making, public blockchains are kind of like, they, they slow every single thing down and I think um, in the last presentation, the presenter also said that decisions are not made as effectively. Sometimes good things can totally go sideways because everyone has their own agenda. Whereas in permission blockchain, these different uh, entities that are part of the consortium, they have one agenda, which is to, let's say in this case, United Nations or UNICEF to help out kids or any other entity. Let's go to fundraising. Fundraising is a difficult task, but most uh, what you call 
nonprofits are right now thinking about raising funds using one of these options. So you can use Bitcoin or you can use altcoins. That, that's what they are called because they are in that category. They are alternate coins to Bitcoin. So, and then they are stable coins. Stable coins hold their um, value against United States dollar. Um, altcoins, they fluctuate heavily. It depends, um, depends on the team if you want to invest in those or not, or if you even care about those. But, and and we'll, I'll give you examples down the line why some of these could be a ben, uh, benefit to some of the organizations. Also, um, again, I keep giving United Nations because we have work, uh, done some work with them. So United Nations is now raising funds using NFTs. And that's actually a really cool option because they can sell their art and the individuals who buy that, they're funding a good cause. So NFTs can be a force for good and not just crypto punks. And I think there's, there's always positive in most of the things that's happening in the space. We just focus on one. So I think um, by opening up to these possibilities, NGOs can significantly raise their funding requirements. But most, <laughs> most nonprofits are not set up to accept these cryptocurrencies. And that's because they don't know how to even highlight the donor benefit. So if let's say you are a donor who's um, investing five, not even investing, donating $5,000. According to IRS, what exactly that's gonna be considered for the organization and you as a donor? And those are a lot of questions a lot of people don't know. This is the best information I could find that IRS right now, right now, as of um, when I, we made this presentation was, cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin is considered in an asset class such as property. It's not considered currency right now. So, but again, we need to know some of these IRS requirements and this is upfront work. If let's say any of you are thinking about starting a nonprofit or a DAO that's actually helping out some kind of cause, you need to think about some of these things. Um, most people, they just go and get crypto wallets, just your average simple crypto wallets, whether it's my Ether wallet or Rehuman wallet or you name it. Um, but the problem is they're not built for institutional money. When, when, when I say institutional money, it's like when you're raising as a nonprofit, you may need a million or two million dollars. And then somebody needs to be a custodian unless you are totally fine with, uh, let's say, I donated money to an, uh, GBA and I'm fine with one person holding all the keys and if they lose all the, those keys and they, they're just gone. So there needs to be that custodianship that what happens to money was de deposited. So there's a, uh, you can get institutional digital wallets from Coinbase, I think Kraken is doing it, and a few other companies. You can get institutional wallets, but you have to go through a process and you have to be set up as a proper structure to accept funding. And this opens up two lanes of funding. One is from millennials, which 74% of the millennials, uh, they are more inclined to give. And they are more crypto savvy right now. Whereas you also open up to bigger investors, your typical investors. And in that case, you can do galas, you can do whatever you want to, but this is a cheaper way to reach more people but at the same time, you can actually raise a lot of money from anywhere in the world. And there needs to be proper policies on accepting cryptocurrencies, like which ones to accept, which ones not to accept, because they are highly volatile and they, they can go up and down. So some, somebody donated you a million dollars, tomorrow it could be 15. So it works through simple transfer. Like, I mean, it, they don't have to go to their bank they, they can simply transfer money, including billions of dollars. And uh, I'll give you an example that happened recently. Uh, there's low processing cost, depends what you are using. So if you're transferring million dollars on Bitcoin, I mean, that, that's gonna be a massive, massive cost. And if you are going with something like Dogecoin or Shiba Inu or all these things, significantly lower cost. So here are the real world examples. So United Nations, uh, I think I talked about this, that pension fund, they launched their blockchain application in 2021. 
And they wanted to make sure that all the people who are receiving the pension from United Nations, and they're all over the world, they, they are still alive. And the normal process would be they will send these letters, they have to sign it, send that back, and prove that they're still alive. And sometimes there's compliance issues with that. Well, they launched this application. It's an identity application where individuals, no matter where, you, where they are, they verify themselves. And today, they have 18,000 members using this application. Another one, Vitalik transferred $1 billion to COVID India Relief Fund last year. And just imagine if anyone had to transfer $1 billion. That wouldn't be an easy thing. But he was able to do it. And then the last thing is, what's next? Next thing is, um, I've been such a huge advocate of blockchain. Like, I'm involved with so many organizations all over the world. And one thing we have learned that collaboration is the only way we can move forward, especially after COVID. It, it, it just o opens your eyes that we can't do all the things alone. Especially blockchain in true essence is that. You can't just run a company, build a company alone. You have to have some kind of blockchain collaboration with members. And you have to keep an open mind about the technology, if it's moving or not. Oh, do I? Is he the one? Oh, OK. <laughs> cool. And last thing is, not everything needs decentralization. I hear all this, like, but I think we need to know that not everything needs to be decentralized. There's multiple ways to do the same thing using blockchain. Explore, get involved. But I think don't, don't get confrontational. I, I see a lot of conversations. Everyone seems to be knowing what they're talking about, but I think it's fine. Respect other people. There's a lot of projects, a lot of cool projects. I mean, we built this project two years ago, and right now it's with three companies. But sometimes when I talk to people, they also question. So I think the whole thing is respect everybody, because nobody really knows this space, no matter how long you've been there. And there's actually always time for newcomers and new brains. So just come and accept everyone. Be kind to each other. Be kind to yourself. And thank you. Thanks a lot. All right. Next, we should have a short, brief video from one of our members um, out of Jordan. Uh, Sari Kasim, I believe, is his last name. I may have brutalized that, but here he is. Rahim. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. For all of you who are watching us from all around the world, thank you for being with us today, and thank you for making this event happen. Special thanks for GBA Global Board of Directors and members. Special thanks to uh, and grateful to our sponsors of this event. I will present today a short introduction about the theory and the concept of blockchain in a macroeconomic perspective towards achieving a global financial inclusion and justice to our world. And to be clear here, we are not following any political party against others. It's not an event to start comparing capitalism to socialism or any other foundational movements in the world. But trying to bring in new ideas to our foundational and economics infrastructure. So now I will highlight some symptoms of our current financial systems before diving to the main idea. All of us has seen and felt the current increase in prices around the world and how it affects mainly the middle and the poor layers of our societies, what we call inflation, which something happened many times in the modern history. But these days, we are facing something different than normal inflation. We are facing a global recession and increasing in poverty scales and the higher percentages, especially in the third world. And the first symptom here I would like to highlight that's mainly focused in normal trading activities. Uh, consider yourself have been in a case that you own a small shop of equipment for sale, and your shop is full of these assets, bumps, for example, 
and the market is down. You cannot sell or cash in your goods. Your second door neighbor is having an office of furniture company, and he also having a major old stock that he cannot sell due to the market as well. Let us consider that both of you needs each other products, but you cannot trade because you don't have the money in your hands at the moment that due to the market situation, there is no money, so you cannot exchange this product. Scale this small business story uh, for so many shops, companies, industries around the world who are having the same situation, waiting the economy to grow up again, so they start trading again and make profits. All of these industries are waiting a centralized authority to authorize money speeds, money movement between hands, lowering rates, increasing rates, manipulating markets, so the loans could come up again and banking industry can work out and get to the cycle of the money again. In the second level symptom, we can see the Forex trading platform markets and cryptocurrencies trading platforms and so many other stock markets. Where do you know there are so many players there and we can differentiate them as they're their capital inside these markets. We have sharks, whales, shrimps and so many other players. When to sell and when to buy, where the real value of the stock or a company is the same. But the manipulation by the traders are the main controller here. Whether it was stock markets, fiat currencies, or even a cryptocurrency market, all are trying to make profits from a non-realistic values. And of course, affect prices of the real products in normal people's lives. The last symptom here, as we can see, some NFTs sold by almost $7.5 million per each and some humans in Africa with complete bodies searching for basic things on earth to just live and keep surviving. We are not here to criticize NFT's business and the promising doors of this technology, but just highlight our current ways of human greediness. And this is only one symptom. We have hundreds of stories can explain why we are not all right. And our current financial systems and behaviors are not all right. Many of you have seen this illustration about the wealth gap in the world where almost 50% of the global wealth in the hands of 1% of world population. I am showing it here as a result of what a current financial system produced and where we are now because of current capitalism and economic theories we follow. By the way, all have been working well to some extent till the 70s, 80s of the past century. Today, we have a different innovation tools to change this, not only by creating new currencies or systems over this capitalism theories or the same economic theory, but the technologies to create a new infrastructure to the whole world economy, a new infrastructure to furnish more justice in the world. And one of these helpful technologies is blockchain. So yes, we are not talking about a normal disruptive technology here, but a foundational technology and infrastructure technology. To explain more the gap in our financial system, you can see this slide, about five companies in the United States in the market cap of $11 trillion, while the GDP of 45 countries in the third world are $9.1 trillion only. And now let's go to the idea and innovation idea of the blockchain macroeconomic theory. To this theory, I would like to make clear notes here First, this is the first version made in blockchain macroeconomic theory. So it's not necessarily to be considered or implemented in the same shape we are showing now. Some more research are going on to this field. Second, we have been exploring forth and back into the financial history and sound money and governance till we reach to this first illustration of blockchain macroeconomic theory. The theory is about dividing the global economy into three main layers. First, the macroeconomic basic needs layer, 
second, the macroeconomic traditional layer, and third, the microeconomic layer. The human basic needs layer is to be set free for all humanity, and that means to free it's totally out of any financial system. Creating the basic needs layer under DAO control, a fully blockchain decentralized ledger made as of proof of stake consensus. Stake is defined by each state contribution into this basic needs layer. In other words, any sustainable earth resource reliable to avail for all humans in the world and matches the basic needs of the human race shall go under the basic needs layer such as nutritious food, clean water, shelter or safe place, electricity, and internet access. For the second and third layers, we will listen to our international keynote speakers talking about latest initiatives and projects toward financial inclusion. In the traditional macroeconomic layer, we have some excellent initiatives in the global supply chain to unite the currency of exchange between world countries in order to be rid of currency manipulation and other board activities we have experienced in the past centuries. The third layer is about microeconomics and it's getting the most attention. There are so many initiatives, projects, and a lot is going on there. Which is something normal as this layer is the closest one to our daily activities as a human. It's all about money, cash, fiat, DeFi, DeFi 2, and NFTs. We will hear today so many excellent roadmaps and mainly to align the regulations platform between CBDCs and cryptocurrency. It's a big dream if we can find an equation of one platform to connect both sides, which is one of the reasons why GBA is exist. So this new concept is about giving and the beauty of giving. Setting the basic needs layer totally free for humanity has never been an easy thing to achieve, but it's a reliable option with all emerging technologies and green sustainable resources available on Earth. Think about it as you don't have to pay gas fees again or electricity bills and wages to secure approximately 50% on your savings. Think about recovering economy and purchase power to all society levels. And think about getting back the missing trust between government and people. It's all about giving. Finally, this research is a huge. We just covered less than 1% of its content. So many other related factors, SWOT analysis studies are involved and to be covered with the final paper of this global initiative. I will take this opportunity to ask for your support and ideas towards financial inclusion and justice. We ask the silent majority of scientists, thinkers, innovators and world organization leaders to step up and join us in our R&D working group with GBA. The main point here to raise that our earth is very, very rich to implement basic needs layer and it's a reliable option for all mankind. Or as we said it, let us light the earth before leaving to Mars. Uh, thanks, every, everybody. Uh, that was um, uh, Sari uh, Kazim. He's uh, the GBA uh, Middle East lead. Uh, an incredible y uh, young man. He's actually been interviewing about 50 people or so in the Middle East uh, as a chapter lead. So uh, you're going to see great things coming out of the Middle East. So he's specifically in Jordan. 
Uh, we've got a number of folks uh, from Jordan participating online and, and, um, uh, and in here. So uh, totally excited about what our Middle East team is doing and, and the research. If you're interested in that particular research, send an email to support at gbaglobal.org. We'll get you in touch with the right people. And with that, uh, you guys are on break until 310. Thanks.
All right, everybody, if you could take your seats. We are going to be kicking off our afternoon sessions. And so starting off, we have a presentation on blockchain tech, global legislation, regulations, and case law. And we've got Eric Guthrie taking the stage with Earl Hall. Eric? Yeah. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right, so I have a very important question to start with. You guys tired of me yet, or what? No. No? All right, that's a good answer. OK. Whew, there we go. Uh, so you guys know me by now. Slides. I'm Eric Guthrie, uh, and partner coach in Law Group. Uh, for those of you that are coming online for the first time, I'll do a quick introduction. Uh, partner coach in Law Group, uh, director of training programs for the Government Blockchain Association. President Better Me, Better We, and I'm a G certified GBA training partner, author of the book, Blockchain or Die, an Amazon number one bestseller, and winner of three awards, and there we go. Okay. Um, that's my social media. I'll, I'll show it again at the end of the presentation, uh, but uh, if you want to connect with me, my social media and my GBA email. So, <clears throat> and that's everything I just basically said. Oh, and of course I teach the blockchain legal specialist course, uh, which I do about three or four times a year. So let's discuss blockchain legislation. Now I have a very short window because I'm sharing the stage with another speaker afterwards, Ara Hall, and I really want him to you know, have enough time to give his presentation because it's great stuff. So I'm gonna try and get through this in about 15 minutes. Then I pass the mic over to Earl, and he's going to take it on home. So there's, you may be wondering, why are there clouds in this slide? Because it's going to be at a very high level. Right? I don't have time to really de do a deep dive into a lot of this legislation. So I'm really going to discuss this high level the trends, you know, important topics, that kind of thing, and then go into uh, regulations and state and then case law, and then we're going to go from there. So when I first started doing research for my book, Diversify or Die, I started reading a lot of legislation globally and a lot of statements from uh, central banks all over the world. And I noticed a trend. The vast majority of them had a statement that had, for the main content, threes, these three bullet points. Cryptocurrencies are not illegal or forbidden. That's number one. Number two. There's warnings about the risks associated with investing in cryptocurrencies and blockchain companies, number two. And number three, cryptocurrencies are not recognized in the country or considered legal tender, a fiat currency, or backed by the country's central bank. So the first is basically saying, we're open for being used. The second is saying, be careful because you could lose your money. And the third one is saying, we're not taking any responsibility for this. This is a uh, do it on your own. It's not anything that's endorsed or backed by the, the particular government. That's what I saw in the vast majority of the statements from central banks and regulators all over the world. So that's one high level thing I wanted to point out. The second is bans on cryptocurrency and implicit bans, absolute bans and implicit bans. So maybe you're wondering, what's an implicit ban? An implicit ban is where it's prohibiting banks and other financial institutions from dealing in cryptocurrencies or offering services slash businesses dealing in cryptocurrencies or banning cryptocurrency exchanges. That implicit ban is more of a, like, 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 like a big scale financial regulatory banking kind of ban. It does not ban uh, use of cryptocurrencies person to person or perhaps small business to small business, but when they get into the banking sector, or the way they get into a large-scale cryptocurrency exchange sector, that's where you have some of these implicit bans taking place. Now, this is a very broad statement. Some of the bans have very specific uh, requirements or, or actual banning language, you know, country by country. We're not going to get into that. But that's what that is saying in that slide, implicit ban, absolute ban. Now, there were uh, eight absolute bans on this slide in 2018 and 15 implicit bans. I will make a caveat on this slide. This is where the, the beauty of GBA membership comes in. Yesterday I was preparing this slide. 
school, I was not preparing it, I was going over it. And two other GBA members that I'm very close to were like, well, tell us about what you're gonna present. So I talked about the slide. They said, which countries are banned? So I gave the eight countries that were banned uh, on the slide. And then one of them said, and one of them is UAE. And one of them said, I don't think there's a ban in UAE. And I was like, really? And then we talked about it, and I recall there being a lot of stuff happening in Dubai with cryptocurrencies. And I was like, you're right. But according to the Library of Congress, on their exact quote, and that's a, that's a poll from the Library of Congress slide, UAE is listed. So what's the lesson here with the government? Trust but verify. <laughs> because they may not be right, OK? So I make that caveat because it was support of GBA members. You know, we support each other. We educate each other. We work with each other. That made this presentation so much better because otherwise, that slide may not have had the exact information that you should have and you watching all over the world should have as well. So eight absolute, 15 implied. Question, do you know me? I'd like to be interactive with the audience. Do you think the bans increased or decreased between 2018 and current day? What do you think? How many think increased? Raise your hand. How many think decreased? Raise your hand. Okay, so about a two to one ratio. Most plead for increase rather than decrease. Here's the answer. Nine absolute bans, so the absolute bans went up by one with the caveat of UAE, and 42 implicit bans. So the implicit bans almost tripled, assuming, of course, that this data is 100% accurate because what did I say before? Trust but verify, right? So you see now that the more countries are doing implicit bans when it comes to cryptocurrencies and you know, using it for banking and, and large scale institutions and perhaps even for cryptocurrency exchanges. So the question is, why the implicit bans? I have one word for you, which is just my opinion, not the opinion of GBA, not the opinion of a coaching law group, yada, 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 all the disclaimers. Protection of governmental systems and banking systems. Right, think about it. If there's any threat or danger to their system, it's the use of it with large banks, federal reserves, or their version of federal reserves in those countries, right? And if it's cryptocurrency exchanges, it's providing a much more robust exchange of currencies, which they can pull from their banking system. So that's why, that's my personal, I have not read this anywhere. That says, when I think about it, what did I say in my first presentation? Issue spotting, right? So that's what I think is the issue with the increase in implicit bans. Now, this is, I didn't make the slide, but this next thing I'm gonna make, but, and this is kind of, I wanna say it's a soft pitch, but this is why GBA is so important. Because if we can get out and educate you know, all over the world that we can be educating you, we can be providing you with your options that make sense both from a regulatory standpoint, a legislative standpoint, a banking standpoint, then maybe the implicit bans won't be so prevalent or increase anymore, right? So that's something I think that we should be aspiring to as an organization and members of the organization as well. Money transmittal laws. This is a really important uh, topic when it comes to regulation because uh, a lot of this has an impact on a statewide level. Now, there's two levels of money transmittal laws. There's the federal level for money transmittal laws, which is basically preventing uh, money laundering, a KYC AML, right? Um, of course, it's very uniform because it's federal. Now, on the state level, it's not so much for money laundering, but it's more so for consumer protection, right? The, the premise is they want to make sure that you're not using whatever cryptocurrency in a, a, in a manner that's going to defraud the citizens of that state. So money transmittal laws are very, very important to understand from a legal perspective. So when I have clients coming to me talking about hey, I want to set up a, an exchange or I'm thinking about creating this kind of you know, the, uh, flow between cryptocurrencies, and I say, what state are you talking about doing it in? Because some states are very rigid with the money transmittal laws and other states are not. So you got to know what state you're dealing with to be in compliance with that state. And if you're dealing with multiple states, right, the trick may be to just pick the state with the highest level of uh, strictness or restrictiveness 
and just use that level so that way you won't be failing in any other states when it comes to money transmittal actions. And guess what also counts under money transmittal laws, which we also cover under the Cogent Law Group? Bitcoin ATM machines, right? Cryptocurrency machines also fall under that purview as well. So this is very important to know and understand, especially if your business is looking into doing this or is already doing it, make sure you have all your legal ducks in a row. So <clears throat> there is hundreds and hundreds of legislation out there when it comes to cryptocurrency at the state level. I just picked a few, I'm probably not gonna go through all of them, but I just picked a few that I thought A, were very interesting, and B, were specifically pertaining to legal structures or legal issues. For example, in Vermont, uh, fact or, or record verified through blockchain authenticity for use in court proceedings. Really interesting. So now, blockchain records can be used in court proceedings. And the second one, which I think is kind of a, a, a addendum to it, uh, from my Senate Bill 269, enables blockchain records to be governed under the authentication, admissibility, and presumptions required under the Vermont Rules of Evidence. That's huge. That's huge for Vermont. Now, I don't know how much, uh, how many cases may apply to in Vermont, but the very fact that they put that on the books is huge for the legalities of blockchain technology, especially when it comes to the rules of evidence. Another one, um, Connecticut. I find this one to be very interesting. House Bill 5210 prohibits the use of non-compete agreements in the blockchain technology industry. So I read that and I was like, hmm, I wonder what would actually give them the impetus to have that kind of law on their books, House Bill uh, 5210. So I thought through it and I said, ah, I think I know why. And I didn't read this anywhere, and again, this is not the opinion of GBA, the Coach and Law Group. A non compete agreement, if you guys know what that is, basically is saying you're an employee with a, an organization, and your input to what they're doing as a company is so important that if you leave and took the knowledge with you to somewhere else, that it would be hurtful to them because of your knowledge and what you've already given to that organization from your intellectual property. Here's the caveat. The blockchain industry is so small. If you have a non-compete agreement with a company, the one thing that non-compete agreements cannot do is they cannot keep you from getting work anywhere else. But in theory, a non-compete agreement in Connecticut for blockchain technology could basically destroy your opportunities for employment anywhere else, right? This is all my opinion. So I thought that's why they passed Senate Bill 5210. Uh, I also like the Nebraska law, uh, LR-164. This creates an interim study to explain the need to update insurance laws in response to technology advancement and innovation and the study would review the interaction of insurance regulation and blockchain technology. When we talk about forward-thinking legislation, I think this is an important thing to point out, right? Because in Nebraska, they're already predicting by creating this study that blockchain technology may have a very impactful uh, uh, impact on insurance in that state. So that being the case, they want to figure out how it's going to impact it. Now, if I'm in the insurance industry and I read that uh, Nebraska law, I said to myself, wow, wait a minute. What's this blockchain thing and why is it so important that they made a law about it for my state? Right? And uh, there will be a presentation later on about, you know, forward thinking and the future of legislation. You know, I think this kind of legislation, which could be modeled by other states, is a sign that blockchain technology is gonna be hitting many other industries, and some of them that are already heavily regulated, like insurance, may become part of that thought process. So, blockchain case law. Um, there's very, very few cases when it comes to blockchain case law, and I break it up into two categories. The first category is case law that still uses existing case precedent to determine an issue or resolve an issue 
with whatever plaintiff and defendant come to court presenting, and the second being actual law with actual blockchain issues, for example, code, smart contracts, things of that nature. So the three big categories, and we're not gonna go through these cases, but you had them for a reference. The three big uh, categories of cases that I've seen so far are fraud, intellectual property, and unregistered securities, okay? So fraud is obvious because, you know, like we discussed yesterday with ICOs, there was a, there was a lot of fraud, a lot of fraud going on there. You can go on the SEC website and read a lot of the investigative reports that SEC did, okay? Fraud was really big. Hopefully not as big now, but back in the wild, wild west of ICO days, it was pretty big. IP, you know, it's also very big because, like I said in my early presentation, blockchain technology can have a very, very big uh, impact on intellectual property. But not just the impact in terms of the technology, also how we use the names. Oracle versus Crypto Oracle. So I'm sure when Oracle saw Crypto Oracle out, they weren't very happy about that, you know, that very uh, close you know, nomenclature to their own name. And on registered securities, we already see that. And you see there's the ripple class of action mentioned there. It's actually more than one ripple class of action. So there's a, there's a lot going on with those cases right now. But there's a bunch of other cases dealing with you know, whether or not a cryptocurrency or token is a registered or unregistered security. So those are just three categories of cases that are not specific to the actual technology of blockchain technology. But let's go through, uh, I think I have two cases here that are of interest. So the crypto exchange ZG Top lost 300,000 Tether and 100 Ether in a hack of its platform. By tracing the transaction trail, ZG Top followed that the stolen cryptocurrency to a single account with Bittrex, a competing exchange. To locate the account holder, a believed hacker, ZG Top sued the unknown Doe, whoever owned that wallet, and asked the court for expedited discovery from Bittrex. How do you think the court ruled in that case? This is more interactivity here. How do you believe the court ruled in that case? How many of you think they ruled for discovery, compel discovery, raise your hand. How many think they ruled, uh, ruled to deny discovery, raise your hand. Okay, so a little, little more on the deny part. And this goes to a, the, one of the questions I had earlier on about wallets and, and you know, I, I forgot who asked it, but this is the, the case I was referring to in my second session. The court ruled for discovery. That's powerful stuff, right? And now they're gonna go forth and try and find out the owner of that wallet who they call in this case Doe. Next court case, see I like that silence, right? I said, whew, let's process that for a minute. It's really important stuff. This is a case of first impression. So now discovery requests have a precedent to back it up, okay? Next one, Florida versus Espinoza. This is actually a very recent case. Uh, undercover detectives contacted the defendant through a Bitcoin exchange site. Espinoza posted on the site that he would sell Bitcoins for cash through in-person transactions. Espinoza was not licensed for uh, registered as a money services business with Florida or federal regulators. An undercover detective met Espinoza several times and paid him a total of $1,500 cash for Bitcoin and even said he was involved in an illicit activity. And by the way, uh, Espinoza made some money off that transaction with that $1,500. So how do you think the appellate court ruled? Is Bitcoin money or is Bitcoin not money? Now, if Bitcoin is money, Espinoza needs a money transmittal license. If Bitcoin is not money, Espinoza does not. So how many think the court in Florida ruled, the, uh, the appellate court, that Bitcoin is money? Raise your hand. Okay, how many think that rule is not money? Raise your hand. Okay, excellent, I love this. This is some great conversation. The court ruled that Bitcoin is money and requires a money service business license. But caveat, the court, that was on appeal. The first court ruled that Bitcoin was not money. And then there was an appeal by the state of Florida to the appellate court to 
review that ruling from the lower court. So as you can see, the courts are even split right now in, within, this, within the state of whether or not Bitcoin is money. So it's fascinating stuff. And quite frankly, it may get appealed from there. Who knows, right? But I just, I'm, what I'm trying to get the point across here with case law is it's still in development. Even the court's trying to figure it out. And when people come up to me and say, well, it's obvious that this is the case and the court's thinking, I'm like, no, it is not obvious. The courts can't even decide themselves on what to do. How many of you guys have heard about Supreme Court decisions that are 5-4 or 6-3? Courts, they could be split within a court or appellate courts, two to one decisions. This stuff is not obvious. Don't take it for granted, right? Because right now it's still being worked out through the system. Um, I have here questions, but I'm gonna, let's hold questions because I want Earl to come up and present uh, and do his thing, and then Earl and I will take questions uh, jointly, whether it's on what I presented or he presented, so that way he's got plenty of time to present. Uh, so Earl, please come to the stage. There he goes. All right, everybody, let's hear it for Earl. So Jordan, we don't get to do the hand signals. That's sad. I like that. I actually like that. I'm just going to start my timer and we're off the race. Cool. Hello, everybody. How are you? Great. You saw the macro. How about a little bit of micro? Yes, sir. I live in probably one of the most precise niches you're going to find today. I live in the gaming industry. To be very precise, in the land-based casino industry where you have just in the state of California, 72 jurisdictions. And around the world, I wouldn't even want to count them. So as I just said, my name's Earl. I am the vice chairman of the International Gaming Standards Association. I have the privilege of serving a team uh, that lives in six countries around the world. We're called Access AI. Why? Because we've been picking up data out of slot machines for more than 10 years now in almost 50 countries around the world. That's a lot of data. If you can imagine that I've been tracking one lady in uh, Mexico now for nine years. Every day that she comes in, everything that she spend, spends, everything that she does, every machine she goes to, her behavioral patterns of when she checks into the machine, checks out of the machine. I can see when she goes from adrenaline to cortisol because her clicking pattern changes, her money inserts change. It's a fun place to be. Um, a sideline that I had for about 10 years was the National Academy for Public Administration teaching this stuff because artificial intelligence has been around for a very long while considering that's some of the stuff that I had fun with in the Canadian Armed Forces. And just because I'm not a big sleeper, my sideline at night is I live and breathe neuroscience. Why? Because I think in the future we will not be able to do integral artificial intelligence if it is not a subset of neuroscience. So that being said, I'm going to dig in very deeply to the niche I've been working in for the last 10 years. I would like to show you the current state of affairs and then get into our theme, money, governance, and law. Uh, just that being said, Eric said he wanted to give a soft GBA pitch. If you know anything about my binary personality, there's absolutely nothing soft about me. When I found the GBA, uh, I found home. Why? Because GBA stands for the exact one word I have spent the last 10 years of my life fighting for. Legitimacy. Why? Because I took off my uniform in Canada because of a legitimacy issue that happened overseas. I'm in an industry right now that it has, it's full of thousands of people that are nice people, good people, legitimate people, but we're in an industry that's ravid with money laundering, where addictive gambling is only found once the gate has been left open and the horse has been stolen, as people would say. So why am I here? 
because I'm probably the biggest believer the GB8 will ever find because the fight for legitimacy of the GBA, the education, the awareness, is the foundation of the society we have to build and leave as a legacy. So that being said, the thing I get dinged for because I have to give speeches all around the world on this, is that the gaming industry, every morning when we get up, whatever time zone we're in, we're fighting because we're being judged on legitimacy. The definition that I've given to legitimacy is simple. It's the founding principles of GBA. Transparency, traceability, and the thing, if any of you here are parents, don't touch that or you'll go to bed without your dinner. Don't touch that or I'll take away your iPad. Don't touch that or this. If you cannot enforce it, you have no legitimacy. So the gaming industry is not about building theoretical things. It's about having a technology that has the, integ that has the integrity and the legitimacy to back up the laws and the policies. So one thing that I educate about all around the world is the criminals have all gone, all gone global. This Pirates of the Caribbean thing where you meet a bad ship and they throw a big rock at you and you sink and they steal your stuff, that's gone. Criminals now are probably in places where it's warm, where the Mai Tais are cold, where they don't have to wear shoes, and it's a very cool way of living. They're all global. They're highly educated, believe me, I fight them 24 hours a day. They are more agile than you would ever believe. So the threat is the highest it has ever been. At the same time, the regulators, the administration branch of our societies, they're all local. I just said, in the state of California alone, in the United States, there are 70-something jurisdictions because of all of the tribes. Singapore is its own jurisdiction. Australia has four. With Tanzania, it's five. So can you imagine how, and I'm going to use the word because I love using it the wrong way. Can you imagine how the laws and the regulations are decentralized? See that smile? So you know my opinion, right? So that being said, in the gaming industry, everything is human process driven. We're running on virtual paper. That's called a PDF. So everything being a human driven process with no integral technology means threat is high, risk is high. What does that mean? I'm a binary person from the IT world since I was 14 years old. That means automatically disaster. So if I look at the current state of affairs, the gaming industry, the land-based gaming industry, is mostly anonymous fiat. From a binary perspective, and I know I get in trouble for this one all the time, but from a binary perspective, that means every single person sitting at every single slot machine in every casino around the world is a money launderer. How's that for a binary principle? So the gaming industry is a haven for money laundering because of the way it's set up with fiat anonymous currency as its fuel for entertainment. When it comes to governance, once again, it's low or no KYC. When was the last time you walked into a casino in the United States? Whether it be state run, whether it be tribal run, whether it be a, a, a corner store and you had to do KYC. Go to Singapore and see what will happen. Wow. Go to some of the uh, places in England and other jurisdictions around the world and you will be KYC'd up the yin yang. But once again, if there's no KYC, take it for granted. Everybody is allowed implicitly to be a money launderer. And once again, if I don't have technology that's tracking everything you do, how can I protect you from going from adrenaline to cortisol? Why am I saying cortisol? Because cortisol is known to be the drug or the chemical in your brain that's fueling addiction. And once again, the saddest part of this is all of the laws are decentralized from tribal to local to state to country or whatever. There is no general governance of the laws. Why is this important? 
Well, the reason why I joined the GBA is because the gaming industry to become legitimate, for me to get up in the morning and walk to work and be very proud of what I do and the industry I do, we have to put guardrails on each side of the road. The left side has to be to eliminate money laundering. The right side has to be to eliminate the possibility of addiction, which is very simple, by the way. We can use facial recognition. We can we use movements. There's even technology to measure breath. Because if you noticed, the more stressed you become, the less you breathe and the higher you breathe. All of these technologies exist. I was in a project in 2020 where we were scanning people to see if there was any chance that a criminal was coming through an airport. So we don't have to invent anything. Everything is already out there, open source. So I'm sure you know the conclusion. What is the solution to the problems more than 65 countries are having around the world? It's only, it's very simple, it's blockchain. Why is it blockchain? Because of the immutability of the data. Now, I've put it down there on the bottom, but I'm going to stick it up there right now because this is my publicity statement, not for what I do, but for integrity. I have been in and around AI for about 24 years-ish. So here's a blanket statement that I know I'm giving you a very an extremist view, but I try to hide it as passion. If you do not do AI based on blockchain, you're doing something that I worked on, which was a movie many years ago called The Matrix. We did some of the special effects for it. So once again, if you know that movie, have a look at it with the principle of corrupt records in a database that are taking on a life of their own and they're building their own fake news inside of the database and they're building their own scenarios based on cortisol and they're getting stressed out and they're going what if, what if, what if and they're all spinning out of control. Well, that's what AI is without blockchain. So another big thing that I'm very animate about around the world this is another simple principle that I hope you take away to your own industries. KYC or die. If you walk into a casino to play, what's the issue with doing know your client and just clicking to say who you are and all these things? You're doing it for Uber Eats. You're doing it for Facebook. You're checking in to put pictures on Facebook every three hours of what you're eating. Look at the, what the mass is doing right now to give up their data. But when you're in a place where the danger of money laundering is so high, where the danger of getting addicted is relatively high, why isn't KYC the norm like it is in Singapore? So and the other thing is, why would you want to use AI in what you do? Well, if blockchain is your base, means your data is integral, your data is safe, your data is immutable. Now you can start running algorithms and you can sleep well at night. Why? Because you can detect. There's a project ongoing right now that really has a big piece of my heart. Even though there's no KYC involved, it's not important. Why? Because it's measuring the speed at which you're clicking on a slot machine. And the algorithms are trying to detect if you're going out of fun and towards addiction. And then what the algorithms are doing, they're actually manipulating the machine to slow it down. And if the machine's slowing down, just like the little radar that's flashing on the side of the highway doesn't slow you down, then it comes up on the screen and says, why don't you take a 10 minute break? Here's a coupon to go get a coffee. Your machine is going to be reserved for you when you get back, but take a time out, just like you give to your kids. I'm sorry, but when you're, when you're sitting in front of a slot machine, you are in your baby brain. You're not in an adult brain. You're in your fight and flight brain. You're not in your rest, rest and digest brain. So once again, the solution to all this is very simple. You need blockchain for one reason, to make sure the data is safe so that you can do AI and not have to worry about the, the algorithms 
taking off and living a life of their own. Does this already exist? As a matter of fact, yes, it does. Totally shocked five years ago when a country said, hmm, we've got to get rid of this money laundering thing because I think the European Union is really going to come down on us hard. Well, as a matter of fact, the European Union had already come down on them very hard and shut down every single arcade in the country. And the only way they could bring the arcades back online is if they use blockchain. Can you imagine that? Had nothing to do with cryptocurrency. There's still no cryptocurrency because we still kind of confuse those two, two principles. But the country of Poland, when they upgraded their law in 2017, they came out with some very strict principles. Number one, all the data had to go to a private cloud. Number two, everything had to be chained. And when I mean everything, can you imagine the exponential curve of the speed of the data repository, of the, record, of the record recognitions? It was just nuts how everything spun out of control in the beginning. Every single player in the country is real-time KYC'd. Everybody is real-time responsible gaming surveilled. So the guy is there getting ready to burn his house down. All of a sudden, it comes up on the screen, access denied. It's really, really cool when it happens. There you go. So my time is just about up. And I can't turn it off, which is good. There you go. And they do real-time anonymous AML detection. So I'll end off with two very fast slides, because I, I still do have dreams, even though I have gray-ish hair. The first one is, is the land-based industry has to migrate from that dirty word called gambling to just another entertainment segment. Why? Because the competitor to the Bellagio in Las Vegas, that place with the really cool fountains and the more important fountain inside, the chocolate one, if you've ever seen it. That's the real fountain that they have. The gaming industry, the land-based industry, has to migrate to become just another legitimate entertainment industry that's competing with video games online. How many of your kids are blowing 10, 20, 50, $100 a week on tokens to play video games? Well, there's some adults that do it too. Blockchain is the foundation. Why? Because it's immutable. I will not tell stories with everybody listening to me of calls that we've gotten to try to change data. And thank God we have blockchain because we just go, how can we change the data? It's immutable. That's what you asked for. It's so cool to put all the blame on blockchain. I do it three, four times a week. Here's my call to action. If you've ever done public speaking, you always have to end with a call to action. Here's mine, and it's actually a cool one that applies to every single one of you because we're all in the same space. We're in a very pivotal moment in history. It's not for nothing that we have a 1920s event tonight because if you studied the stock market, you'd see all the similarities of, of us going from crawling to walking to running in the world we're in right now. We're in a historical moment. The entire world is watching and there's more people than you would ever believe that are excited and very, very enthusiastic about what is going on as long as we realize that it's our job to impose the standard of legitimacy that only blockchain can afford us. Thank you very much. My name is Earl. I'm too easy to find, unfortunately.
right, that was wonderful. And now we have blockchain tech and intellectual property with Michael Henson. Is Michael with us? There we go. We're gonna, uh, it looks like we're gonna do a Q&A at the end. We're trying to make sure that we're on time so that people can get to the event tonight. So, Michael? All right, thank you so much. Well, good afternoon. Again, my name is Michael Henson. I'm the chair of the Intellectual Property Group here at the GBA. I'm a partner at the law firm of Perkins Coie, um, and we deal a lot with blockchain. We've had an industry group within the firm since 2013, and we have approximately 80 attorneys that touch in this space, and a handful of us are do intellectual property, and I'm actually one of those IP attorneys that, yes, does code, and I do smart legal contracts from time to time, so there are a handful of us out there. Um, so today what I really want to talk about is really what is intellectual property in general, and then I'm going to correlate that to some of the blockchain applications that are going on in the space. So let's talk about the primary types of intellectual property, and I'll try to be brief here, but let's just introduce the main ones that I think everyone is familiar with, and we'll touch base on each of them very briefly. Uh, we, of course, have patents, which most people are familiar with at some level. We have trademarks and trade dress. There's also copyrights and what I would call copylefts and trade secrets. So let me just take each of those individually here just as an introduction. So what is a patent? A patent is basically a negative uh, intellectual property right. It's not a positive right for anybody to do anything. If you get a patent, it doesn't give you the positive right to practice the invention. What a patent gives you is for a limited period of time, approximately 20 years from the filing date, you can exclude others from making, using, selling, or importing the invention into the region which the patent protects. So it's a negative, personal, intangible right, okay? Um, so there's three types of patents that exist in the United States and in many countries in the world. Um, there are utility patents. These are the ones that I think most people are familiar with. These are patents that protect structural components and how they functionally interrelate, so manufactured devices, apparatuses, goods, uh, systems, things of that nature. These are things that are, that are tangible that you build. Um, we also have design patents. So you can get a, a patent on the, the appearance of a useful article. I'll give you an example of that. Let's say you come up with a, a lamp that has a, a new little switching mechanism that you might be able to protect with a utility patent to protect the switching mechanism itself or perhaps a lamp and illumination device that includes such a mechanism. But if the lamp has a certain configuration to it, then you might also be able to protect the look of that lamp through a design patent. So you could have multiple levels of protection for the lamp. Unlike a statue which exists to just be observed, it's not a useful article, that might be something that you can get a copyright on, but not a design patent. So design patents are limited to articles that are useful. And we have plant patents. I can tell you that if I ever see one of these, I will refer them out because I'm an electrical engineer um, and, and, a, and a programmer and things of that nature. I do not do plant patents, but you, in the United States, you can get a, a patent for asexually reproduced plants. Um, Archer Daniels Midland is very prevalent in this area. So what are the requirements for patentability? Well, there's really three requirements in the United States and throughout the rest of the world, and they go by a little bit different terminology. But in order to get a patent, and you have to meet all three of these. If you fail any one of these tests, you're not going to get a patent. So an invention has to have a present-day useful purpose. It has to have utility. So if you were to come into my office and show me some new chemical formulation that undulates on the table, and I ask you, well, that's cool. What does it do? I have no idea well, you can't get a patent on it, even if it's never been done before. It has to have a use, okay? That's a pretty easy test in, in most cases, but I've, ha I've had at least one application in my career get rejected for lacking utility. I was able to overcome it, but it happened. Um, novelty. An invention has to be new, which simply means it's never been done before in its exact form. If there is one difference in an invention vis-a-vis -vis the prior art that existed prior to when you came up with it, then you have something that meets the test of novelty. The third test of patentability is called non-obviousness, or in other countries, inventive step. And what this means is that even though you come up with something that has a use, it's never been done before, it must not be something which would be obvious to do to the ordinarily skilled person in the field. What does that mean? 
This is a very complicated test, I can tell you. They've been struggling since the Supreme Court case in 1952 to interpret this test, and it can be a very subjective test, at least in the United States and in many other countries. But if you imagine, if you've come up with an invention, you have, you have come up with a solution to a problem that existed, an unresolved need that you have now found a solution to. So the law demands that if your solution is, would have been obvious to do, we shouldn't give you this limited period of monopoly to prevent others from doing, practicing that invention. So it presumes a hypothetical that says, let's assume we have an ordinarily skilled artisan in the field of your invention, and we acquaint that person with the problem you're facing, and we expose that person to the relevant prior art in your field. Would that ordinary, hyp hypothetically ordinarily skilled person have found your solution that you came up with to be either an obvious combination of pieces of existing prior art or an obvious extension of one piece of prior art? If the answer to that is yes, then you fail the test of obviousness or your invention lacks inventive step, as they would say in Europe, and you're not entitled to get a patent. This is one of the most challenging aspects of patent prosecution, as we say, trying to get patents through the patent office and when patents get challenged in litigation. So back about three years ago, I started looking at the landscape of blockchain, this, this slide we should more appropriately say blockchain-related patents landscape, to try to get a sense for, in the blockchain space, what does the activity look like? Um, and so what you're seeing here is worldwide filings by jurisdictions. So this isn't a graph showing the, the actual issued patents, but this is the activity that we're seeing at the patent office. And you'll see a theme throughout some of these slides that China is very much leading the way, vis-a-vis -vis the United States and other countries. But, so we have China followed by the US and then collectively really Europe, Korea, um, and, and other countries. This is showing worldwide grants by jurisdiction. And again, you're seeing China leading the way in the same kind of flow of the other countries. Um, I, I will say that when we say blockchain patents, what does that mean? A patent has a verbal description, if you will, of the meets and bounds of the property right, just like a, your real estate does. Here is your property right within which people will be trespassing if they cross your property. We do that in a patent by what we call the claims. We as patent attorneys try to define the meets and bounds of what that property right is. So in, in my firm, we have a patent analytics group, and we go through and we monitor the issued patents. And as best we can, we try to determine if they are blockchain-related patents. There isn't a patent on the blockchain itself, but there's a lot of patents that relate to blockchain use applications and things like that. And for those of you familiar with the Layer 2 solutions, um, you know these are really trying to speed up the blockchain. So in, in, in all these blockchain core technologies, if you will, there's really competing interests. People are trying to get stuff that is scalable. How many users can we onboard as quickly as possible? Is it secure? And how fast is it? Transactions per second. These are competing interests. So when we see stuff issue at the patent office on some of this stuff, they're trying to tackle those, some of those core concepts, but they're also looking at things of medical applications. They're looking at sovereign identity, data storage mechanisms. How can we improve the blockchain itself? Okay, to make, make, if you will, the general purpose computer more efficient in the way it runs. And that analysis applies to blockchain as well. This graph is showing the activity in the patent space. The blue is showing the actual granted patents. Okay, this is uh, worldwide. The, the hash is showing p pending applications and the gray are things that are perhaps have gone abandoned or people have stopped pursuing. You, ne you need to notice the, and appreciate the hockey style escalation here since 2015. Now, the reason I started this at 2012 and not earlier, Bitcoin white paper came out, I think, 2008, 2009. By the time people were filing in this space, it was a few years later, and patent applications don't public, aren't publicly available generally for 18 months. So the activity really started, we started seeing activity appropriately around 2015. Also in 2012 was when a famous Supreme Court case came out called the Alice Test which kind of changed how we analyze computer-related technologies, such as blockchain. So I wanted to start in 2012, because theoretically those are the cases that had to pass the muster of the ALICE analysis. It might look like things are tapering off, and that's a bit misleading here, because, again, we don't have a snapshot generally over the past 18 months. Those applications which are on file are generally not available for us to see. So things that were filed in late 2020 
we might not even see some of these. Um, late 2020 and obviously in 2021, we're not seeing. I expect this, this trend to continue, but we'll see. Um, and again, these are the issued uh, worldwide distribution. Um, again, with um, we've got foreign in the, in the orangey brown and vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. Top assignees, here's who's filing these patent applications. And, and just to be clear, there are thousands of them. I realize in the blockchain space there's a lot, there's a big open source community, and that's, that's very good, but I, trust me, companies are filing like crazy in this space. I think because they don't know how it's all going to shake out in the end. They want to play in the sandbox. I think there's going to be consolidation. We'll see what happens. But you'll notice a lot, a lot of Chinese companies on this list, financial institutions on this list. So these are the top assignees worldwide and showing their respective U.S. and foreign filings. Okay? This is who's filing in the U.S. A lot of companies that people are going to recognize on these lists. Okay? So that's a brief introduction of patents. Let's talk about trademarks. What's a trademark? Think of a trademark as any identification that one can put on their goods or services in order to distinguish them from others. Branding, source recognition. You want to adopt marks or designations that people identify your source um, so that you're not confused with others. I've always loved this cartoon because I think it drives this point home. Give everyone a few seconds to read it. <laughs> Okay, you don't want others to adopt marks that might be confusingly similar to yours and take away that goodwill that you've invested over time. So what are some categories of trademarks? Probably familiar with all these, I'm going to go fairly quickly. Words, obviously. Apple, Dell, you name it. Okay, we have logos. We've all seen the logos. The Apple logo is an example. I don't want to keep emphasizing Apple, but it comes to mind. Slogans can be trademarks. Letters. IBM, moving images, packaging or trade dress. The way you present your product to the consuming public can give it distinctiveness. And if people adopt that distinctiveness, then that could be a violation of your dressing of your packaging or your trade dress. Numbers, combinations, 3M, okay? Perhaps you didn't know about some of these though. Okay, shapes can be trademarked, okay? The shape of the Coca-Cola bottle is trademarked. Colors, okay? Owens Corning pink, John Deere green, Caterpillar yellow. Placement of tags, probably the most famous one here, placement of the Levi's tag, okay? You can have aromas that are trademarked if they're distinctive enough. Admittedly, there's not, ter there's not a lot of them, but you can have them. Do you, uh, can I ask the, I've got some links here very quickly on the right of this. I don't know if you can click them, but you can trademark sounds. And I've got just a couple quick ones if they'll work. And we'll have a little quiz, see who recognizes them. Bingo. Next one. Not a lot of those either, but you can trademark sounds, okay? Harley tried to trademark the sound of the Harley engine. Um, I thought I'd pull up a couple examples for you. On the left, we have the trademark for Hyperledger Foundation. On the right, we have the trademark for Ethereum. These are records of the US Patent Office. Um, I'm not gonna go through them, but what you're seeing is an identification of the goods or the services that those marks are in, used in conjunction with on the top. You have the registration number, their dates of first use, when marks get used is very important in this space, and when you adopt your mark, because that can translate into when your rights start accruing when it comes to trademarks. I also just ran a search at the trademark office here, for the US only, where blockchain is either, the word blockchain is either in the mark itself, or blockchain is part of the goods or services that, are, that the mark is used to identify. Um, 276 records as of, I think this was done January 9th, 
where blockchain is actually in the name of the mark. And almost 7,500 trademark, registered trademarks in the United States where blockchain is in the description of goods. Okay, notice Meta, about eight of them. We all know Meta now, Facebook rebranded to Meta. There's the links to their registrations, okay? Companies are very, very active in this space. Trade secrets. Well, what is a trade secret? A trade secret generally can be anything that is of a business value to you that can give you a competitive advantage, the dissemination of which could help you lose that competitive advantage. So with trade secrets, we don't want them disclosed outside of people unless it's on a need-to-know, as-needed basis. So the, the KFC f formula, right? The Coca-Cola formula, the recipe for KFC, trade secrets. Trade secrets will last as long as you can keep it a trade secret, <laughs> okay? There's, there isn't a term when it comes to trade secrets, okay? But the critical thing is that you take appropriate measures to preserve the secrecy of it. Copyrights. A copyright can be thought of as um, original works that are fixed in a tangible medium of expression, creative works, okay, expressive works. So books, okay, words on paper, copyright, okay, paintings on canvases, computer on computer readable media. Those are the, those are the um, media that it's fixed on, okay, and it can be appropriate for copyright protection. There can be an overlap between some of these protections too, because you might be able to, the lamp that I was referring to earlier might be something that you could protect through a copyright as well as a design patent, okay? So what are my rights when it comes to copyrights? Well, some of these are, you're probably gonna recognize. The right to prepare derivative works. So to adapt the book Jaws into the movie Jaws, okay? That's called a derivative work of the underlying copyrighted work. We have the right to distribute or to make copies Okay, the copyright holder enjoys that right and can prevent others from making unauthorized distributions of his or her work. And the right to publicly perform it. Victor Hugo's Les Miserables on Broadway, one of my favorites, okay? That's a performance right. And you have the right to display something publicly or to put a banner up or a poster of the work or excerpts from the work up, things like that. So these are the rights that a copyright holder can, can license out or do whatever he or she wants or what they retain when they own a copyright. Now a copyright exists when the work is created. Upon creation of the work is when copyright protection can attach. Um, a lot of people think you have to have a copyright registration in order to have a copyright. That In the United States that's actually a prerequisite to initiating a lawsuit. But it's not a prerequisite to having a right. Okay. So now I've kind of introduced these concepts, I want to just kind of transition into what is the role that blockchain is or can play in all of this stuff. And, and some of these are kind of admittedly a bit of my musings, but it's also things that you're starting to see in law journals and some of the literature um, in this space. Um, recordation of rights. This, this could more appropriately say recordation and management of rights. So if you think about this, if I've, cr if I've come up with an invention, and maybe I'm, I'm part of a company and we have a joint venture with another company, and we've got multiple people that are working on a project, it's the, it's the traditional lab notebook that everybody wants to keep. Well, what if we can put all these records on a blockchain so that we can definitively and immutably record the history of the evolution of our, of our invention? And maybe we can record decisions along the way that decided to go off in a different direction. And maybe we're not gonna, we're not gonna protect this, but we might go off in this direction and develop over here. Well, we can record all this stuff on a blockchain, okay? And we can permission that blockchain so that certain people can have visibility into certain aspects of that. Okay, I think there's a, a great deal that can be done when it comes to record management and recordation of IP rights. You could, uh, for example, in, um, for, for trademarks, um, as you evolve trademarks or you adopt different goods or services, we can put that stuff on a blockchain. Um, and we could have just something that is an immutable record that can uh, tell us the provenance and the origin and the evolution of things, okay? Maybe in perhaps better ways than we're doing it right now where everybody has disparate record keeping systems and now we have to merge all this information to try to figure out what the real picture of this was. I think there's a, a good application and there's some organizations that are trying to, that are doing this in this space. Um, transferring IP rights. So when does IP get transferred? 
many contexts, mergers and acquisitions that can occur, bankruptcies, insolvencies, licensing of inventions, technology, assigning of technology. Well, when any of that stuff happens, one of the prerequisites that we have to, have to understand is who owns what? Well, who owns what can be who created what? Or collectively, who created what? And what were their respective contributions to that which they created? One of the most prominent use cases of blockchain is in supply chain. And I think of this as analogous to that, is it can now be the supply chain of these evolutions of this technology and these creations of our efforts recorded on a blockchain and memorialized. Um, and in mergers and acquisitions, you must, you know, we have to identify what the assets of our company are on schedules and, and they can get, we can have addendums that are change over time. Well, maybe, maybe a blockchain can go out and, and with, I don't know, oracles and AI engines and things like that, go crawl the records at the trademark office and update that as companies, metas of the world, come up with new trademarks. And now we, through smart contracts, we automate that process and we update our documentation accordingly, okay? I think these days are coming. I think it's gonna take private sector to initiate a lot of this stuff. The government's a little slow to adopt some of these things, I understand that, but I think, I think these days are coming, okay? Um, an article that I wrote a couple years ago. If you're gonna spend a lot of money protecting your intellectual property, then you might want to take care that other people aren't knocking it off as best you can. So. A few years back, um, our Customs and Border Patrol initiated a pilot program with private industry to try to use blockchains to uh, intercept counterfeit goods coming through our ports of entry. So that it's, and you've probably heard of this analogy before, you could almost, uh, you know, the, the Border Patrol could almost look at something and, and, and scan it and see if there's a check or an X. And if there's an X, then something happened along the supply chain. It was it was affected by somebody that shouldn't have affected or they tried to change the record or something was wrong, something is awry. That's, that's where people are going with this kind of technology to try to definitively determine whether or not goods have been tampered with. There are billions of dollars a year that are, that are at risk by companies through anti-counterfeiting measures. And so it's an article that I wrote about it for Intellectual Property Magazine a couple of years ago. Um, I think this is gonna be a very, very evolving space. We talked about this a little bit before, is litigation. You know, in a, in, a, in, a, in a litigation context, as, you know, evidence is obviously what comes in that people have to weigh, okay? And evidence needs to be admissible for it to come in. Well, how do you admit evidence? Well, you have to lay a proper foundation for the evidence so that if I'm proffering evidence to the court, that I can establish that what I'm, what I'm proffering is what it purports to be. Okay, so it has to be credible in order for it to be admissible. I need to lay the foundation. Again, it's kind of a recurring theme you're hearing from me. If, if we are recording this information on a blockchain, think of chain of custody, where anytime somebody touches an item, that state changes on a blockchain. So now we have, every, we have all the participants that had access to the data. Who signed the NDAs? How long did they have it? That kind of information. So if we need to establish chain of custody, or if we need to agree as to whether certain facts existed or not. We, we talked in one of the previous things, discussions about you know, how smart contracts and things like that can be used. I think one of the things that we're going to see, perhaps in litigation, or at least I would like to see, it might be slow coming, but how many of you all have been involved in depositions? Okay, did you enjoy it? No. Okay. <laughs> how many copies of documents were on that table? <laughs> You have the attorneys, you have the court reporter, you have the witness. Every time a document comes in, everybody's looking at it to compare to make sure it wasn't tampered with, make sure it's the same version of that document. Well, wouldn't, wouldn't a hash be a wonderful thing if we could do something like that, where we could maybe streamline that process of discovery and litigation, and maybe parties could have a, a data set, either a discovery or maybe, maybe in their before the litigation begins, they have this repository of information, which is their, their world of the historical events that occurred. So maybe we don't have to spin our wheels so much in a litigation questioning what facts are or are not in existence. Because maybe the parties agreed when they 
created their blockchain architecture and permissioned it accordingly, that they have a, had a governance document that, that almost became in some sense the legal contract that, that, that governs some of that stuff. So that when this information comes in in litigation, we don't have to go through a lot of the exercises that we sometimes do when it comes to patent infringement lawsuits and things like that. This might be pie in the sky, and, and, and again, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of, mo it, it take a lot to change the, the course of action, but a Chinese court, um, I'm, a, I'm familiar with one case where a Chinese court actually used blockchain as evidence in a copyright infringement action for factual evidence. They relied on what the blockchain showed. So I think these days are coming. I don't know how fast they're gonna get here, not as fast as I'd like to see them get here, but I think they will come. So um, there's a lot of stuff going on in this space. I, I deal pr predominantly in the patent world, um, although I, I grew up in a small firm. I'm in a large one now, but I grew up in a small firm where I wrote people's patents, I litigated their patents, I did their trademarks, I did their licensing, all that kind of stuff. So I, I enjoy looking at all this stuff. and. I think what is interesting to me and fascinating in looking at all this over the years is how active this space is from an intellectual property protection standpoint, um, given what is a very open source mindset as well. I think it's very fascinating to me to see what's going on. And frankly, a lot of the technologies I'm seeing, going back to some of those earlier slides, is really the intersection of blockchain principles AI, machine learning, and IoT, Internet of Things. The convergence of those technologies are becoming very, very active, and I think that's where the future might come for some of this stuff. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. I don't know how I'm doing on time, but... <laughs> I saw some people raise their hands, so I'm just gonna come to the mic over here. I'll ask the first question on NFTs. We, had, we were having a little bit of a debate last night with the guy from CFTC here yesterday, and he's like, we're talking about uh, NFTs and the value of, or like what it really means if you can copy and paste the JPEG versus the real utility of the NFT and enforceability around that. There's a little bit of openness. We had a, like an hour back and forth. I don't know if you'd like to comment a little bit out that he argues if there's no precedent, anybody can just copy and paste it and then he can he sold it to the person that was next to me for five bucks, but he doesn't own the actual NFT. But he's like, but I sold it and try to enforce it. You know, there's no real, you know, too much governance there. Yada, yada. So his point was well taken, um, but I don't know if, if, if you can comment on this. Yeah, the, the law is evolving on this, but I think, it's, I think it helps to understand some a fundamental concept about NFTs to begin with. So let's take an example, um, you know, NFTs, it's ERC-1155 is one of the protocols where you can get collections of NF NFTs and things like that. Um, and let's just take an example of OpenSea. If I want to have an NFT and I want to sell it on OpenSea, what's, what's going to govern what transfers? I think you have to look at a variety of things. Look at the terms. There's terms and conditions on OpenSea, okay? Understand what those terms and conditions are. Understand what what you are as an owner of an NFT actually giving away when you give away the NFT. I would, I would argue, um, and I'm here in a personal capacity, but when you have an NFT, what you have is a link to an interplanetary file system that is storing an NFT and metadata on the NFT. You are not necessarily getting the underlying copyright to the work. You are getting a pointer to where that NFT is being stored okay, in a distributed file system. But transfer of IP ownership is something much different. I would also, uh, something I came across, which I don't know if it will evolve or not, I came across it and we're putting together in my firm a, a white, technical white paper on some of these technologies on NFTs and I, I participated on writing the technical description of that. One thing I came across in researching this is something called refungible tokens. They're not part of the standard, but it was fascinating to me how you could, you know, an NFT is something that's very unique. It's not, uh, it's not divisible. You can't parse it, things like that. It's the Mickey Mantle baseball card vis-a-vis -vis my baseball card. So one would command a high value, one would not. But it's not like you can cut up the baseball card. But what if you could? What if you could make a fungible token refungible and, and, and have, have multiple 
individuals collectively own the NFT or portions of the NFT. But I, I think it's a, it's a much different question on, on understanding legally what is transferred when one acquires an NFT. And I think you have to look beyond just the fact that you have the, the, the pointer of the token to an NFT. You have to look at the terms and conditions on things like OpenSea and, and, and whatever the artist might have separately done when they said, when you send the money to buy this, this is what you are or are not getting. Did you have a question? I do. I am a provisional blockchain uh, patent holder. And uh, I have a question, maybe this is befitting for everyone, but in the face of blockchain, has the rule of 20 years on a patent, isn't that the rule, I'll trust me, correct, correct me if I'm mistaken, on uh, holding this patent, will that change again in the face of blockchain given the current rules? I, I, what you're referring to is, let me, a little bit of historical context. Yes. Prior to June 8th of 1995, I think was the date, we had a patent system in the United States that said your patent was valid and enforceable for 17 years after it issued. That law changed on June 8th of 1995 to say, you now have a patent that is enforceable for 20 years, for 20 years from your filing date. Mm -hmm. That harmonized the US patent system with what goes on in much of the, many of the other countries in the world. I don't think the blockchain is going to change that okay. in the short answer. I don't see that changing All right. the term. Great answer, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Yes. Ryan Cooper, DeVille Crypto Solutions. I have a question. Uh, you, you were saying uh, read the disclaimer on Discord, I mean, not Discord, OpenSea, but the artist could also have you know additional rules. So my question is about a friend. He uh, got a board eight a while back, and he's actually doing, doing very well with doing a merchandise, so he's got the image his, of his actual board ape on skateboards. He's doing merchandise. Is, do, you, do you know anything about that area as far as like if, 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 if the, um, the words in that, in the uh, agreement between me and the artist or board ape yacht club, that I can use that image of the one I bought on any uh, merchandise moving forward? Do you know anything about that area? I know stuff about the area. You have to appreciate I can't be giving legal advice up here on limited information and I'm not going to do that. But I will, I will say that there are, many, there are many ways and many platforms where you can sell an NFT, okay? You can do it on your own platform or you can do it through an open sea. And there are conditions which can attach to that and, and there can be legal terms that attach to those arrangements. And I would just encourage you to not think with tunnel vision on something like this, to understand that when it comes to an NFT, you're getting a pointer to a token. If you wanna get something else or you think you have something else, consult an attorney, read, make sure you're well aware of all the documents and all the, the terms that may apply to that scenario. And it, it's not, it might not necessarily be the same answer in every situation. Good, good question, actually, on the, on the board aid. And just a comment, this is Silvio here at Logos Capital. Just a comment really quickly on that. I think what makes board aid very unique is the fact that they do allow people that have that to actually have copyright to like sell and stuff. Uh, well, and I think we recently in the news, I think somebody, you know, thought they acquired all the copyrights to, to Dune. Uh -huh. I think that was in the news just recently. So. The, the, you might look into that and whether yeah. that was really the case. Yeah. <laughs> um, my, my question is about um, a, a little bit of like collaboration on open source. You know, there's a huge open source culture here. Different types of open source licenses and perhaps how one can contribute to open source code but still be able to retain some intellectual property that can be used maybe partially because there's some combinations of adoption, mass adoption to give, say, a large part of the open source under a, let's call it a, you know, MIT license, whatever the stuff. Apache 2.0, PSD, yeah. uh -huh. whatever you want. Yeah. A standard open source, but you can still have something in the back end, which might be the secret sauce or enable it or et cetera, which doesn't have to necessarily be open source. Like, can you talk a little bit about how these things might interoperate between some open source, the like actual business implications of contributing to an open source project, being able to contribute to an open source project and retain some IP for your part, 
uh, and, and and maybe the the practice of, of something like yeah, this. Yeah, there 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 are a lot of open source licenses mm -hmm. out there, and they all have their different flavors to them. I think some of the more popular ones that that are a little bit more um, less restrictive mm -hmm. would be obviously DMIT, Apache 2.0. I think those those are some, some examples. Um, but to to briefly answer your question, depending on the license that might be attached to something, there is a possibility to protect software through the patent world, as well as licensing and open sourcing aspects of that software that might not be subject to what the patent is protecting. Okay, those two worlds can coexist in certain mm -hmm. situations, and in certain situations they can't based on what the license itself says. Okay, many licenses are, um, it's called, one thing is called tainting. Um, you may or may not be familiar with that, but it's basically where if I have a license, I want to ensure that any downstream users of that have the same restrictions as the license that I'm granting so that I can, I can kind of control and know what those, uh, what those restrictions are as it relates to derivative works, things like that. Some licenses even address whether or not people can take the technology and try to patent or assert a patent against it, things like that. So it, it's shocking that a lawyer is going to say it depends, right? But it does depend. But I will tell you that there are situations where patents and open source licensing can coexist. Hmm. Uh, could you comment really quickly uh, on, I think someone mentioned to me this in passing, but that Satoshi Nakamoto's, uh, there's some patent, I think, on Bitcoin, Bitcoin protocol, uh, and then like, and then I think that some of the user groups or the early users or early builders even then change that original sort of terms and conditions of th some of the initial protocol or, or, or software? I, I don't know if, what I'm familiar with recently is Craig Wright, who mm -hmm. claims to be Satoshi, mm -hmm. initiated an action in the Chancery Court in London, I believe it was about a year and a half ago, against the core developers of, of Bitcoin. Because basically one of his, um, his keys were stolen. Okay, they were hacked. And so he lost multiple millions, I think maybe even in the billions of dollars worth of Bitcoin. And so he was going back to the core developers saying, you guys can actually go back, since you're in charge of the code set, you can actually go back and perhaps correct this for me. Okay. Um, I believe from a technical standpoint, what that would entail would be basically submitting a false transaction to the miners and convincing all the miners to accept it so that transaction outputs don't necessarily equate to basically undo what's been done. Mm. But that's been in the context of him losing keys, and I think the, the Bitcoin white paper itself, I don't know if it's Craig Wright or others, I don't want get to in, get into that, but I think um, there have been um, perhaps some actions relating to copyright infringements saying you can't keep disseminating this paper, it's copyrighted, and it's copyrighted by me, okay? Um, and the question then becomes, how, how can you prove that you have standing to assert the copyright that you actually are the author? You know, and that opens up a whole nother mm. Pandora's box mm. on, on all sorts of things mm. as to you know, requisite standing to, to show that you are the creator of the work. I don't know if that's what you're referring to, um, but, but there's been a lot of activity um, in Florida, I know, and in, in, in a court in London right now with respect to Mr. Wright. I think it's, it's interesting. Um, as, a, as, an, as, as, a, as another point, a little bit differently from the, from the white paper, that is fascinating though, is saying that there was an original code depository that was not on GitHub, before GitHub, it was on something else, and maybe somebody in the room might be able to comment on, on exactly what the code-based repository was. And then they moved that code base to GitHub, um, and in so doing, they sort of changed the license, uh, some of the some of the licensing rules, right? In that yeah. transition, uh, and I think that that from there on, okay, it, 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 that that's how I think of. I'm not I'm not I'm not familiar with that part of the uh -huh. history, but what I what I would encourage people to do is they mm -hmm. get for those of you who don't know, GitHub GitHub is a repository where a lot of this these code sets live. And that's where you can see what some of the licenses are. But um, make sure you read that carefully too, because you might have one license that would attach to the, the code base, one 
one license that might attach to code relating to the network itself or the APIs. The licenses may or may not be the same across the board to re regarding the whole ecosystem. Okay, so you need to navigate those things very carefully as well. I, I don't know if there was a license that was altered back in, yeah, right. back in the day, 2010, probably time frame is what you're talking about, but I'm not sure. Mm. Well, thank you, thank yeah. you for, for that. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Uh, just to wrap things up, um, Eric is going to do a Q&A at the end of the day, but we do have one great topic left. Um, called the, the Future of Blockchain Legislation with uh, Jim Moran and Todd White. Uh, Todd. Should I do it from here? It's late in the day. How's everybody doing? Everybody hanging in there? Good deal. Good deal. I'm adjust this a little bit. All right. Everybody awake? All right. Just making sure. Uh, first of all, I'm Todd White, uh, managing partner of Rulon and White Governance Strategy. It's a government affairs lobby firm. Uh, you're going to see two insignias. Uh, also, I'm the founder of the American Blockchain Pack. So uh, I don't want to confuse you. I have one leg in my firm. I have my other leg in the American Blockchain Pack. And by virtue of that, uh, 80 hours a week. I know many of you work those hours as well. So uh, I don't want that to confuse you. So just to begin, um, as you can see, I'm going to test your subliminal skills at this, 11, this later hour and those beaming in that are at different times. You can see Congress is under construction, right? And uh, hopefully the yellow in my name hopefully is a little bit of ray of, of, of thought and light <laughs> with regard to uh, what I'm going to share today. And if you zoom out uh, on that uh, under the construction, and some of the points or issues that I'm going to raise, I think they're going to surprise you a little bit uh, as it talks about, we talk about the regulatory framework in what is going on uh, currently in Congress. You, you hear it in the airwaves, you read it on CoinDesk, you, you hear all these things. But I, I wanna give you some facts, uh, being a, a lobbyist in this space since 2014 and working every blockchain bill uh, going into um, this year. So I want to give you a few facts, and uh, they may concern you. So uh, let's begin. The title, uh, They're Hazards, okay? I'm going to play this uh, video, and uh, I, I think uh, your takeaway is going to be very interesting. Uh, you know this gentleman right here, and hopefully the wording matches up with the video because uh, the internet is a little slow in here, so I'm gonna let it run. Even if you buy the government's numbers. So when you have a negative 6% real yield, that is extremely bullish for an asset like gold. But it has, for as far as Bitcoin is concerned, since it has absolutely no intrinsic value, the only value has Bitcoin has value. is that people has think the price is low. Has no, it doesn't. Of it. Yes, it has doesn't have anything. Ledger. All of those are brand new technologies right. now, that, that the internet has never seen before. That, that the is, internet 3.0, as well as DeFi, you, has been promoted. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's not talk over each other. It's a trillion dollar is. industry. You know, you know, uh, all right. you don't in terms of value, it's a value, value that an object has without anything added to it. It people down a primrose path of financial ruin. Look, uh, why don't you learn something about about uh, investing right. in economics before you come on a program like that? Mm -hmm. uh, all right, Peter, let's not be insulting here. And unfortunately, uh, we are at a time with this uh, your conversation. I, I appreciate all three of you having this discussion. Peter Schiff of Europe Pacific Capital and Boombus co-host Ben Swan and Christy I. Thank you all for, for joining us in this. 
not a happy face. <laughs> well, uh, I, I present this because uh, this is the dialogue that uh, is interplaying within your federal agencies uh, outside of the Government Blockchain Association and those that are participating. Um, there are amid concern. And suffice it to say, uh, there's also um, uh, a lot of issues that I'm going to talk about and why this is a concern. So um, I'm not going to be your uh, first year college professor, but I'm going to give you a little refresher course on the United States Code. This is an annotated version, all right? So in terms of the US Code, essentially, um, when you are um, decreeing code, uh, the United States Congress has sole authority in putting in place the law, which regard to, um, or better stated, entire sections of the law, and can change specific words in that section. Moreover, um, it can be changed, it can be added to, it can be redacted uh, by legislation. So with regard to the cryptocurrency space, uh, this is a little concerning because the challenge is that <laughs> um, the um, rules of law are going to govern this, governance, uh, govern, govern this issue in what money is. Even if you go to the United States Constitution with regard to the um, Section 8 of the United States uh, Constitution, only the government can mint money, right? Um, it's a little bit more um, clear than that, but for the sake of time, I have to get right to it. So what we have here in this issue, and this is the issue that the, financial, the Committee on Financial Services Committee is having an issue with, is uh, code. And how do we apply digital assets, and to the lesser extent, blockchain, to this new format because it's not what you can just put in to the monetary system. It's not that even. And by virtue of that, um, I have kind of touched on uh, 31 USC uh, 5331. And it talks about specifically uh, extrapolating that out from the US code um, relating to coins, receive non-financial trade, and business. And so that is the sticking point of Treasury. This is the sticking point of the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, and, and that goes back and forth. We, we have a problem here. And so the, this is why um, in the Investment Infrastructure Jobs Act, uh, the um, members of Congress in the Committee on Financial Services uh, were so um, quick to tax uh, cryptocurrencies to fund that $1.6 trillion bill. And um, there's some issues that I'll point out to. Um, and if this was a galvanized organization, it would have been a quick lawsuit in terms of the Administration Procedural Act. Because anything with regard, and that's uh, five, uh, Title V, Section 553, uh, Subsection 3, Subsection 5. And what that, in essence, does is you have to, before you can put anything in an act or a bill, it has to be heard before uh, Congress. Um, there has to be testimony. And also, there too, your regulatory agencies. So um, this presents a quagmire that was totally missed in the insertion of this $29 billion uh, tax funding of this bill. Very, very troubling. So um, with this, what I, what I also want to say is if you really put this into perspective, this was one of the greatest tax levying um, feat since uh, Caesar Augustus in uh, 27 BC. It really was. And what that quote was, essentially, was to, uh, he will tax the world. It's also a biblical uh, quote as well. 
I think of Luke 5, if I'm not mistaken. So I want you to be cognizant of this and many other pieces of code that isn't talked about. This is the other issue, um, obviously, on the broker code uh, stemming to the Investment Infrastructure Jobs Act. There's many tenets of this issue. Um, this is an old code, obviously, going back to 1986. So we're trying to insert new money, uh, a new monetary layer on an old bedrock framework. And that is going to pose a, an issue. And what that issue is, I think you already know, there's issues as it pertains to privacy uh, with the broker exchange and expanding the, the definition of broker. Um, you probably, on your Coinbase account, uh, you're probably seeing that, right? They're collecting data to file on you. Um, and uh, that uh, should also uh, be challenged. But the uh, foregoing issue is, ladies and gentlemen, the industry, the blockchain crypto industry, is not galvanized to do anything to um, move this off of front and center. You only have, truthfully, in the Committee on Financial Services, two or three uh, members, um, pre predominantly on that blockchain caucus, that would try to push bills forward. And you have to understand, after the, the procedure in the House or the Senate is that you have to sponsor a bill, you do a mock-up, it has to be sponsored, it has to be then uh, voted on, and then after it's voted on, it goes to the wider Committee on Financial Services. So how are you gonna get these votes to overhaul the um, blockchain policy that you see out of certain member offices or, or members in, in general? It's just not going to happen as evenly as one may suppose. So uh, there's a remedy for that. And as I alluded to in my earlier conversation, uh, we have one leg in uh, Rulon and White governance strategies, and then there's the American Blockchain Pact, uh, to which uh, I founded uh, back in April of 2021. And the fundaments of that was these burgeoning issues and the foregoing problem is, is that there is not a galvanization of the industry. And that is a major, major problem. And what the problems are is if you have one group that is um, you know, talking about one issue, you have another camp talking about another issue, you, you kind of make it really easy for regulators and and I'm not saying members, I, I want to take a non polemic approach to uh, legislators because it has to be a, a conversation. It can't be an argumentative battle. It just can't. But there are tactics which can be done, which is what the American Blockchain Pact is going to be doing. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, there is a board. Uh, on that board is Dr. Uh, Sternetta, uh, Scott Sternetta. Board of Advisors. Uh, there is uh, uh, Kevin Marabi, who is the founder of Tezos DeFi. There is uh, 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 Ariel uh, Jalid, who is an assistant professor from UCLA. And then there's Michael Longai, who is uh, the managing uh, partner of, uh, he, he, it's a fund, he's a venture capitalist, he was a seed investor in Coinbase, a, it's A through Z, I could go on and on. But also, he, um, within his um, fund is Quant, which is going to be working with uh, many governments around the world. And each of these men, uh, I might add, have been, um, have, are committed to coming to Washington and having uh, planned meetings with regulators, uh, more specifically congressmen. So we have the builders and the architects in conjunction with members of Congress so that we can have these conversations and meet in the middle. And that is the overarching goal. But I want to expand a few more minutes on what uh, the tenets of the American Blockchain Pact are. 
Um, there's first and foremost, uh, it was formed in 2020, April 23rd, 2021, but we launched 11-11-21, and it, it's built, it's on an operational platform to galvanize the entire industry. And what I have seen, and uh, I, I was quoted in the Wall Street Journal uh, several months back, is the question, the elegant question was, why isn't the, um, or the, the, the industry galvanizing on one platform? Well, there's, there's a lot of misunderstanding from the standpoint of um, crypto uh, startups and firms. You know, um, I think I'm not, um, being disingenuous, but um, many of them um, thought that, that with billions of dollars, you can make anything happen. And I think that when, uh, I think it's going to be a, a, an epiphany when certain regulation starts moving against one, then there will be a clarion call. But you can't, in this space here in Washington, you cannot be reactive. You cannot, you have to be responsive. And that's another reason why I formed the American Blockchain Pact. So that can happen. Open platform for all to rest upon. I, I kind of talked about the first action step, which is to um, help contribute to those incumbent members of Congress and identify, will they vote for us uh, for this space or not? And so we have computational data points whereby we want to focus on understanding what that member will do and what they will not do. Because I'll tell you why that's important. Before I do, here's the second step. The other issue is supporting primaries, incumbent members of con or uh, prospective, um, I think I twirl those around, but um, let me just go to that slide. Um, we want to support um, um, those um, prospective members, uh, uh, the prospective members of Congress who have the skill sets, the grassroots campaign that support blockchain and crypto. And that's going to be extremely important. And we have to support those members of Congress, uh, of those prospective members of Congress. Let me put it that way. Um, our third. Um, principle uh, I want to point out is in 2005, 2006, we want the American blockchain pact to morph into a potential political technocratic party. Um, I know people don't have that vision, but you have to have that vision. And in interesting enough, I think I pointed it out in a 2021 Gallup poll in February, 63% um, of those that were surveyed stated they would support a third party. And you have to factor in the Generation Y, the Generation X, the Millennials, the, the issues of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, they, they, don't, they don't relate to those, um, those value sets or those pr principles that each hold on to. They're looking for another party. They want technology to be embedded into that next party. So the American Blockchain Pact, trustfully, will be the catalyst for that happening. I'm digressing a little bit with regard to the American Political Action, or the American Blockchain Political Action Committee flywheel. I want to give you a perspective of how this should work. And everyone here should understand why it's really important to have one central platform, okay? Node operators, I have it twice, okay? I, I like node operators, maybe, I don't know. Um, blockchain associations, um, legal firms, artificial intelligence, I think you can read well as I can, um, software developers. All of these different spokes uh, embracing the American Blockchain Pact should be donating to one central place so that you can run a unified agenda and not have three or four. Because what happens here in DC is if you have to recalibrate and stop what you're doing, you've lost, okay? That's bottom end and you're, it's the tail wagging the dog then. And 
we don't want it to be reactive. We want it to be proactive. Let me explain something to you all that you may not know. There is a banking lobby. I'm a lobbyist, and in essence, what has happened here is that the contributions uh, in the banking space, um, these are the contributions that have been made to the members of Committee on Financial Services. Okay, it's an election year. Now, if they're getting money from the banking lobby, do you really think they're gonna vote for crypto? Look at the crypto contributions in 2021. And that came at the end of the year, mind you. And here's the other problem. You know, I, we, um, I, I wanted to also introduce uh, um, Adele Nazarian, our CEO, who's here. And the one conversation that we have when, on our billion of Zoom calls, we talked to these millennials and they said, you know what, I donated you know, $2,800 to my congressman. And the congressman that they donated it to sits on like the social welfare committee, okay? It's misdirected, they don't understand. It has to go to selective people. And that hasn't really um, matriculated in many who don't have a, a background on governance. And that is an issue, okay? So I just want you to see the disparity. And this is why regulation can possibly roll back. I want to introduce something very novel. In order to move this, this ethos forward, there has to be a government-private partnership, industry, corporation, okay, on laying what should happen, how it should happen, and by virtue of that, what you see is the D.C. federal courts for some of the legal issues that come up, 10 members of the bicameral Congress, then there's the White House. The White House just issued, they're going to rule something on cryptocurrencies. You think, the, you think the White House is really talking to some of the senior members of Congress? No. You think they're talking to the Department of Commerce? Um, the Congress is talking to the Department of Commerce? No. Treasury? No. Do you think the Security Exchange Commission is talking to any of these other agencies with exception to the Congress? Uh, no, not really. Do you think that um, on, on the defense side, it's very important because digital assets and crypto are being, um, I'm a defense lobbyist as well, that's, that's besides the crypto and blockchain. There, DARPA is experienced doing a lot of research on digital assets and how they can be applicable. applicable. Also the Federal Reserve Bank, you know, with the digital dollar. And you've probably heard the, the going back and forth in one of our, one of the more um, prominent bill sponsors is uh, pushing back on the Federal Reserve Bank, moving forward on uh, the digital dollar. So there's, there's all this um, um, interfacing, but if we can put private and government together, and then we put the crypto builders and architects, the, 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 the Charles Hoskinson, and maybe nine or 10 others um, that are comfortable in working with regulators. Then we have organizations. That could be um, the multiple, of organi multiple organizations out here. We have the Council of State Governments. There's represent representation there. Then we have academics, right? We, we, gotta, we have to bring in you know, that aspect of it. Then um, what you have beneath that is you need a government affairs firm to be able to articulate and speak the vernacular to, with, to help builders and architects speak the language of regula regular, I'm sorry, regulators. And um, a quick example of that, Brian Brooks, right? Do you, you all saw him testify on December 8th, which I was thrilled to be on the background of that, that meeting. And what I can say to you is the reason why he's so fluent and he ran a master class in his testimony is because he knows both sides, all right? Let me give you a, a, a uh, I don't know if you remember David Marcus of Libra, who uh, it was probably, uh, will go down in history in every MBA class in, in the world um, and how not to give a testimony. So you need someone that speaks the vernacular of a regulator, and that's really, really important. Yeah, that's my firm. So, um, uh, so with that stated, that's how you create a balanced ecosystem. 
And then there's the public relations as well. Almost done here. What we talked about in summary. Uh, Arthur Schopenhauer is one of my favorite uh, philosophers. Lived by him since I was 14. And this is what he said about the stages of truth. The truth is ridiculed. It's violently opposed. Then it becomes self-evident. So where are we? We're between the truth is ridiculed uh, with respect to regulatory adoption and it being violently opposed. So with that, thank you. Are there any questions? Eugene Maros of Everscale Networks. One Hi, question. Eugene. Yes. How do we sign up for that partnership? Hey, we are open sourced. We have many ways. <laughs> How's it going? Uh, great presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, I've got a question. This yes. is not. It's not an attack. It, it's it's a legitimate question. Please. Right? So. Um, use the word centralization a few times. Uh, I, did I say centralization? Yes. Uh, thank you. I stand corrected. Decentralization. Decentralization. For the record, Chatham House rules. Okay. Decentralization. <laughs> thank awesome. you. So, thank you for the edit. No, no worries. So that that was really my uh, my main question, right? So, so you're at yes, a, thank you. You got a blockchain conference. You're at a bunch of people who believe in decentralization. Absolutely. And you're talking about this organization being a nexus point of a lot of these different players in the industry, right? So that walk is correct. me through. The, the the balance there between a, a you know a centralized group that is uh, that it's organizing and, and facilitating you know uh, operations between these groups mm -hmm. while still avoiding that angle of uh, centralization yeah let me clarify that for you please um, I didn't mean when you hear obviously um, everything that we're doing here is predominantly decentralized but what I'm saying is simply put with regard to um, a central theme, maybe, maybe it was a word choice that I might have slandered a little bit or screwed up. Uh, what I'm saying is we have to galvanize, okay? Where there has to be one mind, okay, with regard to leading policy and driving things, lawsuits. Um, well, I, don't, I wanna be careful on that, but um, not only that, um, airing commercials, changing the thought, right, of our, our, our universe here, and which is what we're doing now. So that's what I was making uh, light of and not anything from the standpoint of cryptocurrencies being centralized or blockchain because that's improbable. I don't think any one of us would be here if that uh, was the central theme of this talk. Gotcha. Thank you. No, that, thank you for the answer. Sure. Good afternoon, uh, Eric Guthrie, GBA and Cogent Law Group. I was wondering if you can give us an update on HR 3543, the Blockchain Technology Coordination Act that was sponsored by Darren Soto. Mm -hmm. Do you know what's going on with that right now? Did it go through the Senate? Is it, is it stalled somewhere? Do you have any updates on that act? Um, the last thing I um, captured what was going on um, in working with a few staffers, it's still in committee. Yes, I figured. Yeah, it's, there's, nothing, there's been no movement. And that's a perfect question because this is the challenge that we're having. It has to be pushed through. It has to be supported. And members work like this, having worked uh, for Chairman Conyers for three and a half years in judiciary. Um, members have to support members. It's I support your bill I'll su if you support mine. It's called log rolling in the congressional vernacular of mm -hmm. things. And so by virtue of that, there has to be support for crypto. That it, Minimal, it's a basal level of support at this instant. Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Apologies. Uh, just one, one more question. Yes. Um, so lots of different cryptocurrencies face different challenges. Correct. Right? And so uh, I'm curious, right, um, what's your thought process on how to balance those various challenges of, let's say, you know, a Tezos regulatory challenge versus a Cardano regulatory challenge. Mm -hmm. um, how are you going to balance that 
uh, through your organization? Absolutely. Um, the way that that would happen, and as I shared with you, we have Kevin, who is going to actually trustfully be uh, testifying in the future on DeFi, because we know D the DeFi issue is going to be the next uh, Ali versus Frazier. And by the way, anecdotally, if you remember um, when Coinbase uh, got um, punched by, just, it was a soft blow by the SEC, it was actually the banking lobby filing a whistleblower on interest rate um, platform that they were bringing forward. So um, there's a lot that we're going to do on that. And in conjunction with that, on the IOHK side of that, there are going to be certain issues that we would be able to address as well. And as, as I stated before, uh, having the pleasure of ha have to speak with some of these regulators and the SEC, um, I see them in the Harvard Club. So I get a chance to plant things that maybe aren't planted. So the point of the matter is there's there's ways to do that. Um, we, have, we have scheduled planned meetings um, within offsite to have these conversations and bril, bring in the builders and the architects to, to try to get a, a, an assemblance of understanding. That's great. Thank you. Great you presentation. Bet. You bet. Thanks. I talk too fast. I'm on a clock watch. Sorry. Hi. Uh, Hi. Les Adkins, Digital Gift. I have one question for you. And, uh, you mentioned a third party, uh, mm -hmm. a democratic party, which would be awesome. Um, how would, and I understand the population, millennials and the Gen Zs yes. outnumber the, the rest of the populations, but with the force of what they've tried, what both the Democrats and Republicans have tried to do on going against the third party, how do you see in the future that playing out and them overcoming that pushback. Oh, absolutely. Let me spell it out for you. This is a government for the people and by the people. So as uh, the, the millennials, the Generation X and the Generation Y continue to rise, and uh, you already see the, the impact that they have on culture at this instant um, in combination with Web3 and all of the nuances of technology um, there, it's, it's undisputed. It's going to happen. And it's just a matter of within the next two or th I, I say, uh, there's those that disagree with me. It's fine. I'd say in the next three, three or four years, I think you're going to see that rise. Sure. Hello. Um, thank you very much for an excellent presentation. My name is Isabella Edmonds. I work for a company called GeoComply and have followed really closely all the crypto regulations and stuff that's happening, the, um, the hearing in December, which was enlightening. Uh, but I'm, I'm very curious to know what you think about what's gonna happen in this next year, because it seemed like during that committee session, for example, um, uh, a lot of the congressmen, a lot of the members were picking on very small things and kind of mulling yes. them over and over. It seemed like there was two sides yes. um, that were very much opposing and uh, like, is it likely that we'll see any movement? I know uh, uh, yeah, Senator Wyoming is uh, kind of like drafting bills and stuff, but oh, what absolutely. do you think is gonna be happening? What can we expect? Um, what should we, we be ready for? Yes. Just any insight on that? Uh, many things. Um, I, I know we're, we're down on time. Yeah, I wanna introduce my coaxial speaker par uh, partner, uh, Jim Moran, Chairman Jim Moran, as I call him. Um, but uh, let me answer your question. I, I just want to make sure we're staying on time here, which we're over, actually. Um, we're we're going to see a lot of S SEC movement uh, with the um, individual that was brought in by Gensler. You're going to try to see, you're going to see more uh, um, battles with regard to crypto, um, more regressive, and you're going to see guys like me trying to you know knock out language which i've been doing for like the last six or seven years um well actually four or five now and you're also going to uh, essentially see um an issue with um this is a political year so you're going to see a right-leaning um cryptocurrency um a group of candidates because what's happened is within the investment infrastructure jobs act the Democrats have kind of, they kind of 
uh, stalwart, or they've, helped, they've kind of messed themselves up with the taxation issue. That's what you're going to see, is a rise in uh, Republican candidates with crypto messaging. Yeah. With that, I, I'd like to introduce the man of the hour, Chairman Jim Moran. I straightened up That's everything it. That's, for you. It looks fine. Well, good evening. Uh, nice to see you. I guess I'm the wrap-up uh, speaker. Uh, normally, uh, people would explain after two days of, uh, of talks that uh, uh, pretty well everything that needed to be said has been said already. The only reason I'm here is that I have not said it yet. Uh, <laughs> I, but um, I come from to this uh, conference from something of a different perspective. I, I undoubtedly don't know a fraction of what uh, you know about uh, blockchain and probably cryptocurrency. Um, but I do know uh, the, uh, the Congress and, uh, and a, a certain insight into human nature having been involved in electoral politics for 35 years. Uh, so um, one, uh, I'll share with you some of the things that um, I do know. And, and, and I'll, uh, then I'll open it up to questions. I, I, I expect that I, I'll take uh, less time than Todd because Todd's uh, presentation was more organized. And uh, thank you, Todd. I don't agree with everything you said, but I'll, I will. Uh, explain why in a few minutes. Uh, first of all, uh, it is clear that uh, financial technology laws are out of date. They're going to have to be updated. Uh, they don't apply to the real world as we face it today. Um, the um, the Congress is going to be reluctant to update them. And uh, when they are updated, I'm not sure they're going to be what you want. Uh, there's, uh, it was, I think it was St. Francis of Assisi who one time suggested to his flock, uh, don't pray too hard for fear one day all your prayers may be answered. Uh, the uh, majority of the Congress doesn't understand blockchain, and uh, they're somewhat frightened by cryptocurrency. And when you don't understand something, you generally fear it. And so your reaction is to protect yourself from it. And while Todd has been working with a number of thoughtful, and I call them open-minded if you want, Young folks, it, I know you would ag readily agree, Todd, that it's not the young people that control the Congress. It's the older people. It's the seniors who have seniority. That's how they get to be uh, chairpersons of the various committees. And they're the ones that are going to be calling the shots. And they're not the ones who sufficiently understand this industry. So uh, that's one word of caution. Um, uh, another uh, word of caution is that uh, the volatility of cryptocurrency uh, is going to create headlines that people are going to remember. I'll bet of all the factoids that people know today, perhaps the one that's most vividly in their mind is that Odell Beckham, that we're all going to, or many of us are going to watch on Saturday play for the Los Angeles Rams, he decided to put $750,000 of his professional football salary into cryptocurrency. And allegedly, earlier this week, it was worth 35000 
That's something people, that while they may not relate to, they're going to remember. Now, of course, when you look into how the, that 35,000 was calculated to have dropped from 750,000, a lot of that is actually taxation. But nevertheless, it's still a striking number. So um, those are a couple of uh, cautions. And um, now let me let me get back to what I where I started in terms of financial technology laws. I do think that the blockchain concept and the fact that cryptocurrency is integrally related to it, but they are different things. I think it's here to stay. It will evolve much like the internal combustion engine did. You know, it was about 100 years ago when the Model T was introduced. And Henry Ford was savvy enough to have them built at a scale where most people, regardless of their education or their wealth, could afford to buy a Model T. That was his intent. A 100 years later, Model T is a relic of the past, but the internal combustion engine is still with us. I think we're probably ready to evolve to a different level of electric vehicles. It lasts a whole century, and we built upon it. Blockchain may very well be that kind of integral element, like the internet. I remember at least 35 years ago, earlier or longer ago than many of you looking around the audience were even born. But uh, I was mayor of Alexandria, Virginia, and uh, I was a stockbroker, so I could uh, provide for my family. And, and um, my best client was a man who called me one day and said, Jim, I'm going to unload everything. I want to sell everything. I'm going to put it into one thing, and that one thing is something I'm starting with some other friends. And I said, well, tell me what it is, Jim. And he said, well, uh, it's, it's something, I can't really describe it, but people talk out in outer space, and they, have, they can have chats, and they're not connected to like telephone wires or anything. They just talk out in the ether. And they can communicate like that. I couldn't get my mind around it, and so I never invested, even though he offered uh, the opportunity. Uh, the, the guy's name was Jim Kimsey. He was a founder of what became America Online, became a billionaire, and here I am today. Uh, and that was when a billion dollars amounted to something. I don't want to make that same mistake again. Uh, so. I want to learn more about blockchain. I think my colleagues and people in the government should do as well, and I think they're doing so, both in the public and the private sector. In the private sector, Goldman Sachs did identify cryptocurrency and, in fact, the blockchain technology as FinTech 3.0, if you will. They're serious about it. They're going to put their money where their mouth is as well. And this public sector, the federal government uh, is um, going to come out with a memo shortly. It's governed by the National Security Council, and that's, I think, where it should be. It is a security issue, a national security issue. DOD is, uh, is one of the people that, uh, is one of the agencies that's most concerned. And what they're going to do is to recommend uh, several things. They'll give guidance. It won't necessarily be an action memo, but it will be guidance. They're going to prioritize that all of the government, every agency needs to coordinate on this. They need to have one policy. They can't be going off on their own. They're going to, I suspect, suggest guidance for the Federal Reserve, even though they can't control, really, the Federal Reserve, they're going to suggest guidance. I think the Federal Reserve will come up with a 
cryptocurrency of its own. It won't be retail, but it will be one that the Federal Reserve Banks use. You may try pilot or whatever, but I wouldn't be at all surprised. And some of these ideas, I want to give some credit to my colleague, uh, Rick Levin, who uh, runs our uh, fintech uh, uh, practice at uh, Nelson Mullins uh, Law Firm. Um, because he deals with this on a, on a daily basis. But um, it does appear that they're going to do that. I, uh, I, I think that uh, they're going to uh, uh, suggest that international transactions need to be synchronized. You're not going to be able, or they're going to urge that uh, at least the allies that they can uh, work with uh, have the same kind of approach, that they collaborate together. Uh, because there will always be people in organizations that are going to game the system. So they're trying to try to get ahead of that, I suspect. And most of the enforcement is going to either be done by Treasury Department through taxation or the SEC through regulation. In terms of Treasury, the, your 1040 is is going to require uh, that you list any cryptocurrency that you owned over the past year. Um, right now, it's not legal tender, according to the definition, but it is property. And uh, if it increases in value, then uh, uh, you're going to have to pay taxes on it. In terms of the SEC, Gary Gensler says, I've got enough legislation and regulatory authority to regulate this. He's taken about 100 actions already uh, against uh, crypto traders, uh, what, 97 or something that comes to as of today. I suspect he's going to get more aggressive. I think one of the reasons will be that he's going to get pressure from just the kinds of articles that uh, Odell Beckham that I mentioned, you know, that uh, the volatility in, in uh, crypto markets is not healthy from a political standpoint. It's not healthy if you're holding a whole lot of it either. But uh, most of the people that are holding cryptocurrency are sticking with it. They believe in it. I mean, that's fine. That adds stability to the market. When the market drops as fast as it did, invariably that draws people into a regulatory mode because people complain. They go to their member of Congress or their mayor, who, of course, isn't going to be able to do anything about it unless it's the mayor of a small town, perhaps, in, in uh, Tennessee, but they, uh, who wants to turn one of his rooms into a, uh, a crypto mine, uh, which is probably not a terribly viable idea, but, uh, uh, you know, good luck to him. But, but they are going to go to their federal legislators. And so uh, it's not healthy from a, a, a political standpoint. Um, so uh, that's where we stand in regulation. I, I, uh, I'm going to emphasize again, I do not think that you want to um, push hard for legislation, Todd. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's fine doing what you're doing. I, I also want to tell you, um, the, the, I'd love to see a third party. And there's a lot of people in both political parties who would love it. I mean, there's so many Republicans who would just as soon not be categorized as the party of Trump, but as the party of fiscal responsibility and, and uh, you know, a, a strong military, and et cetera. Um, and there's a lot, a lot of Democrats who would like to have a message that was more appealing to the suburbs where people have to pay their mortgages and want to live in a safe neighborhood, et cetera. The problem with the third party is that it's like driving a vehicle toward a destination without being able to use paved roadways. The two political parties have an infrastructure that raises money that, uh, that can activate activists, people that are willing to, uh, you know, whenever they're told for whoever they're instructed to support are going to hit knock on doors and, and uh, 
um, uh, you know, send uh, mail and, and make the phone calls and so on. And that's part of the problem. That's why third parties are very difficult uh, to get off the ground. Um, but uh, specific to the government and, and blockchain, I do think that at a time when trust in government is at historic lows, that having the ability to have an inalterable audit trail is an extraordinary advantage. It seems to me that some agencies are ready to fund some pilot projects for what would be called smart contracts. I, I think they're already in the works. I, if anybody knows about them, it's Gerard. Um, but um, uh, I think they're going to watch them and, and put some money in it and see whether it works. Uh, so, you know, I think all of you are on to something that matters. Uh, I, I want it to be successful. I, I think it's going to be, um, you know, a tricky um, tightrope to walk between those who want to regulate and suppress the energy, the excitement, the momentum that you have, and between those who you know, are out to get a quick buck who, who want to, uh, uh, to capitalize on something that um, is new and is not fully understood and not, partic not uh, particularly regulated right now. Um, I've encountered some people who really think that new legislation is almost going to expunge the record for people who haven't been complying with the laws such as they are. That's not going to happen. Uh, it's, um, uh, I think there's going to be a look back. I think that uh, people are going to be held accountable. And I think some people are going to be made an example. I don't want it to be anybody in this room. Uh, the, um, uh, that's, you know, I'll, I'll open it up for questions. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be just as uh, candid as I possibly uh, can. Uh, the, um, uh, I don't know that I have, you know, anything else that's, that's worth uh, sharing with you. I'm just looking through some, some notes that, uh, uh, that I made. But basically, uh, what you are involved in now, I think, ought to be allowed to evolve organically. You've got more of a free market than you're ever going to have. You're making, doing more experimentation than you'll ever be allowed to, frankly, within the confines of a government that's getting uh, jittery about what's going on. I think, to some extent, there's almost too much proliferation of cryptocurrency. I mean, there's thousands now. You can't really keep track of them. Some of them uh, are, are a far better investment than others, obviously. Um, but um, even though I've spent most of my adult life in the government and in the legislature, I would be uh, very reluctant to cast your lot with uh, a legislature, whether it be at the federal, state, or even local level. I, I, I really think the private sector at this point um, is evolving on its own, and, and I think it's pretty impressive what has happened in the last few years. So, but uh, in terms of blockchain, the blockchain concept, I think that has a, a lot of merit, and I appreciate the fact that uh, you've all attended this uh, GBA event. I appreciate what you've done and the fact that you've been willing to sit here and listen. Um, I don't know that you've learned anything from me, at least. I know you did from Todd. But at, at this point, if there are any questions, I'm happy to try to respond. I'm sure we're out of time. But uh, have at it. I, I want to say one, one, one Yeah, question. go ahead. Please, please, please stay up here. So Jim was at our very first Future of Money Governance and Law at George Mason University. Uh, no, I'm sorry. at. Uh, Georgetown University, it was a classroom, Mahalo was there, 
and uh, has been a great friend. And you said something at that event that, that, that stuck with my wife, and she's told me that many times. In fact, every time you've come and spoken, your, your wisdom has been uh, profound. But you did say if the, the government first is going to try to, uh, I think you said, uh, regulate it, then buy it, and then bury it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, but I, no, I think your, your reality, your wisdom is great. So if anybody has any questions, please, please uh, introduce. Thanks, Gerard. Yes, ma'am. Yes. As we look at regulatory um, framework and the federal government's lack of ability to seem mm -hmm. to come up with something that's reasonable or follows the laws of deductive reasoning. I know there are several states. Did like, I say that they won't come no, up with anything? That was, oh, okay. that, that was, was my interpretation. ER interpretation. That was okay. my interpretation. Yeah. You, okay. were, you were much more eloquent. Um, <laughs> this, there are several Cautious. states like the state of Utah that have developed sandbox yeah. laws yes. that allow a regulatory, um, almost like a period of, in Utah it's two years, that a company can come into fruition and start to work yeah. in a space without yeah. regulatory. Yeah. Can you give us your thoughts on these sandbox laws and how they can play a role in allowing innovation rather than having government stifling? Yeah, I think Utah, I think Wyoming is doing something similar. I, I know those are fine. They are not intended to suppress or repress uh, this economic activity. They're, they're in, that their intent is to kind of uh, legitimize it. That's fine. I don't have any problem with that. I just, I, I'm just concerned, especially at the federal level. I, I don't worry necessarily about what Utah would be doing, but uh, at the federal level, I'm just con concerned that if you get into some kind of omnibus legislation that deals with uh, uh, with financial technology laws, and it's going to be a it's going to be Christmas tree because it's going to be a compromise from uh, every different uh, ideological uh, spectrum. I, I, the, um, I, I don't think it's going to look like what you want it to look like. I'm not sure what it's going to look like. I don't think it's going to be a decipherable, have a decipherable image because it's, it's going to be a conglomeration. That's all. That's just a concern. I just am sharing with it. Yeah, okay. I've got another question, if you don't mind. Um, as we looked at the, the chart that Todd yeah. put up there about yeah. all of the different agencies, yes. and um, you know, I, I have marriage licenses on the blockchain, so the idea of the Treasury Department mm. regulating blockchain and regulating my marriage licenses doesn't really um, work. What is your idea of there being a commission, like a blockchain commission, that would, be, that would consist of academia and developers that could be kind of a go-to for the federal government, whether it be legislative or executive bureaucrats, uh, to try to help this space? Because I don't see anyone in government that understands this space. Mm -hmm. What would your thoughts of being like a, a nonpartisan academia and, yeah. and well, business commission that could be the experts for the government? I, I think that's fine. I, 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 that's, it's a good idea. Um, uh, you do have something of a working group that's been put together now. Designees from every major agency uh, is working with the National Security Council. That's a good idea. Um, uh, ultimately, I think that would be fine. Um, I'd be, I, you know, I never used to think this way. Uh, for, for many, many years after I graduated from college and then graduate school, I used to think campuses were terrific places with great ideas. I, I, I'd be concerned about some professorial input that uh, may not be necessarily grounded in the real world. So maybe a business council, uh, a uh, commission consisting of yeah, industry no, I, professionals. I, I, you know, Business people, yeah. Is it people that have to balance their books? Yeah, that's a good idea. Even people that have to pay their mortgage, yeah. I mean, I, I, I've listened in on some of these conferences, and, and these brilliant professors will get up. And, but, uh, you know, when you start listening to what they're saying, uh, the, you know, I think one of the foremost experts, uh, uh, according to him, uh, or her, I guess, uh, uh, believes that, uh, you know, the, U.S. dollar is is backed by the U by U.S. assets, you know, national parks and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's bad, but, um, that's not so much true, you know. <laughs> it's not even backed by gold in Fort Knox. So, 
I, it's just, uh, I, you know, the, anyway, I, I won't go off on that. There's some wonderful people on our campuses. So. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, first of all, thank you for your time and wise words. We appreciate mm -hmm. you being here. Uh, my question kind of relates to a slide that uh, Todd put up. Yeah. When it showed it was the, an excellent slideshow. It really was. It, yeah. it, it was. And yeah. the one slide compared to the amount of uh, lobbying money that's going in from the Bitcoin side, the blockchain side, versus the standard banking side. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, it's much lower on the, the blockchain side than the banking side. So my yeah, question is... that. Yes, I did. I mean, yeah. I think we all did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so my question is, is there any other political capital that we can use to be able, and I know you said, be careful what you ask for, you may get it, but is there any other political capital that we can use to try and have Congress see the, the, the importance and the, the urgency of this technology and make the wise decisions to pass laws that will be beneficial to yeah. the U.S. Yeah. and the world? Yeah, I mean, you've got a blockchain caucus. You know, they're young, energetic people who tend to be somewhat libertarian in, in their views. And, and you know, write them some pack checks. Good. So that's back to writing checks again. <laughs> uh -huh. I just, I, I mean, right now, they're going to be drowned out by the, the, you know, the banking lobby. But, yeah. you know, encourage them. The best way to encourage somebody is to write them a check. Okay, so political capital, more checks. Got it. Well, that's, that's uh, just trying to keep it grounded in reality, you know. Gotcha. So, I appreciate yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a, yeah. not a question, so yeah. forgive me. But I watch, I, I uh, listened to the uh, most recent hearings mm -hmm. uh, of the House Financial Services yes. Committee, and I and pretty much all of the media basically said there's been a tremendous change in attitude. Uh, the the antis have been more moderate, and mm -hmm. the pros have been more intelligent. Yeah. yeah. So. I talked to Dr. Stornetta, who mm -hmm. invented the blockchain, and he told me that the reason for that is because Todd White has been working behind the scenes to educate the members of Congress, House, members of the House Financial Services Committee, and has been highly effective. So this is just, since Dr. Stornetta actually is the co-inventor of the blockchain and sits on his advisory board, he brings a lot of credibility to me and should bring credibility to everybody in this room. So this is just a tip of my hat to the man who actually is being extremely effective at bringing the Congress around to seeing this as an opportunity rather than a threat. Now, this was a, a wonderful remark to make, particularly at the conclusion of this conference. I do know Scott. I recently had a long, long lunch with him on a Saturday uh, over by the, uh, the waterfront. Uh, I like him very much. I admire him, and uh, and if anybody is credible in this field, it's uh, it's Scott. And when he acknowledges Todd, he means it, and it's uh, it's well deserved. Uh, so um, uh, thank you for making those comments. They're right on point, and I think we ought to give a hand to Todd for all that he's done. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Gerard. You bet. Thank you all. Thank you. Get all my stuff. You got all your stuff. You left your credit cards in cash here, but I'll take care of that. Uh, well, so listen, we are, we are at the end, but I, I do have to do some thanks, and it relates directly. We're all extremely grateful that, uh, that Todd is working with Scott Sternetta, but that wouldn't have happened if uh, Todd hadn't met Scott through the GBA, and that wouldn't have happened if Brian Nielsen hadn't in introduced uh, Scott Sternetta to us. And, and so Scott, uh, Brian Nielsen is the one that really started the ball, ball rolling. Uh, as the chairman, again, I'd like to thank him. And, and uh, Tom Goldstein, a uh, member of the board, uh, the other two are not, uh, I'm a member, but also uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ingrid, uh, uh, and I can never say her, her last name, F F Feltes Vesaliu, and Dr. Sindhu Bhaskar, who's uh, in India right now dealing with uh, a family medical situation. Uh, but I want to thank the board very much. Jim, thank you so much for coming. You, you always uh, add a tremendous amount. Um, our, our AV team, so Evan, 
Uh, Evan is an attorney with the uh, Cogent Law Firm. He does all of this uh, out of the love for his heart. He's done that for all of our events starting, well, going way back and puts tons of time and effort into this. And uh, uh, these are not billable hours for him, right? George. <laughs> Jordan has been working for, um, uh, for weeks, getting everything ready here, um, uh, getting all the AV stuff, getting the cameras. I mean, our, 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 the professionalism of the video quality has just gotten better and better. I'd like to thank uh, Eric Guthrie. Eric Guthrie is the one that put this whole curriculum together. So for those of you who don't know, Eric put the curriculum together over the last uh, year or two. We selected the different speakers. You might have noticed that there was some logic to how everything uh, rolled out. We, uh, we set the content to the speakers. We asked them to review their slides. We went through a due diligence process. They were involved in reviewing it. Um, this was, there wasn't a lot of pitching uh, today, so this was all part of a lot of work that people have been putting in uh, for, for quite some time. Um, if you want, and I, so for those of you who are going to the reception, Kathy's been put, putting that thing together, this whole thing. So uh, if you see Kathy Dashay, please um, let, let her know that you appreciate her because she, she doesn't get, uh, anywhere near the appreciation she deserves. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you guys for, for being here because to tell you the truth, you are the ones that draw people here. I've had an opportunity to introduce uh, Jim to, to some of the folks and, and as we were walking around, I'm, I'm just amazed at who you are and what you have done. And you are the ones that, that pull this all together. Um, in terms of where we go from here, right, immediately this evening we're gonna go to the, the reception. If you don't have a ticket, please see me. I, I wanna make sure you all get there. If, if uh, finances are an issue, we'll, you know, we, we can, we can uh, do what we can to take care of that because I really want you to get the experience. That's really designed for you to be able to, there's lots of room, you can sit down, there's tables there so you can talk deals, you know, that's, it's really designed for that. The music is phenomenal. Um, after that, we have an Echo series, so I mentioned that before. I'd recommend, so this is a subscription series, you, uh, so we're, we're going to do it about a week after each one. Our next one is called the FinTech Deep, Deep Dive. If you go to um, uh, network.gbaglobal.org, um, you, can, you can get the tickets there. There's a code, it's, it's, the code is GBA30, that'll give you 30% off the, uh, the subscription. Um, that those folks are kind enough to share 50% of the revenues back with GBA, so it, it helps them as a company, it helps us. You'll see the speakers, you'll be able to engage. Our next uh, uh, big event is gonna be in May, and if, if you're interested in any of the topics, right, any of the working groups, I and mean, we do everything from aviation, cannabis, gaming, uh, healthcare, supply chain, any of those things, send an email to support at gbaglobal.org, and we'll get you connected with the right people. Um, uh, as I'm looking out, I'm just amazed at, uh, at, at who you guys are. So I'm sure I'm forgetting to thank somebody, but, uh, oh, and, I, and how can I forget Rob? Rob, Rob, has he done a great job of getting all these speakers together? And, <laughs> so GBA has tremendous infrastructure globally. If any of you are interested in uh, figuring out how the GBA resources and infrastructure can benefit you, talk to Rob. He's, like I said, he's leading our our concierge service and, and is an expert on how we pull all this stuff together. I'd like to thank the members of the media that were here today. So we've had Time, CNN, um, and if Raj is here, uh, Raj is the vice president of Fox Communications. Um, and uh, and uh, then we got McKinsey, uh, if she's not here, she'll, uh, she, she, hopefully she'll be joining us at, at the reception with uh, CNBC. So ch check those people out, let them know what we're doing. They're very eager. You know, a lot of the news, uh, they're covering the crypto stuff going up and down, they have no idea about what you guys all do, right? And so let them know, tell them the story so they can get an understanding and take that back to their, their networks and their stations. And then uh, tonight we'll have a whole bunch of people at the reception. I keep getting emails from, from Bill about more people from the house and uh, different companies to, to, uh, to uh, add to the list. So uh, it's gonna be a great evening. Thanks again so much for having us, or for being here. Le one last thing. Uh, if you want to connect with any of this stuff, subscribe to our newsletter. There's a QR code, and that way we can get you connected to, to all those things. So have a great evening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.